Vault of Silence, Book Two of The Hidden Wizard. One, a new fire. Lara crept up to the edge of the hill and peered over. She could see a large mass of blighters, all of them hunched over and roaming in no discernible pattern. The terrain was a mix between rocky and sandy with very little vegetation. She shielded her eyes from the harsh sun as she scanned the entire scene, her nose wrinkling as she caught the putrid smell coming off them. It's as you expected. We have a whole barrel of them down there, she said. Blighters? Alrian said. Looks like it, but there are others too. I think we should go around them. Lara swept her head over to take in the view and plot a course around the mob. Aren't we close to Brankter? Alrian gestured into the distance to emphasize his point. Yes, really close. If we avoided them, it may take another day to do so safely. I don't want to waste the time, and we've dealt with blighters before. This can be a fun romp. The young wizard had a mad grin on his face, which made Lara annoyed. Fun? There's an awful lot of them. I really think stealth is the preferred approach. It didn't make any sense to willingly take on such a force, not when it could be avoided. Not this time. I want to make a statement. I need them to know I'm not the same person they encountered before, Alrian said. Lara looked at him and sighed. He had certainly awakened to his power following his near-death confrontation with Branthor. But she wasn't sure this new Alrian was necessarily better equipped. Not yet. So, just because you defeated a wizard, you think you're the king of wizards now? Not yet. I still need to watch my back, he said as he pushed off and started jogging down the other side of the hill. It's not as bad as you said, Alrian shouted as he descended. Lara could see him working himself up. How much did he really want this, and how much was he just playing the part? Time to announce ourselves, Alrian said gleefully. He created a giant ball of flame and kept it right in front of him. Lara staggered back for safety. You better know what you're doing, she said, shielding her face with her arm. But instead of just throwing it, Alrian gave it a great push. The giant sphere of flame tumbled down the hill towards the seething mass of blighters. Within seconds, there were cries of concern and surprise. The blighters started to move away, but there were huge clumps that had nowhere to go and were pummeled by the rolling flame. The smell of charred blighters smelled even worse than Lara had expected. You better keep them contained if you want this to work, she shouted over the carnage. Alria nodded and brought up a tall wall of fire from the left, boxing in the blighters. The ones nearest the wall couldn't stop in time and were caught by the flame. Alrian launched another ball of fire into the air and had it hover over the middle of the pack. You're just showing off now, Lara said. Now the flames were further away, she could stand beside him. Not really, I'm just letting loose. It feels good. Alrian concentrated and the ball of fire split into many smaller parts, showering fire over the blighters. That should be enough to scatter them, he said. The blighters were running in all directions. The scene was total chaos. But there was a change, and they began to reform. There's something organizing them. Leaders? Lara said. There must be. I'll have to take them out, Alrian said. Lara could see the determination on his face. She had to dissuade him from taking this too far. You know I would like nothing more, but is it really worth it? It's one thing raining fire on them from here, but that's a huge pack. You would have to go amongst them to identify and eliminate their leaders. It's too risky, she said. Don't be shy. We'll be fine. Alrian's face lit up with what Lara could only define as intense hatred. It seemed at odds with his light banter. If you insist, Lara said, there would be no way to turn him away now. The two of them descended the hill, and Alrian raised another wall of fire. Is there any limit to how much of that you can do, she said. It did seem like a ridiculous amount of magic. Yes, but I haven't found it yet. Don't worry, there's a fair bit left in reserve. In that case, you better box them in on three sides. We can funnel them into a smaller space to make it easier. Done, Alrian said with a smile, raising the third wall of fire. Lara watched him work and noticed a steady stream of sweat beating around his hairline. The fire was too far away. Was the sweat from something else? 
She watched the blighters react, and the more they were confined and the fewer the number, the more controlled they appeared to be. Many streamed forward away from the fire, but most stayed within the walls of fire, just far enough away to be safe. I don't like this. It's as if they were inviting you in, Laura said. I wouldn't want to keep them waiting. Alrian threw out a wave of fire to burn those that had advanced. Lara dashed ahead and dealt killing blows to those still standing. They waited for a moment to see what was next. No more are coming over. We can still walk away, Lara said. This is interesting. I haven't seen this level of control yet. Let's save that for the post-battle discussion. Keep your wits about you. This could be a trap. Lara knew to trust her instincts, and something within that swirling dust bowl was making her unusually uncomfortable. If it's a trap, I will destroy it. Alrian clenched his fist as if to demonstrate. Less talking, more doing. Lara didn't want this to drag on too long. Alrian already looked weakened, despite his previous comments. The wizard nodded and started walking towards the smaller, but still significant mass of blighters. Call out any you think are leaders. Better yet, take them out. I'll do what I can, Lara said, scanning them. She had a few potential targets picked out, but wanted to watch their behavior first. To give themselves an opening, Alrian sent out a force wave that knocked over the first few rows of blighters. He followed it with streams of fire that dispersed those standing behind. There! Lara pointed at a heavy-set man with dark features surrounded by blighters. Alrian sent a spear of fire over. A blighter tried to block it, but it pierced through and burned its target. Nice one, Lara said. There was a chance this would work, provided that Alrian kept his head and stuck to the plan. The blighters rearranged themselves, and all those Lara considered to be leaders moved further back, surrounding themselves with blighters. They're on to our plan and have protected themselves. At least we can confirm who the leaders are, she said. Then let's finish this quickly. Follow closely behind me. Alrian ran forward, throwing out waves of force to clear the path in front of him. Lara kept pace, throwing daggers at key targets as they went. The leaders among the blighters appeared alarmed, as they had nowhere to escape to. Then they all closed their eyes and looked downward. Alrian continued forward, but Lara felt that something was off and she slowed down. Looking around, she could see the blighters rearranging themselves. They were making space. They're up to something. I don't like this. Pull back, she said. It won't matter soon enough. Alrian paused briefly to concentrate and created a ring of fire above the leaders. They're going to surround us. Be quick before it's too late, Lara shouted. This is over, Alrian said. The ring of fire descended swiftly, capturing all the leaders. Then the ring slowly constricted, pushing the trapped leaders into the middle and catching them in the fire. All done, Alrian said. Now they're broken. I'm not so sure about that. Lara could see that the blighters weren't fleeing. They cried out in anguish and lost control. She didn't hesitate. She threw daggers and followed up to cut down those that had managed to get closer. Alrian just stood and stared. Snap out of it, Lara shouted. Alrian blasted two back. They knocked over the blighters behind them, and he ignited the whole group at once. I'll make a path out. Alrian threw out a wave of fire that swept along the ground in continuous motion. This way, he shouted over the roar and followed his wave of flame. Lara cut down a blighter and turned to run alongside. They trailed behind the wave of fire, pushing aside any blighters that managed to come close. The fire died out and they continued running, leaving chaos and confusion in their wake. Lara took the lead and headed for a neighboring hill, hoping to drop down the other side and out of sight. Alrian was looking back, trying to gauge if they were being followed. Ice in front, Lara shouted. There was a group of five blighters blocking their path. Alrian turned quickly and threw out another ball of fire. But it was weak and slow, only catching one of them. He stopped in his tracks, surprised. Lara bounded ahead, aiming straight for the leader. The blighters swarmed to attack her at once. She grabbed one and bounced off its shoulder, flipping over the blighter and into a tight roll on the ground. She rose and dispatched the leader from behind. The blighters had ignored her, however, and were now after Alrian. His hand was covered in flame, and he used it to attack one and push it into the rest. While they were off balance, Lara swooped in and put them all down with accurate strikes from her twin daggers. 
Alrian took a few steps away from the fight and staggered. He dropped to his knees and took in some deep breaths. We barely made it, and you look half dead. More than you bargained for, huh? Lara could feel the dryness in her throat and her limbs crying out. She could only imagine what Alrian was feeling. You could say that. I've never pushed that hard. Alrian was bent over, drawing shallow breaths. Was it worth it? We're still alive, and, well, they're defeated and broken, Alrian said, looking over at the survivors. They had finally broken rank and were fleeing in groups of ones and twos. True, we got the results. Bit too close for my liking, and not worth it. Would any fight in the open be to your liking? Probably not. You know I prefer to operate in the shadows, but a little planning to stack the odds in our favor never hurts. You should remember that. The odds are already stacked in our favor, but I'll consider your idea of planning, Alrian said, throwing her a smile. Despite her reservations, she couldn't help but get caught up in his smile. But she had to make sure he understood the seriousness of what had just happened. Is that the first time you ran out of power? Yes, something to keep in mind, especially if we keep getting into these kinds of situations. Yeah, I know. I'm on it. Alrian put his hand on her shoulder. She wasn't sure if that was supposed to be reassuring, but it was. Good. Let's leave this mess behind us. She waited for him to take his hand back, then stretched. You have to admit you were impressed, though, Alrian said, giving Lara a cheeky grin. Yes, I was impressed. But no more ridiculous stunts. I'd rather we didn't die. I'll try, Alrian said and started to walk away. Lara jogged after him, and they cut downhill and across the plain they were on to get back to the main road. Alrian started to see buildings rising in the distance. Is that it? Yes, that's Brankter. Just the sight of it brought back the strong sense of sweat, steel, and hides for her. Have you been here before? Not for a long time, but I'm sure it's the same. Did your father say where to meet him? No, but he's a blacksmith. It should be easy, Alrian said. Lara laughed and smacked Alrian on the back. What's so funny, he said. This is the city of blacksmiths. It would be like finding a needle in a haystack. We'll figure something out, Alrian said. She could see the embarrassment on his face and decided not to take the joke too far. After a few moments, she changed the topic. I have another question. You know how you showed me that notebook a few weeks ago, Lara said. The one with a strange message in it? Yes, that one. Now that you had a chance to think about it, do you have an idea who left that message? It has to be a wizard, right? It has to be. I can't think of another way. Nobody has had proper access to it, and I even tried writing in it. I couldn't leave a reply message. So who do you think it is? I have a theory, but it's a bit crazy. Let me hear it. Can't be crazier than what we just did. Lara wanted him to open up a bit to see if this had anything to do with his reckless behavior. What if my mentor Falric survived? Maybe he's trying to contact me from afar. He knows about the notebook. He saw it before. That does sound possible since he's a wizard, knows about it, and wants to help you. But aren't you sure he died? Lara could see a possible connection to Alrian's new attitude. He was still obsessed about Falric's death, and by his own admission, he had been unable to do anything. Was he trying to overcompensate? I was sure, but who knows? He was a master of magic. Anyway, like I said, it was a crazy theory. It seems better than the alternative. The alternative that he actually died, and you need to deal with that, she thought. Which is, Lara said, that some wizard I have never met is following my progress. That just creeps me out, Alrian said. Lara didn't reply, looking out into the distance. That did seem like the scarier alternative. Take a look now, she said. They could see the city better now. Giant stone walls topped with immense bronze domes. The walls seemed to be decorated with intricate metalwork with huge metal doors hanging off the main gate. Wow, Alrian said, taking it all in. I forgot how big it all is. Makes sense for a city of blacksmiths, no? Definitely. Although I'm surprised the whole walls aren't made of metal. Alrian had a thoughtful look on his face. Good point. We'll have to find out why. Maybe they ran out, Lara said. Alrian laughed. <laughs> I could imagine my father designing such a city. 
although I doubt he would have gone for the entirely metal design. He always harps on about harmony between different materials. He's been to Brankter before, right? I'm sure of it. He's such a passionate blacksmith that this seems like the perfect place for him. Why did he ever leave? You'll have to ask him, Lara said. But she knew that finding a blacksmith in Brankter would be difficult. For now, there was no need to burden Alrian with those details. She looked over at him and saw the bravado of the fight wearing off. It was being replaced by the look of a boy eager to see his father. What is it? Alrian said, turning back to her. He must have noticed her staring. Oh, nothing, just taking in the scenery. Let's get a move on, Laura said, picking up the pace. Two. Branktur. The giant gates towered over them as they walked into the city. Streams of people were traveling in both directions. Alrian could smell the smoke and steel being worked. It was strange, smelling it outside of the workshop. It feels like a blacksmith workshop, and we're outdoors, he said. Not surprised that you get that impression. There's a lot of workshops here. They can make some seriously massive things. Do you know where the main workshops are? I think they're this way. I'm sure you can follow the sounds and smells, though, Lara said. You're probably right, Arian said. They continued along the dusty path and turned right down a major road. The people seemed busy but happy, Arian said as he took in their surroundings. I agree. I guess it's a safe and prosperous city, Lara said. Prosperous? What have you stolen from here? Alrian was instantly suspicious. A good thief never tells. Besides, I don't steal from everywhere, Lara said, giving him an innocent smile. I'm not convinced. It's all right, you don't have to spill all your secrets just yet, Alrian said. Lara was right about the sound of the metal working, though. He could hear the hammering getting louder as they progressed. The houses were all simply made in the same style as the city gates, basic stone shapes with ornamental metal trimmings. Alrian spotted the odd shop on the way, selling a variety of tools and household items. No weapons, he said with a surprised look. It seemed to him like an oversight in a city of blacksmiths. Weapons are a smaller market here, tightly controlled. Makes sense. There are so many blacksmiths you could turn over a vast number, Alrian said. Laura could see him thinking through the problem. He was more like his father than he would admit. Yes, but I don't think that's all there is to it. I get the sense that they prefer not to make them. My father definitely prefers not to. He doesn't want to be known as making tools of war or being responsible for that. He has always been happy making simple things to help people in their day to day. I didn't think others shared that view. Alrian paused and took a closer look at the surroundings. I think we started to stumble across the workshops. Keep an eye out for my father. You remember what he looks like, right? Of course, I don't forget a face, Laura said. They slowed their pace and scanned the faces of the working blacksmiths. They were all shapes and sizes, but the common features being the sweating brows and the arms the width of tree trunks. No sign yet, Alrian said. I think we're running out of workshops, Laura said, pointing ahead. There was another gate coming up. The doors were open, but there was a sign above the top. It was a sword and shield embossed into metal. Looks like the weapons section. Let's take a look, Alrian said. Lara nodded and followed closely. Stepping through the gate felt like a totally different place. There were still workshops, but there was an air of seriousness and reservation. The blacksmiths Alrian could see had an extra determination and responsibility about them. Who are they? Alrian said, pointing to a stranger. He was a tall man in a red coat wandering through the area. No idea, but he looks like an inspector to me, Lara said. You're probably right, Alrian said. Alrian, Vincent shouted. He put down his hammer and rushed over, grabbing Alrian in his arms. You made it. I was so worried. Yeah, we did. Glad I found you here, Alrian said, relieved and happy to see his father again. He even forgot Lara was there and felt safe and at home once again. Then he noticed her watching them and stiffened up. Vincent released his son and stepped back. Where's Falric and who is this lovely young woman? He said. This is Lara. She's helping out. It's a long story. Aurion choked on his words and stared at the floor. Nice to meet you, Lara. And Falric? He is gone. Killed by the enemy wizard that was chasing us, Aurion said in almost a whisper. 
It was so hard to say the words out loud again. The sense of loss came back completely. No, I can't believe it. Let's walk somewhere private so you can fill me in. Vincent guided them in silence down a side street, and they emerged in a tiny park. Just a small patch of grass, a single leafy tree, and a large wooden bench seat. Let's sit here. Please tell everything, Vincent said. Alrian took a deep breath and launched into a long discussion of everything that had happened since they parted. Vincent did not interrupt once. He just sat quietly and absorbed the information. So that brings us here, Alrian said, gesturing at his surroundings. The enemy wizard was Branthor, and he may still be alive, Vincent said. Yes, we don't know for sure. And there's one other thing. It's about Falric. Alrian said, reaching for his bag. He pulled out the magic notebook. Look at this, Alrian said. Vincent reached out and opened the book. He read the note. Who wrote that? He asked. I don't know. It must be a wizard. I, I couldn't find any other way of writing in it. But the only wizard that it could be is Falric. Nobody else other than Branthor knows about my quest or about this notebook. Maybe wizards are tougher than we thought. Alrian was holding on to the hope. He desperately wanted his father to buy into the theory. Possibly. Losing Falric is unbelievable and a huge loss. It's worth considering that he might be out there somewhere. Let's put that aside for the moment. Against all odds, you reached the pool of knowledge and you found me. What's next? I'm not sure. The knowledge from the pool comes in drips here and there, in dreams or integrated into my day-to-day -day activities. I can't draw on it like a reference book, but I did have a dream and my grandfather was in it. Really? Vincent sat up straight and his eyes lit up. I don't think it was a message or anything like that, but I think it was a way of showing me what I needed to do next. What was it? I was shown a room which was guarded by four strangely dressed bald men. They had flowing robes and a special sigil on their clothing. Sounds like monks, the way you describe them. There are a few different orders of monks throughout the world. We would need to locate the exact ones. Vincent started pacing. That's a start. I'm sure if I saw the sigil again, I would recognize it. I will ask around. Maybe someone here knows something about them. But before that, I have something to show you, Vincent said and took off. Alrian and Laura jumped up to follow closely behind. Vincent didn't say anything. He just moved with passion and speed. Alrian struggled to keep up. What is my father up to, he thought. Your father is so energized by something. This is exciting, Lara said. He's a blacksmith. It can't be that exciting, Alrian said. Lara laughed. As they rounded the corner, they saw Vincent enter a workshop. See, just blacksmith stuff, Alrian said. Just get in there and we will find out, Lara said. The two of them entered the workshop and were assaulted with the array of smells tinged with the smell of sweat. I don't know how you can work in here. Lara was covering her nose and looking around. I try not to. There he is, Alrian said, pointing to the far corner. Vincent was standing next to a forge and had something on the anvil. As Alrian walked through the workshop, he saw a variety of weapons being forged. Look at this, Vincent said as they approached. Alrian looked down and saw a blade sitting on the anvil. It required a bit more working to be complete, but it was stunning. The metal had a soft white glow to it, and the surface was perfect. This looks pretty amazing. I thought you didn't make weapons. It has been a while, but the guys here have been helping me. But that's not the best bit. Touch the blade. It's not hot right now, Vincent said. Alrian reached out and dragged his finger across the metal. What is that? It feels like it is vibrating. Alrian said. Rune steel. It can cut through anything and never dulls. I thought the art of making it was long lost, but it seems not. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Don't you need magic to make this? Yes, but you don't need the wizard to make it on the spot. If you had some previously enhanced metal lying around, then it wouldn't be so hard, would it? Vincent said. He was grinning from ear to ear. What's this for? Lara said, speaking up for the first time. Did Alrian tell you about how he had a nasty encounter with a shade? Vincent said. In passing, Lara said. Well, it was a rather inconvenient place to encounter one on the deck of a ship. 
and as you may be aware, even though we had a wizard with us, shades are highly magic resistant. It kept me up at night, knowing that potentially the shade was still out there somewhere. This will help? Yes. Their skin is incredibly hard to pierce, but magically enhanced weapons do work. All we had last time was a dagger, and I'm not confident that we finished the job. But with this and its twin, I think we will be better equipped. Vincent made a thrusting motion with the blade. Twin, Alrian said, I'm making two. One for you and one for me. You need to learn how to defend yourself without magic. Vincent put the blade back down. Maybe you can make me one of these? A bit smaller, though. I prefer a dagger, Lara said, illustrating the preferred length with her hands. I hadn't expected to, but since you're with us, you need to be able to defend yourself. It may take a while. I'll have to finish the others first and source some more rune steel. But leave it with me. Great. I think that will be incredibly handy. Lara reached out and felt the blade herself. It will be. So, Alrian, what do you think? It looks impressive. I just hope I can learn to use it effectively. I thought you hated making weapons, he said. Vincent looked away for a moment before answering. In principle, yes, I do. But there are times when it is necessary. I am happy to do so when I know that what I create will stay in good hands and be of use to my family. I still wouldn't make weapons for anyone I didn't trust. You trust me already? Lara said, a teasing tone in her voice. If Alrian trusts you, then I trust you. Until you give me a reason not to. Vincent gave Lara a questioning look, but she held his gaze. Is the metal heavier or lighter than usual? Alrian said, changing the topic. The rune steel? It's lighter, one of the many benefits. Feel for yourself. Alrian picked up the blade and felt it. It was much lighter than he was used to working with. He handed it to Lara and she pretended to struggle with the weight dropping to her knees. Vincent laughed and she handed it back. Alrian tried not to laugh, but he did show a grin. All right, you sold me. When will it be ready, he said. A day or two, perhaps, but we will see how I go. I'm not in a rush right now, and you don't seem to have a destination just yet. That's true. We need to find out where the monks are from. Alrian had no idea where to even start with that. I'm sure a few days of rest before heading out again will be of help. In fact, why don't I shout you both to a meal and free drinks to welcome you to Brankter? What's the catch? We never went out at home, and you always cautioned me on drinking anything remotely alcoholic, Alrian said. No catch. Let's just have a moment to relax. We're reunited again, and we need to honor our fallen friend. That's true. I haven't done enough. Alrian looked away as if trying to locate the humble grave he had constructed for Falric. We've all been through a lot, and I fear this is only the beginning. Let's take a moment, Vincent said. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth, Alrian, Lara said. All right, you convinced me. Let's go, Alrian said. Right behind you. Lara, would you mind staying back a second so I can ask you something, Vincent said. Sure. Meet you out front, Lara shouted to Alrian. Vincent watched Alrian leave, then stepped closer to Lara. I appreciate the help you have given my son. However, I need to understand how you so quickly got caught up in this. I noticed the three of you back in Carford, and I knew there was something unusual going on. So I lifted a ring from Alrian and noticed that it was magical. I tracked you all since then, curious about what you were up to. Every adventure you had further confirmed to me that you were doing something monumental. You followed us the entire way? Vincent said he couldn't disguise the surprise in his voice. Of course, it was easy. All I had to do was keep hidden. You burnt a huge trail across the country. We did encounter a few situations. Exactly, so I kept track of you. What changed? What made you a helper instead of a watcher? Vincent regarded her closely, interested in her answer. I noticed that Alrian was in trouble, so I offered to help, Lara said. Vincent walked closer until he was inches away from Laura's face. I know that you are caught up in this, and you want to keep going, and I don't need to know all the reasons, but I do know that you didn't just decide to help out. What happened? Vincent said in a low and steady voice that didn't accept excuses. She appeared shaken by the change in his tone and approach. 
Hopefully, with a direct approach, I can surprise her into telling me the truth, Vincent thought. He doesn't know. This mysterious wizard found me. He had tracked me using the ring that I stole from Alrian. He forced me to give it back and to keep following. Who was it? I don't know. He somehow hid his face so that it is always in the shadows. How did he force you to help Alrian? He had a way of getting into my mind. He didn't force me, but it was like he knew what to say. I can't explain it, Laura said. Vincent could see the truth on her face, her confusion and worry. She wasn't faking it. I see. Alrian knows nothing of this? No. That's fine. Better that way. I believe your story, but this other wizard concerns me. It is troubling that the wizard only appeared around the time of Falric's death. I couldn't say if it was before or after his death. I only met up with Alrian afterward. Hey, you two, come see this. Alrian shouted. Keep this from Alrian. Let's go. Vincent directed Lara to leave and followed her out. Alrian was standing just outside the door. Once he saw them, he pointed to a man across the street. He was sitting on a bench reading a book. Who is that? Lara said. I have no idea, but can you see that strange scarf he has wrapped around himself? That's a monk's scarf, Vincent said. And from here, it looks exactly what the monks wore in my dream. Aurian said. He doesn't look like a monk to me, but let's go see what he has to say for himself, Lara said. Before Alrin or Vincent could reply, she started walking off. 3. Tracking the Scarf Lara stopped right in front of the man, looking him over without pretending to hide what she was doing. The man didn't react, his head focused on his book. Excuse me, Lara said. He didn't immediately react, but after a moment placed a small ribbon in the book and closed it. He looked up at her. Yes, can I help you? He said. A puzzled look crossed his face when Vincent and Alrian also joined Lara. My name is Lara, and you are? Brett, the man said. He looked them all over, a confused expression on his face. That scarf is quite impressive. Where did you get it? Lara said. Oh, this, it's nice, isn't it? Unfortunately, it is not for sale. That's fine, I just would love to know where you got it, Lara said in her sweetest voice. Alrian had to stifle a laugh, and she quickly jerked her head around to silence him with a blistering look. I'm afraid you really can't get one, so I don't see how that would help. Please humor me, I absolutely must know. Lara thought back to all the women she knew who were fashion-obsessed and tried to channel that. Very well, if it means you will leave me to my book, Brett said, his increasing annoyance clear in his voice. Of course. Last night I was enjoying a quiet drink in my favorite inn. It's called the Amber Anvil. I was just about to leave for the night when a strange man burst in. He was clad in what looked like rags. His hair was strangely cut, and he had a wild look about him but he had on this amazing scarf, which had somehow survived whatever he had been through. So a strange man came in wearing it. How did you get it? Lara said. Alrian and Vincent stayed quiet, eager to hear what Brett had to say. Other than acknowledging his strange manner and dress, I returned to my book and my drink. A few minutes later, I could smell something strange. I turned to notice that the man was hovering behind me. When I questioned him about what he wanted, he didn't say anything. He just stared at my drink. That is very odd, Lara said. It is indeed. He finally spoke and said that he was in dire need of a drink and asked if I could buy him a bottle to tide him over. I, of course, declined, which made him act quite erratic. I suspected that he was already drunk and was perhaps fearing the prospect of sobering up. Lara was getting impatient with the way this guy was dragging out the story. You traded him for the scarf, Lara said. For a man annoyed about being interrupted, he sure was taking his time with the story. Maybe he was punishing them. Please let me finish. At first, he challenged me to a drinking contest, with me supplying the bottle. I politely declined once again, but he was determined. So that's when he offered me the trade. You bought him a bottle and he gave you the scarf? Not at first. He seemed quite reluctant to hand it over. But I was adamant that it was the only thing he had of value. 
he did finally relent, and I think he buried himself in the bottle even faster to forget about what he had lost. Great story. Thanks for sharing. Uh, where is this inn exactly? Arian said. It's on the other end of town, in the Vine District. Brett gestured off into the distance. Thank you, Brett. I apologize for taking you away from your book, Lara said. Well, I did find it entertaining to share that particular story. Good luck with the search. I doubt that the man has another scarf, though. Don't you worry. I'll find out where I can get myself one, Lara said, winking at Brett. Brett immediately reopened his book and resumed where he was reading. Laura stepped away and Alrian and Vincent followed. Do you think that the man he described is one of the monks? Alrian said. Definitely, but clearly something has happened. It sounds like he has been through demanding times. You said that the monks in your dreams were bald. From the way Brett described his hair, it could have regrown in a strange way, Vincent said. I agree. If we can find this monk, we can find out where he is from. This is a huge break, Laura said. Luck was definitely with them. Finding Vincent and now the lead they needed. But things weren't always so smooth in her experience. She was waiting for the catch. Good, I needed one of those. Do you know where this inn is? Alrian said. I don't know that one in particular, but all the inns are together. Follow me. Vincent took off with a confident stride through the district, leading them back to the area where they had entered the city. Has it changed much? The city? Alrian asked his father as they walked. Not that much. I'm a little surprised. The people are changing and there are newer areas that are more developed. But the core is the same. I think this is what happens when you build things to last. I can definitely imagine this place never changing. It feels like it has always been this way. Laura noticed the pace of the people seemed as slow as she remembered, even though it was now much more crowded. It seemed like the city had its own special pace that everyone could feel and maintain. So you're a bit of a drinker yourself, Laura said, looking at Vincent. In my younger days, perhaps, but not now. I think it's the kind of thing most men grow out of. What about him? Laura said, pointing at Alrian. I can't say. I haven't seen him in action, but I've heard a few stories, <laughs> Vincent said, chuckling to himself. Honestly, I don't really get into it that much, but I've had a few experiences like everyone has. What about you? Alrian said. Nope, don't touch the stuff. Ugh. Hate the taste. I can't understand how you could drink that. Laura shuddered at the memory. <laughs> Neither can we, Vincent said, laughing out loud. Alrian kept looking around as they walked, taking in the changes in scenery. He really hasn't been anywhere at all, Laura thought, observing him. They had entered what looked like a market district. There were lots of stalls in the street, as well as a huge variety of shops. As expected, the wares were mostly things made by blacksmiths. I don't see any weapons, Aurian said. Yes, there are special outlets that deal in weapons. Either that or you commission them directly from the blacksmith, Vincent said. The swords that you were making, would they sell for a lot? Priceless. You can't say that. Give me a number. Lara knew that when it came to priceless artifacts, there was always a number. Let's just say that people would offer me enough money to buy a house here and never work another day in my life, spending my evenings in the inn and my days doing whatever I pleased, Vincent said. Laura whistled with admiration. That's quite a lot. It may not be enough for my taste, though. A start, perhaps, she said. Don't get any ideas, Vincent said, looking directly at Laura. She laughed. <laughs> a girl can dream. I think we're in the right area now, Alrian said. They had crossed into another district with a wider street and lots of large inns. Each sign was bigger than the last, trying to grab the attention of passers-by. What was the name again? The Amber Anvil, he said. That's right, I haven't heard of it, but we shouldn't have too much trouble, Vincent said. They continued at a slow pace, examining the signs as they went. The sloshed shield? The hammered hammer? Wow, these aren't very imaginative. Laura had never really thought about the names before, but now they really stood out. That's a fair call, but they're effective. Blacksmiths are a folk that like things to be straightforward, Vincent said. Surely the owners of these places could try a bit harder, though? Maybe, but I'm sure it works well, Vincent said. Alrian stopped abruptly. Is that it? Alrian pointed at a smaller building on the corner of a block. 
It had a vaulted ceiling and a lot more wooden features than the surrounding buildings. It looked a lot more like a traditional inn. That's definitely it, Laura said. It'll be interesting to see this monk, Vincent said. The three of them headed directly for the inn. Judging from the exterior and the look of Brett, Alrian guessed this place had targeted a higher class of clientele. No wonder the disheveled monk had seemed so out of place. Lara's nose wrinkled at the familiar wave of beer smell as she stepped inside. The decor was well-maintained wood with attractive lamps used to brighten the otherwise poorly lit interior. Since it was daytime, the place was relatively empty. Let's head straight for the bartender, she said. She took the lead and didn't wait for Alrian and Vincent. Excuse me, good man, I was hoping you could help me out, Lara said. The portly man with thinning hair looked up at her with a puzzled expression. That's not how people usually order a drink. Uh, what can I get you? Some information. We're looking for a strange man you had in last night. Odd hairstyle, dressed in rags, but had a beautifully crafted scarf with him, Laura said. Oh, him. He's been around these last few weeks. Does the rounds going from inn to inn? He bothers the customers, trying to get free drinks. However, he's been getting less and less luck. Last night he had to trade that fancy scarf of his. You could tell he was upset. If he's such a nuisance, why tolerate him, Arian said. Oh, one of my friends tried. He runs the plastered plate and wanted to teach the stranger a lesson. Had one of his bouncers try and run the stranger out. But this monk, he knew how to fight. Even while drunk, he made short work of the bouncer and didn't even spill his drink. Wow, that's not something you see every day, Arian said. Yeah, he's a nuisance, but less trouble than he would be if you interfered with him. So we just try and let him run free. He will probably get bored of this area and move on, so we're just waiting him out. The bartender shrugged and resumed cleaning a glass. Laura's stomach churned when he spat on the glass to shift a particularly stubborn speck. Does he come in here at a particular time? Vincent said. Nah, I don't see him every day. He spreads himself evenly over all the inns here. Since he was here last night, I wouldn't expect to see him back right away. If you're looking for him specifically, it wouldn't be hard, but you'll need to do the rounds, the barkeeper said. Thanks so much for your help. Much appreciated, Lara said. If you can get him to leave, you'll be forever in my debt, the barkeeper said, his frustration quite obvious. We'll see what we can do, Lara said with a wink and turned to leave. All three of them left the inn and reconvened outside. Looks like we need to make ourselves acquainted with the local nightlife, Lara said. Not me. I need to get back to the workshop so I can finish off these swords. Let me know how you go, Vincent said. If you insist, have fun, Lara said. Where should we meet you, Arian said. Back at the workshop. I'll work until you come get me. Then I'll take you back to where I'm staying. All right, we'll see you there. Good luck, Vincent said and waved as he left. Now the real fun begins, Lara said. I'm not sure I can handle any more drinking-related blacksmith puns, Alrian said. Nonsense, you'll love it. We just need to forge ahead. Lara saw Alrian's face break out into a smile. Fine, I'll give you that. Let's go, he said. The grin was still firmly planted on him. Ten ends later, Alrian eased himself down onto a wooden bench on the street. Is there anywhere we haven't tried? he said, wariness in his voice. You just have no staying power. There's probably a few left. But the good news is that none of them have seen him tonight, so we're almost there. Laura knew this monk would be out there. It was just a matter of elimination. I sure hope so. They're all beginning to be a blur. Just a few more. Then we can regroup and figure out what to do next. You're right. I just need a minute. Alrian yawned, stretched out on the seat, and relaxed. Are you ready yet? Laura said, after exactly one minute. Yeah, bring it on, Alrian said. Let's try this place. The Lucky Lance. Hmm, maybe it'll be lucky for us too, Laura said. There was a good chance that this was the place they would find the link to Alrian's dream. The strange, wild, drunken monk. Laura stepped into an explosion of light and sound. There were musicians playing a loud, catchy tune on a variety of stringed instruments. People were dancing between tables, and there were double the number of lamps as any other place they had visited. Quite a spirited place, she said, dodging some slightly drunk dancers. Knowing our luck, he will be hidden in the crowd here, Alrian said. 
Laura took the lead and slowly navigated through the packed crowds, avoiding wayward dance moves and swaying drunks. What do you think about him? She said, pointing to the corner of the room. There was a man sitting by himself, nursing a glass of beer. His hair looked like it had been roughly cut by a child, and his clothes were so worn and dirty that you could no longer tell what the original color was. Has to be him. But we would never have known he was a monk without the connection to the scarf, Alrian said. True, it was a lucky break. Maybe our luck will continue. Let's see what he has to say for himself. I'm all ears, Alrian said. They changed direction, winding their way through the people and tables until they were standing right in front of the monk. It appeared as if he hadn't seen them, but he spoke up before they could address him. What do you want? Go away, he said. My name is Lara, and this is Alrian. What's your name? Why should I tell you? We're looking for a monk, and you fit the description. I used to be a monk, so you're half right. Then we need your help. Lara decided she would appeal to his charitable side first. He was, after all, originally a monk. And I need another drink, something better than this swill, the monk said, swirling around the dark liquid in his glass. We only have a few questions. Maybe we can arrange some sort of trade, Lara said. The monk stopped staring into his glass and looked up. A trade? Hmm, no, that won't do. A contest. Now that's a better way to do things, he said. A contest, Alrian said. Yes, Bring back a bottle of their best stuff. If you can best me in a drinking contest, then I'll spill my life story. I don't, Alrian said, but Lara put a hand on his arm. You're on, Lara said, and immediately walked over towards the bar. Four. An unusual challenge. Alrian looked uncomfortable. Lara could understand why. Clearly, the monk was a seasoned drinker and would be hard to match, let alone overcome in a drinking contest. She half ran the final stretch back to make sure she missed nothing. Are you sure that's necessary? I'm sure there are other ways we can figure this out, Alrio said. No, it's all I want right now. You can't convince me any other way, the monk said. He held his glass with both hands and carefully sipped it, a disgusted look briefly passing over his face. One bottle of their finest liquor, Lara said, placing a brown bottle down on the table with two short glasses. The third glass she kept hidden in her tunic. The monk reached out for the bottle immediately, and Lara quickly withdrew it. I just want to test it, the monk said. Lara uncapped the bottle and waved it near his face so he could get a whiff of its contents. Is that acceptable, she said. Alrian could smell the alcohol quite well from where he was standing. Yes, that is acceptable. You are my opponent, the monk said, pointing at Alrian. I'll go for it, but he might win, you know, Alrian whispered to Lara. Don't worry, I'll cheat, Lara whispered back. Alrian nodded slowly. What are the rules then, Alrian said. Very simple. I pour both glasses, we drink at the same time. If I am unable to pour the next round, you win. If you are unable to drink the next round... I win. Is this bottle even enough for you to lose? Alrian said. Yes, it's strong enough, and we won't waste time. A quick game is a good game. The monk rearranged himself on the seat and looked like he was ready. You are going to have to do the first few on your own, Lara whispered to Alrian as the monk poured the first round of drinks. I suppose as we're drinking together, I should share my name. I'm Sertan. Nice to meet you both. He did a mini-bow, then picked up one of the glasses. Cheers, Sertan said, and held out his glass. Alrian raised his, and they clinked. Before Alrian could react, Sertan had thrown down his drink and placed the empty glass back on the table. Quickly, lad, we don't have all day, Sertan said. Alrian raised the glass to his lips and drank it swiftly. Laura watched him choke it down, struggled to prevent it coming up again. He used his palm to hit his chest a few times. That's strong stuff! Alrian said, his voice hoarse and croaky. Only the best. That'll put some extra hair on your chest, Certain said. Really? That's horrible. I never really thought about it that way. Good thing it does it then, huh? Certain said, pouring another round. Ready? Alrian looked apprehensive, but he reached for the glass. 
Just hang in there. We can't afford to lose this. I can assist soon, Lara whispered to Alrian. He nodded. Bottoms up, Surgeon shouted as he chugged his drink almost as fast as the first time. Aurion handled the cup more carefully the second time. The reaction on his face was almost as bad as the first time. Trying to minimize the burn? Good idea, but it won't work, Surgeon said. It's not going to last long at this rate. I have to intervene. Next time you two should coordinate your drinking. It's fairer, she said. I agree. You have to match me, Surgeon said to Aurion. Sure. Alrian didn't look sure at all, but Lara had a plan for that. Certain raised his glass and Alrian did the same, so they were touching. Now, Certain shouted. In unison, they tipped back their glasses. Before Alrian could drink his, Lara quickly swapped the glass for a spare so that Alrian drank an empty one. He slammed it back down convincingly at the same time as Certain, while Lara tipped the contents of the full glass onto the sawdust-covered floor behind her back, ready to switch again on the next round. Oh, that's a nice burn, Aurion said. That's the spirit. Certain hadn't seemed to notice any foul play. Lara gave Aurion a reassuring look, while Certain was busy refilling the glasses. Round four, he said. Aurion readied himself, and as before prepared to actually drink. But as before, Lara swiftly swapped the glass out, and Aurion continued his pretense. Oh, I think it's starting to hit me, Aurion said. You just don't have my stamina. It takes a lot of training, <laughs> Certain said, laughing. I think I've been training the wrong things then, Alrian said with a chuckle. A few more rounds progressed the same way, each time Certain slowing down just a little bit more. The swap is getting easier and easier. We can win this. I must admit you are doing better than I expected, Certain said. I'm a bit younger. I have that advantage, Alrian said. He is just playing it down because he doesn't want to admit his history of drinking. Shame on you, Alrian. You can never tell, can you? Lara said to Certain. True, the young ones always find their way to drink. Well, nice chat. Let's keep going. Round ten, Certain said. Alrian and Lara continued their deception. How long is this going to take? Lara wondered. Round fourteen, Certain said. But before he could lift his glass to pour again, he slumped over in his seat. I think that makes you the winner, Alrian, Lara said. I think it does. What's my prize? You get to carry this drunk across the entire city, Lara said, pointing at Certain. There was no way he could walk. And the way he was staring into space, it seemed unlikely that he would be able to answer any questions. Come with us. We'll take you somewhere more comfortable to talk, Aurion said. Certain nodded his head and waved, but didn't utter anything other than some vague, drool-ridden nonsense. I think that's a yes. Let's go, Lara said. Aurion leaned in and dragged Certain to his feet. Aurion put one arm around him and made some odd movements with Certain's body jerking around. Need a hand there? Lara said, pointing to Certain. No, I'm fine. Just fine-tuning some magical assistance, Aurion said. You may want to make some more adjustments, Lara said, pointing. The way that Certain was propped up on the other side looked completely unnatural. Oh, yes, you're right. I'll have some unwanted attention soon, Aurion said. Lara rolled her eyes and came around to the other side to help. She assumed the right position as if she were helping. Aurion seemed to understand her plan, and Lara didn't have to hold any of the monks' weight. They emerged from the inn into the cool air and certain cheered. At least he's happy, Alrian said. You two are good folk, certain said. Or at least that was what the slurring noise sounded like. Thanks for that. Are you curious where we are headed? Laura said. Nope. Doesn't matter as long as it's warm and I'll have something to drink. Certain threw back an imaginary shot. It's warm and you'll have plenty of water, Alrian said. You did win fair and square, Certain said. However, the way he emphasized the words fair and square suggested that he wasn't entirely convinced. You made the rules, not us, Lara said. Yes, I did, but I didn't say you could break them. Don't be a sore loser, Lara said. Ho oh, hum, Certain said, staring off into space. Lara looked up, and they were still only halfway through the entertainment district. This is going to take a while, she said. 
I hope he actually has some useful information for us to make this whole effort worthwhile, Aurion said. Flora could see from his face how uncomfortable he was. She almost felt bad for not helping to hold Certain's weight. But Aurion had magic. He could handle it. They received more strange and judgmental looks in the market district. I feel like everyone is watching us, but at the same time isn't looking, Aurion said. Yeah, they are noticing us, but are too polite to stare. I don't think this is a particularly new sight at all. So they see us, try not to look, then dismiss us. If that's the case, we should carry drunk people around more often, Aurion said. Lara laughed a little. It's a bit of a drag, though, she said, and Aurion joined her in laughing. Certain started laughing, too, which was infectious. Does he even know why we are laughing? Aurion said. I don't think he even cares, Lara said. They continued this strange routine, with Certain becoming less and less coherent and Aurion looking more and more strained. But they finally made their way through the working district and the entrance to the workshop where Vincent was toiling away. Hello there. I see we have a guest, Vincent said. They beat me fair and square, Certain said, piping up out of nowhere. Again emphasized the words fair and square. Good to see you are so gracious in defeat. Let's take him back to my quarters. I'll take him over here, Vincent said, walking over and taking the load off Lara. Aurion shifted his stance and looked relieved. He's not like any monk I've ever met, Vincent said. Most monks would not accompany you in this fashion, Certain said. Why is that, Aurion said. They would have dismissed your pathetic attempts at cheating and stormed off. But me, I'm much more generous. Certain gestured with his arms wide, no doubt trying to show the extent of his generosity. I think most monks wouldn't engage in drinking contests. Not that I hold that against you, Lara said. You got me, Certain said, mumbling the words. Vincent laughed, shaking his head. They hauled the man the rest of the way in silence. This is it, Vincent said. They were standing in front of a small square building. It was the same style as the rest, rough but well-cut stone, with a range of metal adornments on the door, windows, and trims. This is your place, Lara said. It's not mine exactly. But working blacksmiths that are qualified are given quarters to inhabit. These are for our use, Vincent said. Lara opened the door and Vincent and Alion shuffled inside, trying not to knock certain against any walls or doorways. The interior was sparsely decorated, but there was an old couch in the living room, so they carefully set certain down there. I appreciate the assistance, Certain said in a drunken drawl. Let me whip up something to help, Vincent said, disappearing into another room. I don't blame you for what you did. Clearly this man here cannot match me in drinking. And I went along with it because there was some good stuff. Thanks for playing along, Certain said slowly and carefully. Laura was about to reply when he slid to the side and started snoring. Well, I guess you weren't fast enough with your switching, Aurion said. I guess not. But you know, I think the fact that he noticed even after drinking that much means that he's very skilled. Under that strange behavior and clothing, he's the real deal, Lara said. I hope so. I need a good lead. I'd prefer it if my dream had contained some sort of map and directions, but it did not. I've not had any noteworthy dreams since. He's asleep already? Let him doze for a while. We can get more out of him when he sobers up. Vincent was holding a glass with dark liquid in it. What's that? Aurion asked. A special concoction to help sober him up and wake him up. But I'll save it for the morning. Let's all get some rest. Sounds good to me, Aurion said. Vincent showed him to the additional areas he had prepared with a separate mattress to sleep on. Lara watched Aurion fall asleep almost instantly, and she made herself comfortable. Lara had the strange feeling that she was being watched, and she sat up instantly. It was the break of dawn with a dim light filtering into the room. She could see a shape sitting in front of her, legs crossed. As her eyes adjusted, she could see it was certain, sipping the drink that Vincent had prepared the night before. This is good stuff. I'll have to get the recipe. As for last night, I must applaud your ingenuity and quick reflexes. You would have completely fooled anyone else. Certain held up his glass in a mock toast. Thanks for letting me get away with it. Are you ready for the story? Certain said. There was a fire and intensity to his eyes that Lara had not noticed before. 
Glad to finally meet you. I think we're all ready for that story, and it better be a good one. Five. The Fallen Monk. Alrian awoke to the sound of voices. He rose quickly and investigated. Lara and Certain were sitting opposite each other. I see you are awake and enjoying my father's vile drink. Story time? he asked. Yes, Certain said before taking another sip. I'll go and get my father. Alrian wandered through the small dwelling into the main bedroom. His father was fast asleep. Alrian shook him gently. Yes, Vincent said, drawing the word out. He's awake and sober. I figured you want to hear what he has to say. Of course, Vincent said, scrambling out of bed. Plus, you'll be pleased to know that he likes your strange drink. He likes it? Everyone hates it. That's half the point of it, Vincent said. Alrian left his father to wake himself up and return to Certain. Laura and Certain had rearranged their seating to accommodate more people comfortably. My father will be here in a moment, but can you begin? So, your name is Certain. What else should we know? Yes, that is my name. As you guessed, I was part of a highly secretive and skilled order of monks. They call themselves the Unbroken Wall. I never heard of them, Vincent said as he entered the room. He found a few pillows to sit down on and made himself comfortable. That's the idea. They are based out of a temple hidden in the middle of the desert. Hard to find and away from any trade routes. You have to know the way there or else you'll die wandering. Lucky we have you then, Lara said. Do not get ahead of yourself. Let me continue. This order of monks is incredibly old and there are four masters at any one time. The eldest of the masters is hundreds of years old, Certain said. How is that possible, Arian said. By the nature of their study and skill, their specialty is the study and application of the will. With it, many things can be altered, many so-called rules broken. They are able to push the boundaries of time and space and the limits of the human body. As strange as that sounds, it is starting to make sense to me, Alrian said. I've never heard someone respond like that. Very interesting. Certain tilted his head slightly and studied Alrian as if he was a puzzle to solve. What's an example of what they can do, Lara said. They can break steel or stone with any part of their body. They can avoid attacks that no other can even detect. They can move with speed and strength that is impossible. They can even move things with their mind, Certain said. Sign me up, Laura said. They do take women, but it requires dedication and years of training. I doubt you have the determination to do it, Certain said. I liked him more when he was drunk, Laura said. They sound like a formidable force and well-trained and disciplined. What happened to you? Vincent said. Certain visibly stiffened, taken aback by the comment. I don't mean to offend them. I'm sorry, Vincent said quickly. No, I am not offended by your question. It is quite valid. I was thinking of my failure and my situation. I will explain. Certain stood up and paced around the room a little, looking out into the distance. Then he resumed his seated position. Unlike many of the monks, I was not inducted as a child. I was a teenager, living out on the fringes of the desert. It was a small town, kept alive by the travelers who needed to cross the desert and could afford to pay for our overpriced supplies. We were not greedy, but the number of travelers was so low, we had to extract as much as we could from them to survive. You learned to live with very little, Vincent said. Yes, it was a simple life. Looking back, you don't realize how special it is. Happiness without wealth feels hard at the time, but it's infinitely easier. There's a lightness to it. As long as you can find a way to keep going, there are no particularly hard burdens. Your life and daily responsibilities consume your mind, keeping you safe. Sounds like a good preparation for joining an order of monks, Aurian said. It was, in a fashion. But as a teenager, I acted as most do. I rebelled against the conditions we lived in. I found some like-minded friends, and we started to roam further and further from our home. We found new people to trade with, stumbled across things left by desperate travelers, and felt like we had additional freedom and wealth. We shared only amongst ourselves and became wealthy in comparison to those around us. So what happened? Laura said. 
we became greedy. We heard that a caravan had lost a wheel, and a huge amount of valuables were abandoned in the desert. We were the only ones with the strength, knowledge, and resources to salvage it. Even though it was further than we had ever roamed before, we didn't even think twice. The lure of the price was too great. What was so alluring about it? It would have been enough for us to leave and build a life somewhere else. When you are young, the urge to wander is so strong. You will do anything to follow it. But as you can guess, things did not go so well. We found the caravan. Of course, it was further than we had planned for, and laden with even more goods than we expected. We argued about what to do. One of us wanted to drag it closer, to bring about another group to collect it all. One wanted to try to fix the caravan and ride it home. I wanted us to take a few valuables and go home, just enough to get us on our way. Who won? Vincent said. Not me. My friends decided to take our supplies and set off to find a way to fix the caravan. My theory is that they thought I would wait until they returned and be forced to help them. But I was impatient and took off in another direction, hoping to go home. Unfortunately, it was the wrong direction, and I got lost in the middle of the desert. Alone, hungry, and parched, I collapsed and considered myself done for. How did you get out of that? Alrian said, captivated by the story. He needed to hear more. One of the monks found me. They took me in and offered me a chance to join them. I had nothing more to do. My friends had abandoned me, and it was a chance to join something incredible. I really enjoyed my time there. Certain's tone of voice changed, and he started to look downwards. But something happened, Vincent said. Yes, it was one of the final trials. They have a room there. It is called the Room of Desire, and it is filled with all the things that a young man desires but does not need. Gold, wine, beer, treasures, you name it. As part of the trial, they take you in there and show you that it exists, make you sample the wine, select a piece of gold and a treasure. Then they lead you out, not locking the door or saying anything else. Did you know it was a trial? Alion said. They didn't explain it as such, but I suspected something was up. However, once that wine passed my lips, I was obsessed. I couldn't stop thinking about it. The thought drove me mad. So one night, I snuck back into the room and helped myself. The floodgates were open, and I didn't care who knew. Certain closed his eyes, a pained look crossing his features. It looked like he was reliving the moment. Presumably you were caught, Lara said. Yes, immediately. It's like they knew. They weren't mean about it. They just said that everyone responds differently to the trial and that I could not stay. I packed my things and left. Luckily, I knew how to navigate the desert by that point so I could safely rejoin society. What did you do? Alrian said. I wandered from here to there. I, I took odd jobs as a mercenary laborer or whatever was available. When I wasn't working, I availed myself of local entertainments. Establishments like the one where you found me. It's a strange spiral down that I found myself in. I started to avoid the paying jobs, to deny myself access to the coin that would immediately go back into more drinks. But that just led to other behavior, like trading away the scarf which was my last tie to the monks. Are you happy with your current lifestyle? Vincent said. No, I'm not. But I don't see a way out. I'm trapped in a downward spiral that only ends in one way. Certain didn't shy away from it. Help us. This is your chance to turn things around. Please, I, I need to ask you a very important question, Arian said. Certain did not respond. After a long pause, he opened his eyes. I don't think I have another chance. But I am a man of my word and will help you. What do you need to know? I had a dream, and in it I saw four monks dressed in garments with the same symbol that was on your scarf. They were sitting outside a doorway to a pure white room. I need to get there and undertake whatever trial that is. Does that make any sense? Alrian said. Certain closed his eyes again. He looked asleep. After a few minutes, he opened his eyes once more and addressed Alrian. I know of what you speak. I have meditated to recall as much detail as possible. The room you speak of is called the Vault of Silence. It is the final trial a monk undergoes. Very few make it that far, and 
Very few succeed. Yet we are all told about it early on in our training. I'm not sure why, but that's no matter now. It's all about the mastery of the will. If you can pass that trial, you have achieved the pinnacle of monkhood, Certain said. I have to pass that trial. What else can you tell me about it? Unfortunately, I don't know the specific details. I just know that the four elder monks administered the test. It requires you to enter the room. I've only heard of one monk taking the test in all the time I've been there. What happened? Lara said. We never saw him again. I guess he failed. I can't say for sure. That's reassuring, Aurian said. I'm just telling you what I know. Without being aware of your background, I think you will find it very challenging. You do not have the proper training to succeed. Certain's face was emotionless. Alrian could tell the monk was not trying to belittle him. Even still, he couldn't accept that statement. I have to pass, so I will find a way, Alrian said. I can see the fire within your eyes. You have the passion and the embers of a strong will. Perhaps that will be enough. Certain stood up and paced around the room. I will draw you a map so you can find your way through the desert. Then our business is concluded. That would be very helpful, Vincent said. Why not come with us? You can show us the way yourself, and you can resume your training, Aurian said. No, I cannot go back. It's not possible. Did they even say that? Or are you just being stubborn and embarrassed, Aurian said. Certain stopped his pacing. Aurian could see that he was getting through to the monk. I am not sure. I will think on it. That is the best answer I can give you right now, he said. Thanks, Aurian said. It was a start. He could work on it. After hearing the story, he couldn't imagine undertaking the journey without certain. You know, it'll be fun. We can all go. It will be an adventure, Lara said. Not on my watch, a voice said from the doorway. They all turned to look at their visitor. It was a woman dressed in leather traveling clothes with tall boots and a short jacket thrown over her shoulders. Silas, Vincent said, shock in his voice. You thought I would just wait at home after hearing what you were up to? Lucky I did turn up. You look like you're about to let my son run off with this young delinquent and this fallen monk, Silas said. Sertan looked away, embarrassment on his face. Delinquent? I'm no such thing, Laura said. Alrian could see her face flare up in anger. Mom, what is going on? Aurian had never seen this side of her. She was always strong and loving and fair, but here she seemed different. He had never seen her dressed like this before. There was now an edge to her strength and a confidence in her stance that suggested a whole other part of her story that he never knew about. He didn't know whether to be relieved or scared. Six. An Unexpected Reunion Silas strode around the room, looking them all up and down. I see no need to change my initial assessment. I think so, Dyer. Honey, calm down. There's a lot to discuss, Vincent said. You bet there is. You told me you were taking him to study at the academy. Then I get a letter saying that you're on this huge quest, and you'll write again from prank tour? Not good enough. Sorry, we couldn't exactly turn around, Vincent said. So, where's that troublemaking wizard anyway? I want to give Falric a piece of my mind. I warned him quite clearly. Silas had a look in her eyes that caused even Alrian to shrink back. He's no longer with us, Vincent said. Silas stopped, and her mood changed completely. She stopped pacing around, and her expression visibly softened. I'm sorry. I had no idea. What kind of mess is this, she said. Take a seat. We will talk you through it, Vincent said. Certain Rosen started to leave the room. Stay and listen, please. You're part of this now, Aurian said. Certain hesitated, then returned. What I will say must not leave this room. Vincent started to tell the story and let Aurian take over in the parts where they were separated. Silas showed no reaction until the story was finished. I am sorry for my outburst, she said. Immediately, she rose and walked over to Alrian, giving him a huge hug. He returned it, happy to have his mother back. His eyes teared up a bit, and he turned away to hide them. Salis returned to where she was sitting. Don't worry about any of that. I'm happy to accept the blame. I should have explained more, Vincent said. 
What now? Aurion said. I can't stop what is already in motion, but I can influence what happens next. I'll even support this quest you are on. But before we can leave, you two need to pass a test, Celis pointed at Certain and Lara. What kind of test? Lara said. For you, it's simple. You will accompany Aurion and me on a little recovery mission. Vincent knows what it is, Celis said, looking at Vincent and smiling. Vincent laughed after the moment of recognition, but didn't say anything. Celis turned to Certain next. For you, it's even easier. Go retrieve your scarf and return to us dressed as a person who has pride in his appearance. That will signify to me that you are ready, Celis said. I haven't even agreed to go anywhere. Why would I undertake your test? Certain said. Because you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I only just met you, but I can tell that a life of wandering is not fulfilling. You have made a mistake. Now go rectify it, Celis said. Certain looked at her with a strange expression, like he was trying to puzzle out the meaning of her words. He looked away, deep in thought. I accept, he said, and left the room without looking back. Wow, that was quick, Aurion said. He would have agreed eventually. I just sped up the process, Celis said. That's one problem solved. Maybe you can now explain our part of the test, Lara said. It's better to show you. Let's go. Celis left the room and waited for them at the front door. Arian gave his father a confused look but followed along. Lara was quicker to move and sidled up to Celis. Arian couldn't make out what they were saying, but it looked like the two women were challenging each other. I feel like I don't know who Mom is, Arian said. Don't worry, she's the same. It's just a side of her that she hasn't needed for a long time. You'll be fine, Vincent said. Alrian was not completely satisfied with the answer, but rushed to join Lara and his mother at the front door. We are off to the market district, Celis said and opened the door. She walked out into the street with confidence, as if she knew the place well. How did you find us? Lara said. Easy. Vincent and I stayed here many years ago before we had Alrian. For a brief moment, Celis let a smile dart across her face, but a serious gaze soon replaced it. Oh, that's interesting. You have a history here. We do, which will be explained soon, Celis said. A strong silence hung over them as they walked. Alrian looked at his mother with a confused expression. The strong, nurturing figure he had always known didn't quite fit with the person he was observing. There was a piece missing which was driving him crazy. I hope this makes sense soon. He could see Lara trying to puzzle it out as well with furtive sidelong glances. The market district was teeming with people, much more so than the night before. The stalls were packed full of interesting trinkets, and the cries of sellers competing for attention made it quite noisy. There were even food vendors set up, peddling fruit or cooked meat on sticks. They wove their way through the crowd and bustle and headed to far corner of the district. As they progressed, the crowds thinned out until there were only a few passing people. Where are we going? Alrian said. Willem's fine wares, Salus said. Sure enough, they stopped in front of a large building that looked like it was a mansion. Anywhere else, he would have assumed that a person of immense importance resided there. Does someone live here? Yes, the owner lives here and also operates the front of a gallery and showroom. Salus walked up to the burly guard outside the front door and held up her hands. The guard patted her down and ushered her through. What's this? Alrian said. Weapon and two checks, the guard said. His voice was as rough as his face. They want to make sure we aren't going to steal anything, Celis said. Sure, nothing to hide here. Alrian raised his arms and had the same check done. Laura stepped up next. The guard checked her the same way, then stopped suddenly. What's this? He said. Sorry, I forgot about those. I, I wasn't expecting to come here. Lara said innocently. She retrieved a stack of daggers from the small of her back. I'll hold them until you are done shopping, the guard said with a healthy measure of sarcasm. Thanks. Lara joined the others inside the building. Alrian was shocked at the room on display. There were polished marble floors and cabinets full of jewels, treasures, and fine clothes. One table had rings, another amulets and earrings. In the middle of the whole collection was a stone pedestal. On it was a red velvet cushion with a clear dome over it. Inside was the most incredible jewel Alrian had ever seen. What is that? He whispered to Celis. That's the pure diamond, 
It's the biggest diamond in the world and said to have been created with magic. There's even talk that it glows blue when encountering those tainted with the blight. Wow, that's incredible. I'll re turn to look at Lara to see her reaction. Her eyes were darting around the room, taking it all in. A girl after my own heart, Salas said softly. Alrian walked closer to take a closer look. He was immediately stopped by a thin man dressed all in black. Alrian hadn't even seen him. Excuse me, Alrian said. No closer. You cannot approach the diamond without prior approval, the man said. Alrian examined the man's face. It was hard and emotionless with piercing blue eyes. Sure, I just thought it looked incredible, Alrian said. The man nodded and waved him away. Alrian diverted his attention to inspecting the table of rings. However, he also watched his mother and Lara wander through the room. It looked like they were just browsing, but he sensed a different intent and purpose from them. It was so methodical. Thick as thieves, Alrian thought. Then he had a sudden epiphany. There was a reason his mother seemed so different and was instantly so critical of Lara. Maybe his mother used to be a thief, too. He wanted to blurt it out, then realized that it wasn't wise given their current situation. But the more he thought about it, the more he was convinced. I can see that look on your face. Save it for later, Celis said to him. Alria nodded and found some more jewelry to examine. He didn't know much about it, but everything looked expensive and well-made. He could tell the craftsmanship was incredible. Thanks for your time, Celis said to nobody in particular and headed for the door. Lara was close behind her and Alrian rushed to join them. They left the premises. Lara collected her daggers with a smile and a wink and the three of them walked off in silence. After they were almost out of the market district, Celis led them into a quiet alley and stopped. I can tell you have questions, Celis said. More like statements. You want us to steal that jewel and you're also a thief. And maybe you tried to steal it when you were here before, Alrian said quickly. That's actually quite correct. When I met your father, I was a thief. This jewel was my target, and we failed to steal it and had to leave the city. We? Was he in on it? Of course. Who do you think crafted the keys for me? Salas said with a sly smile. Alrian couldn't believe it. His father had always been so straight and by the letter of the law. Seems like a lot of security, Lara said. I didn't notice much. One guard out front and a man inside, Alrian said. There's many more hidden around the place, and magical traps, I'm guessing, Celis said. So what's the plan, Alrian said. I'm still working through it, but we will go tonight. Sounds good to me. This will be a real thrill. I'm excited, Lara said. Celis gave her a questioning look, but didn't say anything. I'm going to investigate the area a little more, but we will draw too much attention as a group. You two go back to the house, Celis said. Sure, let's go, Alrian said to Lara. You don't want any help? Lara said. No, I've got this. I need to see how much things have changed, Celis said. Understood. We'll see you later, Lara said. The two of them walked out the laneway, leaving Celis alone. I can't believe it. She's a thief. I never knew, Alrian said once they were a safe distance away. I must admit, I had my suspicions when she showed up, Lara said. How could you tell? The way she dressed initially. Normal-looking clothing, but it is light, protective, and quiet. She had lots of pockets for stashing tools, and she was very particular about assessing the situation. What's so unusual about being careful? It was the type of careful. When you're retrieving something, you don't want any surprises. You must be able to predict everything that will happen and plan ahead. You also have to be very adaptable and change things on the fly as required. So how many so-called retrieval jobs have you done? More than I can remember, but only a few really memorable ones. Have you ever been caught? Once or twice when I was starting out, but I didn't know what I was doing and it was small stakes. That doesn't happen later on, not if you're careful and learn from your mistakes. So what does happen? You have an escape plan and you abandon the job. If you get away, you can retry another day. You never stick around, that's suicide. I'll remember that, Aurian said. Yeah, if things go wrong on the job, you need to cut and run. It's not worth it. Got it. Have you had a job like they did with this one, where you had to abandon? Yes, just the one. What happened? I don't really want to talk about it. Another time. Lara avoided eye contact and started focusing on something in the distance. 
Alrian took her cue and stopped asking questions. Once they arrived back at the house, Alrian looked for his father but couldn't find him. He'll be working on those swords, Lara said. Good point. So how do I prepare for one of these jobs, Alrian said. In a day? No chance you'll be prepared. But I'll teach you one thing. What's that? How to walk quietly. Lara walked across the room soundlessly, doing a pirouette on the other end. Now you're just showing off, Alrian said, impressed but laughing. Why not? Don't worry, you'll be dancing along in silence in no time. Lara stepped back to Alrian, then started demonstrating her footwork. Take a normal step, she said. Alrian did as instructed, his boot making a resounding thud. I think you overdid it, but that's fine. Now what you need to do is imagine that you are spreading out your entire weight over the entire surface of your foot and gently rolling your weight as you step. Lara demonstrated in slow motion. Alrian tried it and stepped very quietly. He looked up at her in shock. If you go slowly enough, it's easy. The trick is doing it at pace. Lara darted into the next room, and even though Alrian was watching and listening closely, he could barely hear her footsteps. Shouldn't be too hard. He started walking softly as Lara had demonstrated, and quickly sped up. For a moment, he was swift and silent and feeling like a gliding shadow. However, he started to lose his balance and came to a sudden stop with a loud stamping of his feet. That's going to get you into trouble. What's the saying? You need to learn to walk before you can run? Lara said. Her eyes sparkled with amusement as she laughed heartily at Alrian. Hey, I'm a wizard. I don't have to obey the normal rules, <laughs> Alrian said, joining her in the laughter. Just practice a bit more so we can rely on you tonight, Lara said. Of course. I was just thinking, though, maybe there's a way I can do it with magic. Alrian ran to his spell book to look through it. Lara watched him go and just shook her head gently. 7. A Test Certain left the house in a hurry, partly because he had a purpose, partly because he had to get out of there. His crazy wild ride had crashed and burned in style. I can't believe what I've gotten myself into, he thought. Less than a day ago, he was living his practically unconscious life of oblivion. He had hit rock bottom, given away the last precious memento of his time with the monks. The fact that he regarded the monks as another people also saddened him. This is your second chance, a voice inside him said. It was right. For some time he didn't believe that he deserved it. But these people thought so and they needed his help. So he had to earn their trust. Certain started to head to the entertainment district, but then quickly changed his mind. Even if he could find the man who now had his scarf, he had nothing to bargain with. And he certainly looked like a mess. Certain glanced at a nearby puddle and saw his reflection. He had tried to ignore it, but he forced himself to look properly. He had been living hard, and it had taken its toll. Enough is enough, he said. He changed course and headed for the blacksmith district. With any luck, he could pick up some work as a laborer or assistant. The blacksmith district was alive with action. The clanging could be easily heard as he approached. It's a numbers game, Certain said to himself. As he entered, he wandered up to the first workshop. We don't have any handouts. Move on, a bearded man said as Certain approached. I'm just looking for an honest day's work, Certain said. Keep looking, the man said and turned his back. Thanks, Certain said, not even sarcastically. If he wanted to succeed, he needed to return to the self that he was with the monks, in control and humble, throwing his ego to the winds. He continued to the next workshop. This time he at least managed to make eye contact with someone and speak first. Hello, I'm looking for some work. Do you need a strong pair of hands? Certain said. I'm sorry, we're fine right now. I appreciate the offer, though. My brother works in the last workshop, right before the restricted weapon sections. Why don't you give him a try? The blacksmith said. I will do. Thanks for the tip. Certain bowed and continued walking. He ignored the rest of the workshops and continued to the next set of gates. The workshop he was after was quite obvious. It was humongous and was the only one right next to the gates. Before he could approach, though, he saw commotion up ahead. Stop! Thief! A male voice shouted. Certain could see one of the local guards chasing after a young man. The youth was carrying a bag full of something and brandishing a sword. Without thinking twice, Certain moved into the youth's path to intercept him. 
The youth swung his sword, hoping to scare Certain away. But Certain didn't flinch. He dodged the attack and grabbed the young man's arm and nimbly threw him to the ground. The young thief was quick and darted back to his feet, but Certain was standing in front of him. Move or I'll cut you down, the youth said. You cannot, except that you have been caught, Certain said. The youth lashed out at Certain's legs with the sword. Certain saw the attack just in time to dodge and kicked the sword so hard it clattered against a nearby building. The guard in pursuit finally caught up to them, panting with the exertion. Thanks for your help, citizen. We aren't equipped for foot chases, and he had a head start. Happy to help out since I was here anyway, Certain said. The guard looked him over, a confused expression on his face. Are you some kind of monk or just homeless? Probably both are accurate. I've been wondering for a time. I'm looking for some work now, though. I have something for you. My friends run security for a place in the market district. They are always looking for more help, and you're quite capable. Here, take this, the guard said, handing Certain a coin. I cannot accept this, Certain said. Just take it. I get a commission for anyone I send over anyway. Get yourself cleaned up and some better clothes. They will provide you with everything else you need. Report to the Wondrous Wall Inn and tell them that Sean sent you for a job, Sean said. Thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. Don't mention it. You've helped me out, and I get paid if they hire you, so it's a win for me either way. What's your name, by the way? Certain. Well, Certain, take care of yourself. See you around. Thanks, Sean. Certain bowed and turned back the way he had come. This is the break I needed. The money I earn from this job can buy back my scarf and I'll be back on the path. The right path, Certain thought. Things had turned the corner. Laura heard a noise and walked over to investigate. She saw Vincent arriving back at the house. He looked exhausted after a long day. What's all this, he said. I'm trying to teach Alrian how not to be a lumbering beast, Laura said. That might take a while, Vincent said. I would agree, but you might be surprised. Alrian seemed to be taking the gentle ribbing in good spirits. I must admit, he's at least trying, Laura said. Good to hear. Where's your mother, Vincent said. She's doing some investigating, Alrian said. Casing the place for guards, traps, and entry points more specifically, Laura said. She must be pretty serious about this heist. I wonder why after all this time, Vincent said. Is it really true that the two of you tried to steal this jewel back in the day? Arian said. It's all true. It's the main reason why we left Brangtor. It was only a matter of time before they figured out who it was. We were so close. I didn't realize she was still thinking about it all these years later. But that's a story for another time, Vincent said. How are the swords going? Alrian said. Very well. I should be able to finish them tomorrow, if everything goes to plan. I'm pretty excited. They have surpassed all my expectations. And my dagger? Lara said. I think I can get there, but only if I can finish the others first. Just don't forget. You know he's going to need someone watching his back, Lara said, pointing at Alrian. Oh, I know. Don't you worry. Let me prepare something to eat. You two keep training. Vincent left them and entered the kitchen. Laura could hear a lot of banging pots and pans around. He eventually emerged with dinner as promised. It smelled better than it looked. After they all finished up a simple meal of meat, bread, and potatoes, Silas entered the house. I've done as much as I can do. We're definitely going in tonight, she said. Hungry? We saved you some, Vincent said, pointing to a plate of food. Starving? You haven't cooked for me for a while, Silas said with delight. Trying to win my way back into the good books, Vincent said, giving her a cheeky grin. Sailors gave him a wry smile. Keep trying, but good start, she said. And we've been busy too. I taught Alrin how to not barge around like a drunken bull. Laura gave Alrin an approving look and he smiled back. Good, that will come in handy. This is going to be a tough one, but we are in luck. They seem to be understaffed. A lot fewer guards than my previous attempt. Maybe there's a lot less interest in the diamond, Sailor said. So we can actually pull this off, Aurion said. Of course, one way or another. Where's the monk? She said, looking around. Not sure, I haven't seen him today, Aurion said. He will return when he's ready, Vincent said. He'd better do it soon. Since we're taking this jewel, we need to be leaving town as soon as possible, Sailor said. I'm sure he will be here, Aurion said. If you say so. Now everyone make your final preparations. We should leave as soon as possible. 
It's going to be a long night, Silas said. Alrian adjusted his clothing to have a cloak with a hood covering his face. Laura did the same, but also had to select which tools she would be taking, expertly stashing them away. Don't wait up, Silas said to Vincent, giving him a quick kiss. You know I will. Take care, he said to all of them. Alrin and Laura said their farewells and followed Silas out into the cold night air. Shouldn't we be discussing the plan, Alrin said. No, we are keeping this simple. Do as I say exactly and everything will go smoothly, Silas said. She's right, Laura said. All right, I can do that. Alrin let Laura and his mother take the lead and fell in behind them. Silas directed them back to the market district. How do you feel? Nervous? Laura said. No. Well, maybe a little, but just because I have no experience as a thief. My magic is a little over the top. That's fair, which will be quite helpful if we get caught. Which we won't. Right, Silas? Right. Just as long as you follow my instructions. Silas didn't bother turning to face them. Her eyes were locked into gazing into the distance. Laura was excited. She hadn't been on a heist for a long time, especially one with another thief. It had been a long string of solo efforts. She realized how much she had missed it, the joint excitement of sharing the risk and reward with others. I'll have to convince Alrian to do more of these, she thought. That would be fun. Keep up, Sailor said, increasing her speed. Laura understood the approach. It would take them a long time to enter the building quietly and unseen, so the sooner they reached their destination, the better. She spent some time studying Silas as they went. There was an ease to the way she moved, which obviously came from a lot of experience. But Laura sensed something else, a nervous energy, too. This has to be huge for her. She's going back for this diamond so many years later, and with her son in tow, too. I better do well in this trial. We're here, Silas said and stopped. They were in a dark alley in the middle of the market district. Alrian and Laura paused and looked around. There, Silas said, pointing to a grate for drainage. Alrian knelt down and lifted it, carefully dragged it away. I hate this part of stealing stuff, Laura said as she peered into the hole. It's the best way in, and nobody wants to guard it, Silas said. Is this ladies first, Alrian said. No, this is the exception, Silas said, and Alrian prepared to climb down. Laura was next. They were in a completely dark tunnel. Seems deserted. Is it safe to light our path, Alrian said. Yes, Silas said. Alrian lit the way with a small flame dancing above his palm. As the flickering light bounced around the tunnel, they could see what it really was. This doesn't look like any ordinary tunnel. Laura subconsciously checked her tools. No, this is actually a secret exit. It's the escape tunnel for the mansion we are entering. Won't they be expecting that? Alrian said. No, there's only one key. Or so Wilhelm thinks. Silas pulled a tiny, intricate key from her pocket. How did you get that? Laura said. Vincent made it for me many years ago, but I never used it. And you kept it all this time? Alrian said. It was a keepsake from the old days, but now it's an opportunity. Let's keep moving, Silas said. Alrian walked ahead, lighting the way. The tunnel was old and grimy. As they walked, it became less damp and smelled different. The pungent odor was replaced by something different. Alrian moved his hand slightly as they walked to better illuminate the area. Laura used that opportunity to study the walls, but didn't see anything of note. The tunnel just kept going and going. Finally, they saw something different in the distance. I think we're coming up to something, Laura said. As they approached, they could see it more clearly. A massive iron door, incredibly thick with lots of reinforcement. The lock was a large square protrusion with a tiny keyhole. Just as I would expect, Silas said. There's no breaking through that. Lucky there's a keyhole on the outside, Laura said. Turns out that while Wilhelm's definitely paranoid, he is not an idiot. Here goes, Silas said, walking forward and inserting the key into the lock. She turned the key slowly, a bead of sweat appearing on her brow. It seems to be moving, Laura thought, observing Silas. Then she heard a loud click. Eight. Diamonds are forever. Silas stepped back and pushed the door hard. At first it didn't give, but then began to give way. It creaked like it had never been opened and revealed a storeroom of sorts. It looks like we're in. Extinguish the light, please, Silas said. 
Adrian let the flame disappear and waited for additional instructions. Where to? Lara said. Alrian, stay in this room and guard our exit. Lara and I will retrieve the diamond and meet you back here, Silas said. Sure, take care, Alrian said. Silas went ahead, noting the state of the room as they passed through. Just crates and other storage, and it didn't look used recently. We won't keep you waiting too long, Lara said, and she followed Silas through the room. Silas kept up a quick pace, but maintained her stealthy movement. She had never been in this part of the mansion, so she was using her intuition to guide her. Once they left the storeroom, she paused and felt for the direction of the wind. There was a slight draft coming from the right, so she decided to start there. Laura stayed close behind and didn't say anything. What a relief she is a professional. This will make things simpler, Sales thought. At the end of the corridor, they came to a stone staircase. Half a flight of stairs at a time. Wait for my signal before following, Sales whispered. Laura nodded, her eyes clear and focused. Silas lightly dashed up the stairs, pausing at the turn and scanning ahead. When it was clear, she signaled Laura and continued. They continued this ritual a few times, until Silas noticed that they were merging into an inhabited area. Kitchen. Another area she wasn't particularly familiar with, but she knew it was located near the rear of the mansion. She crept carefully to the nearest corridor and peered through. Again, she had the choice of left or right. Left, she whispered to Laura. It was a pure gut decision, but she didn't have time for any other. The corridor was well lit, so Silas moved with caution. She expected quite a few guards, but wasn't sure where they would be posted. It seemed unlikely to have them congregated around the kitchen, but she wouldn't put it past Wilhelm. He was incredibly protective and could easily have randomly reallocated patrols. Silas passed a doorway and stopped. She stepped back and looked again. She recognized it. This way, she said to Lara. The two of them entered the room. It was a connecting room filled with coats and boots. Utility room for the guards. We're going to come across some soon, Silas whispered. I'm ready, Lara said. No kills, of course. Good, now keep close. Silas crept through the room, noting the changes that had happened. But the ugly painting of Wilhelm's father prepared for a hunt was still there. She would never forget it. Silas finally spotted a guard. He was tall and thin, lounging against the wall. She almost didn't spot him. His dark black clothing blended into the shadows. Salus tapped Lara and pointed at the guard, then at a doorway behind him. Lara understood and stood at the ready. Salus crept into the hallway and dashed past where the guard was posted. If a memory was right, she would be able to weave through another room and take him by surprise. The first room had an open door, so she snuck in. It was a dining room. Was this here before? It had been a long time, but she didn't recognize it. She pressed on anyway. She stepped around chairs left out and cursed at one she almost tripped over. But she kept her composure and could see the silhouette of the guard from the light of a faraway torch. She retrieved a dagger from her belt and readied it. Her heart beat faster and faster. Her instincts were still good, but it had been a long time. Gradually, she crept forward, readying her weapon. She wouldn't need to inflict any damage, just take the guard by surprise, then tie him up in the dining room. That would be enough. She practiced the maneuver in her mind, then reached out to put the dagger up against his throat. But the guard seemed to anticipate her movement. He moved towards her and grabbed the dagger before she could alter her stance. She grabbed another and tried again, but he saw that coming and held her other hand. There they stood, face to face, hands interlocked. The monk, Salus said in disbelief. What was he doing here? Silas, Certain said. He was in shock. He didn't even notice Lara behind him, kicking his legs out from under him. Wait, Silas whispered with force before Lara could land a knockout blow. Lara paused, confused. Silas pointed to the dining room and dragged Certain over with her. What's going on? Lara said. This is the monk. Certain? Lara said. Yes, I got a job. I didn't expect this. It was part of my plan to start on a new path. Yes, yes, very good. Just stay here and come with us when we leave. How many other guards are there? Silas said. At least five. But I'm new, so that won't tell me anything. That's why I'm here, away from the valuables, he said. Fine. Just act normal and don't leave this spot, Silas said. As you wish, Certain said, and walked back to where he was previously posted. There's always something, Silas whispered to Lara. Always, Lara whispered back. Silas pointed to a far doorway and made her way over. 
Lara followed close behind. Silas noticed two other guards as they wound through the main floor, but decided to avoid them. Running into certain had been a sign, she had decided, and they didn't have time to disable all the guards. If only they could avoid detection on their way in, they could manage anything on their way out. The entry to the main hall was visible, but Silas paused before rushing over. She didn't want to trip over any traps or security. Her quick look around during the day had only spotted guards, not anything special. There was bound to be something. Stay close, she whispered to Laura and began her approach. Creeping softly along and sticking to the shadows, she made good progress. She could see a guard walking around the main hall and timed herself so that she would arrive at the entry while he was on the other end of the room. She entered the main hall and swiftly ducked down behind a table. Laura joined her immediately. So far, so good. But I've got a feeling there's going to be some traps. Tread carefully, Silas said. Got it, Laura said. Silas snuck over to the end of the table and peered around the corner. The guard was just passing and wouldn't see her. She darted out and took cover behind another table, leaving space for Laura to join her. Before making another move, she scanned the room again. She could not see any other guards. That's odd. I was sure he would keep more here, Silas thought. But she didn't share that with Lara. There was no need to worry her unnecessarily. Satisfied that there were no obvious threats, Silas waited for the guard and used his patrol route to move closer. They repeated this two more times, to be almost within reach of the pure diamond. I'll get the diamond. If something happens, you leave and take certain and Alrian with you, Silas said. Are you sure? Yes, I can handle this. And if for some reason I can't, for me it's only a delay. You cannot afford a delay. If you insist, Laura said. Good, here goes, Silas said and made her move. She crouched around with steps as light as a feather, ducking under the robe and appearing right next to the pure diamond. She remained low to the ground, though, in case she had to hide quickly. Silas slowly rose and examined the glass housing. Doesn't appear to be any traps. That is a concern, but I can't back out now. With her left hand, she gently lifted the glass housing, and with her right, she reached for the diamond. She grabbed it without incident and replaced the glass housing. Done. Once a thief, always a thief. A man's voice rang out from the gallery above. Lamps were quickly lit around the room, illuminating it within seconds. Sailor stood, not trying to hide herself. Stay down, she whispered to Lara and deliberately dropped the diamond. Don't think you can try anything, and that's just the dummy. Well, a beautiful dummy, good enough to fool you and everyone else. Willem showed off another diamond in his hand, then tucked it back into his coat. He started to descend from the gallery. He was flanked by at least twenty guards. What game are you playing? Celis said, acting confident. She wasn't sure how she had been tricked so easily. I never forget a face, especially one that got away. I did never find out your real name, though, which is a shame. But I guess you can tell me now, Shadow Fox, Willem said. Laura drew in a startled breath. So you're still obsessed after all these years, Celis said. I could say the same to you. What tipped you off, Celis said. She was pretty sure she knew, but wanted to give him a moment to gloat. That may provide her an opportunity. I saw you here today. You were discreet and fast, but I remembered you, even after all these years. And I knew that you would be impatient, so I just had to wait. I'm not even sure how you made it in, but it doesn't matter. All I had to do was wait for you to take the bait. And here you are. Willem was standing right in front of her now. He looked about the same. He was a gnarly old man before, and he still was now. He just looked like he'd shrunk a little and walked with more difficulty. For now, she would find an opening some way or other. Oh, you aren't getting away this time. No, all exits are sealed and you are surrounded. There's no way to get out, Willem said. Sellers looked around, sizing up the guards. They didn't look that tough, and only a few had crossbows. There was always a chance. But before she could put a plan into action, she saw some movement out of the corner of her eye. Laura darted from nowhere and had a knife to Willem's throat. We'll be leaving, thanks. Call off your dogs, Laura said. Willem was visibly shaken, but recovered quickly. Why would I do that? Because I could kill you if you sneezed, and it's awfully dusty in here, Laura said. I guess that is a risk, but if anything happens to me, you're as good as dead. I'm your only hope. 
You're right about that, but you are going to help me whether you like it or not. Laura threw a glass vial on the ground with her free hand, and it shattered instantly. Smoke started to spew from the ground, and Laura shoved Willem into it. Get them, he shouted, choking on the smoke. Follow me, Silas said, heading for the nearest exit from the hall. She kept low, trying to break line of sight. The diversion with the smoke worked well, splitting up the guards nicely. There were two posted at each door, but they didn't see Salus coming. By the time they noticed, the first guard was already on the floor, and the second was taken down by Lara as he tried to attack Salus. Just run, Salus shouted once they were through the door. They retraced their steps, not worrying about being silent anymore. Speed was of the essence. They initially had no problems, the guards rushing around, not aware of their presence or too slow to react. But there were three guards waiting where they had left certain. Doesn't look good, Salus said. However, she noticed another guard walking up to them. He glided between them, quickly knocking all three down. Nice, Lara said. Certain waved at them and disappeared into the nearby dining room. Salus and Lara rushed to join him. I'm not sure where the exit is, but we should have a relatively clear run, he said. True to his word, they didn't see anyone else. Alrian was waiting for them at the exit. What's going on? I heard a commotion, Alrian said. Complications. Don't worry, let's just head out, Silas said. Certain? Alrian said it as he noticed the monk. Plenty of time for explanations later, he said. Sure, well, nothing happened here. Let's go. Alrian led the way out into the tunnel. Can you see that light in the distance? Alrian said. Yes, what do you think it is? Silas said. Not sure, but there's no way that is coming in from the street. Alrian created a miniature ball of fire and threw it along the tunnel. Salas watched his progress and heard a cry of pain. We're not alone, Lara said. Slow down, let's not rush in, Salas said. The group slowed their advance and continued at a more measured pace. As they closed the distance, it became obvious what the light was. There was a force of twenty armed guards standing in formation at the end of the tunnel and blocking the exit. Those are city guards, Salas said. Waiting for us, Arian said. That Wilhelm, he was well prepared, Silas said. Not prepared enough. Otherwise, they would have known that such a small force is not going to cut it. It's a shame I couldn't use your stealth lessons, Laura, but this will be more fun. Leave it to me, Aurion said with a smile. Who is this young man and what did he do with my son, Silas thought. At least she had an opportunity to see for herself just what he could do. Nine. Setting out. Alrian took two steps forward. He had an idea he wanted to try. Clearing his throat, he weaved a wave of force in front of him. But instead of sending it out, he let it hover and vibrate. Then he spoke into it. Leave now and you will not be harmed, Alrian said. His voice sounded lower in pitch than normal and boomed around the tunnel. How did you do that, Lara said. I just had an idea and it worked. Alrian whispered back at her. The soldiers looked a little rattled, but had not moved. As you wish, Alrian shouted, then let the spell dissipate. It had worked surprisingly well. He wasn't sure if he had melded ideas he had already had or drawn up on some knowledge hidden in his mind, but it didn't matter. Alrian started walking forward with purpose, preparing his next move. He could see the soldiers take a defensive stance. Alrian drew upon his spark and ignited flames above his hands. Then he combined them with a wave of force. Rolling spirals of flame tumbled along the ground, arching up before they hit the soldiers. They dove to the ground, narrowly avoiding the flames. Alrian kept walking. He threw another wave of force, this time adding no fire. The dust swirled around as it traveled along the ground, but this one didn't suddenly jump up. It stayed low and knocked around all the soldiers who had ducked the previous attack. They have a wizard! One of the soldiers said. Another replied, We're sitting ducks in here. Alrian noticed they had retreated a few meters. A bit further and he would have access to the ladder. He drew upon his spark one more time, concentrating on the ground in front of the soldiers. A low wall of flame rose up, stopping at chest height. The front row of soldiers scrambled back. Alrian advanced and moved the wall of fire forward as well. The soldiers continued to retreat. Just a little bit further. Alrian pushed the wall forward, the soldiers bunching up as they ran out of the tunnel. That should do, Alrian said, maintaining the wall of fire in its current location. And that will work, 
Nice work, Lara said, noticing that the path to the tunnel stairs was now clear. Let's be quick. I can't do this all day, and I don't want them to try anything, Alrian said. Agreed. Time to leave, Celis said. Alrian continued his steady pace while he concentrated on the spell. The rest ran ahead, climbing out of the tunnel. You won't get away with this. We know who you are, one of the soldiers shouted. But Alrian didn't take any notice. Once the rest were out, he climbed out himself. Is the spell still active, Celis said. Yes. What's our next move, Alrian said. Just hold it long enough for us to block this exit. That will buy us enough time, she said. Lara noticed a nearby box full of scrapped metal items. Help me with this, she said to certain. The two of them dragged the box over to the top of the tunnel exit. That should do, Celis said. Alrian let the spell go and they ran from the alley as quickly as possible. Once they rejoined the market street, Celis slowed and the rest matched her pace. Quickly and quietly, let's get back to the house, she said. Alrian looked back but couldn't see any pursuers. He was happy at what he had done. The spells had taken more spark than he had expected, but it all worked out fine, and he didn't need to let on just how much power he had expended. Each step away helped him relax a bit more, but he couldn't calm down until they reached the safety of the house. Celis was inside first, with certain ushering the others in ahead of himself. They found Vincent standing inside, arms crossed. How'd you go? he said. He didn't seem impressed, as if he knew something had gone wrong. We had a small hiccup. Wilhelm was waiting for us, but we escaped due to some ingenuity from Lara and some pyrotechnics from Alrian, Celis said. Sounds like a disaster, Vincent said. Well, a partial disaster, but we all made it out, and Lara and Certain passed the test. I may have gotten a job and cleaned up, but I have not retrieved my scarf, Certain said. That is not an issue. You can get another if the monks find you worthy, Vincent said. That is true. I agree with your plan. I, I will join you, Certain said, bowing to Vincent. It wasn't a total loss, Lara said, retrieving something from her jacket. It was a massive, pristine diamond. Is that the replica, Celis said. No, nope, it's the real deal. I swapped them in the confusion. Wilhelm won't realize it until it is too late, Lara said. Give me that, Celis said, snatching it from Lara's hand. She looked it over carefully. You really did it. I underestimated you, Celis said. Alrin could see the begrudging look of admiration on his mother's face. Mission accomplished, then, Lara said with a laugh. Although on a more serious note, it was my honor to accompany the fabled Shadow Fox. Thankfully, we kept my record intact. Celis handed the diamond to Vincent. Incorporate this into Alrian's sword. He will need it the most. Good idea. I could lodge it into the pommel without too much effort, and it won't draw attention that way. People will just think it is an ornament, Vincent said, turning it over. Does that stone really work? Will it react to the blight? Alrian said. I'm sure you will have a chance to test it soon enough, Vincent said, putting the stone away. Those soldiers said they knew who you were. Lara said to Silas, they know my alias, not who I am. As long as we leave soon, there won't be a problem, Silas said. They will eventually track us here if we stay. But I agree we should be safe to sleep here tonight, Vincent said. Then let's make our preparations. Do they have rules against using the forges at night, Silas said. No, I'll get to work, Vincent said with a sigh. He walked over to the door and disappeared into the night. The rest of you get some rest. We leave tomorrow, Silas said. You coming too? Alrian said. Of course, I'm wanted, remember? Celis said. Alrian just shook his head. Who is she? He wondered to himself. The next morning, Alrian awoke to find everyone else ready and waiting. Sorry, were you all waiting for me? Alrian said. Yes, but don't feel bad. A wizard needs rest to replenish his energy, Vincent said. How would you know that? I may not be one, but I was the son of one. Now go get ready yourself. We need to leave as soon as possible, Vincent said. Alrian gathered his things and did a final check of the house. He noticed something sitting on a table near the front door and walked closer. That's for you, Vincent said, pride in his voice. Alrian saw that it was a sword in a leather scabbard with an ornate leather strap. The diamond was expertly attached to the pommel of the sword and looked like it was always meant to be there. Alrian slowly drew the sword out, the pale metal gently shining in the sunlight. He touched the edge and instantly recoiled his finger. That's sharp, Alrian said. 
What did you expect? Vincent said, chuckling. Alrian shook his hand, feeling foolish. It looks great. How did you finish it in time? He said, returning the sword. Finish them in time. Vincent turned to show Alrian the sword strapped to his back. I have a matching one, although with no giant diamond. I was a lot closer to completing them than I was letting on. I had originally wanted to take more time with the finishing, but I am happy with the result, he said. What about me? Lara said, sticking her empty hands out in front of her. I didn't forget. Lucky for you, there was some leftover metal. Use it wisely. Vincent tossed over a dagger within a plain leather scabbard. Lara pulled the dagger out and examined the edge. Looks really sharp. Is this the real deal? Of course, you'll be able to take down a shade with that, Vincent said. Good, that makes a girl feel more comfortable. Glad I could help. I just have to say, this is a crazy gift, Lara said. I know, forget about it and just use it well. You proved yourself. If we're all ready, we need to leave immediately. Celis tapped her foot impatiently. After you, Vincent said, and Celis stepped through the front door without hesitation. The rest followed close behind. Alrian paused to look back at the house. It already had a lot of memories for him, let alone his parents. He decided to return here one day when things were simpler. They walked with purpose towards the main gates. Can't we pass through the city and exit from the other end? Yes, but it's a smaller gate and it will be closely watched by the guards. This one may be as well, but we have a better chance of slipping through, Vincent said. I hadn't thought of that. Alrian felt a little silly for even asking. I was thinking we head straight to Vainbly, Salus said. Excellent idea, Vincent said. Is it close, Arian said. Yes, we can get there on foot within a few hours, then plan our next move. Hopefully there's also horses available to speed up our journey. It's a long walk, I wouldn't recommend it, Certain said. Arian gave him a smile. As they approached the main gates, Arian could see that the guards had been doubled. People were being stopped too and interrogated. Follow my lead. Salis quickly grabbed Lara and shoved her a few steps ahead. Stop! Thief! she shouted, pointing at Lara. The young thief was initially stunned, then quickly cottoned on. She took off, swiftly weaving into the crowd. The ruse worked. The patrolling guards quickly set off after Lara. Don't worry, they won't catch her, Salis said to Alrian. After a quick look around, she started walking forward once more. Alrian tried to keep an eye out for Lara to see how she fared. His mother was completely right. The guards were hampered by their armor and the crowds. Lara was nimble and crafty, changing direction and weaving through gaps in the crowd that were impossible for them to follow. But she didn't speed too far ahead, always pausing just enough for the guards to feel as if they were gaining. She's something else, Alrian said under his breath. Take care of that one, Vincent said, slapping his son on the shoulder. Alrian didn't realize his father had heard his comment and decided to focus on Lara's progress rather than continue the potentially awkward conversation. Lara laughed as she ran. It was good fun. She hadn't been chased like this in a while in an open street during the middle of the day. As she glanced back, she could see her group advancing carefully through the crowd, not garnering a second glance from any of the guards. Too easy. She looked ahead to plan out her escape from the city. She spotted a group of guards blocking the path. They must have heard the commotion and formed a mini blockade. No time to think, just react, Lara told herself. She spied one of the city banners hanging from the gates and instantly decided to go for it. Adjusting her direction, she instead headed for the walls of the gates. There were studs in the wall that were quite large, so she grabbed the first one within reach and started clambering up. The guards started to catch up as she ascended, and she could hear their shouts from below. Lara paused long enough to look back down and smirk at them, and decided that she was out of harm's way. Now she just had to exit. After a quick tug of the banner, she observed its strength and how it hung. It wasn't ideal, but she had no time. Here we go, she whispered, steadying herself, then leaping forward. She grabbed the cloth banner, using it to slow her descent. The force of her fall caused the banner to start detaching from the wall, and this gave her a nice arc through the air. Just before the banner was about to fall completely, she let go and toppled straight into one of the guards. Before they could react, she scrambled to her feet and darted away and into the crowd of onlookers beyond the city walls. The guard line crumbled and they took off after her, two of them staying behind and watching the pursuit. Now that she was beyond the walls, Lara increased her speed. 
There was less reason to keep them close, as her party would also be out soon. She needed to finish this chase, so she could disappear and rejoin the gang. One guard was particularly swift, and Lara noticed that he had ditched some of his armor to run faster. She wasn't worried about being caught, but if he was fit, he could keep within range for a long distance, which would be a problem. So she slowed a little and dropped a few glass balls onto the ground. The guard didn't notice, and when he stepped on one, completely lost his balance and toppled over. Lara laughed and increased her speed. She had to disappear quickly to make the most of the opening. 10. In the Shade of a Blaze Streams of travelers looked on in amusement as Lara ducked and weaved through them. She stayed low and fast, looking for a way to escape from the road and into cover. There was a small bunch of trees to her left, but she ignored them. It was too obvious. She needed something a bit better. A partially covered wagon caught her eye, and Lara headed straight for it. It was being pulled by a horse with a weary man urging the plodding horse onwards. Lara stayed low to avoid the man's line of sight and quietly vaulted into the wagon, ducking under the cloth covering. An overpowering smell of animal hides assaulted her nose, but it was worth it. She heard the rhythmic clank of the guard's remaining armor as he ran past. He didn't even pause for a moment. Gotcha, Lara whispered, a big smile on her face. As he ran in the wrong direction, she was slowly being taken back to the rest of the group. She waited a few minutes for safety, then peeked out of the wagon. There was no sign of the pursuing guard. Lara leapt out of the wagon and joined the stream of travelers, trying to blend in. She spotted Alrian in the distance, and slowly worked her way through to join him. Nice moves, Alrian said. They never had a chance, Lara flashed Alrian her biggest smile. We can take this path. It diverts around the city and passes through a few farming communities, Vincent said, and the rest followed his lead. You did well. Nice improvisation, too, Sailor said to Lara once they were off the main road. Thanks, although you didn't give me much warning. You didn't need it, and the stunned look on your face was perfect. I think you enjoyed that way too much, Lara said, and Sellers could not contain her laughter. It was certainly entertaining, but we've lost time. Let's push on. No breaks until we reach Vainbly, Vincent said. Nobody said another word. Lara kept an eye on the countryside, interested in the new environment. She had never traveled this way before. She mostly kept to the bigger cities and the ways to get in and out unseen. They passed through several small farming communities. Each one was a small cluster of farms and houses, with vast tracts between them. But the road persisted. This road seems out of place in such a quiet and rural place, Alrian said. They still need to access the cities and sell their goods. In fact, my first commission as a blacksmith was for farms just like these, Vincent said. Really? What was it? Horseshoes. Quite tricky, actually. But it brings back fond memories. Must have been a fun time, Alrian said. Vincent didn't comment further, and Alrian returned to gazing at the landscape. Lara did the same. Vainbly came up sooner than she expected. In between some snacks, the rolling countryside looked so familiar that she was almost entranced by the trip. The town was rather unassuming, with a small river running out in front. It crossed a petite stone bridge to enter the town. There should be a decent inn here, although it's been a while, I have no idea if it's still open, Vincent said. What was it called again? The Frisky Farmer, Silas said. Something like that. Looks like it's still here, Laura said, pointing to a distant building. Right in the center of the town was a large structure with a peaked roof and large wooden doors. A simple sign hung above the entrance. Let's get inside and have a decent meal, Vincent said. Laura glanced around as they walked through vainly. It looked like a fairly quiet town without much going on but she could see the evidence of trade from Brankter. There was a bustle and clinking of coins that betrayed the simple setting. The smell of ale smacked them in the face as they entered the inn. The hall was full of patrons, each with a beer or two. It looks like a whole town in here, Lara said. Are you all right? She said to Certain. He nodded without replying, but he was visibly affected. Once she had mentioned it, the others seemed to cotton on as well. I'm sorry, you just sobered up and the first place we took you was an inn. Do you want us to go somewhere else? Alrian said. Thank you for your concern. It's more of a physical reaction right now, which I can manage. Despite the unpleasantness, I'm finding value in it as a type of penance. Certain looked uncomfortable but resolute. Wow, that's harsh, Laura said. 
I'll inquire about rooms. Try and find a table, Vincent said. Clara disappeared into the crowd, reappearing at a far corner of the hall and waving. Sella spotted the wave and directed the rest over. They managed to squeeze into a tiny table, knocking elbows. It'll be a brawl just trying to eat anything, Sela said. If this lot can handle it, we should be able to, Lara said, gesturing at the crowd. They were predominantly men and of large builds. Must all be laborers from the area, Alrion said. Or oh, travelers? I'd say this is the first stop out of Brankter for many, depending on our destination. Do you think they will look for us here? Certain said. They may do, but I doubt the guard has the resources to venture outside the city. As long as we don't hang around longer than a night, I don't see any danger, Silas said. There'll be danger regardless, Certain said, looking around the room. He seemed quite distracted. A slim woman deftly weaved through the tables and dropped down an armful of ales. To her credit, very little sloshed out and onto the table. We didn't order these, Silas said. The man up there did. This is the only drink we have available. Food is on the way, but there's a delay in the kitchen, the dark-haired woman said. Before they could be any further questioning, she disappeared into the crowd. Salas looked over and saw Vincent waving at her in the distance. Fine, she muttered, and pulled one of the ales closer. Alrian followed suit, and Certain, who found a spot on the ceiling to examine in detail instead. Don't worry, I'm with you, Lara said, pushing aside the ale. We have rooms for the night and dinner as well. Lucky that we found a table. This is the busiest time of the day. It should be much quieter in the evening, Vincent said, squeezing in next to his wife. She passed over his ale and he drank deep. Sounds good to me. What do we do in the meantime, Alrian said. We need to source some horses. Any volunteers? I'll do it, Laura said. Great. Sailors and I will scout around the town and make sure there's no unwanted attention from Brankter. Alrin, did you want to come with us? Vincent said. No, I, I think I'll do some training. I have a few things to look into as well, he said. Laura saw the excited glimmer in his eye. He's up to something. I wonder what. How about you hang around here too, Certain? Although our rooms may be more comfortable, Vincent said. I will remain to assist Alrian. Certain paused long enough to give direct eye contact to Vincent, then turned his attention elsewhere. After a brief meal of meat and potatoes, the group went their separate ways. Alrian and Certain walked upstairs to find the rooms. Certain settled into a corner and meditated, while Alrian retrieved his spellbook. He leafed through the pages quickly, hoping to not find his recently discovered spell for amplifying his voice. His excitement grew as he reached the end of the book and didn't find it. He combed through once more, paying special attention to the pages that might contain a mention of it there was not a single reference to be found. According to what Falric said, I should be able to read the spells that I am capable of using. And if I used it, and it's not in the book, that means either I created it, or I just know it now. It seemed unlikely that he had created such an obvious spell, which meant he had probably absorbed it from the pool of knowledge. He was buzzing with excitement. I wonder what else I can do, Alrian whispered. He leafed through the spellbook again, but this time with a different purpose. Instead of a specific spell, he wanted information on how to increase his strength and capacity. The knowledge I have gained must work in a similar way to the books. The more capable I am, the more spells I can unlock for my use. I just need to keep pushing my strength and try new spells, Alrian said quietly to himself. It was important to find a focus for himself. His current goal was so far away, some strange test in a distant land. On the way, he had to improve his skill. His encounter with Branthor was a lucky escape. Next time, he didn't want to rely on luck. He looked over at Certain, but the monk didn't react. He must be busy. I'll push on, Alrian thought. After an afternoon consulting the book, Aldrian didn't have many more answers, but he had consolidated some of his learning and was excited about his new focus. His plan now meant finding opportunities to use his magic as much as possible. You're still up here? Lara said as she entered the room. Aldrian put away the book. Yes, is it late? Yes, the sun is already set. We're about to have dinner. Come down, Lara said. Aldrian was confused. He hadn't noticed it getting dark. He looked again and saw that he had cast a light spell and hovered a sphere of light above his shoulder. Unlike his previous attempts, this one didn't emit any heat, just light. He waved it away and rushed off to join Laura. Certain, come down where you're ready. You need to eat some at some stage, Alrian shouted. 
You're just in time, Vincent said as Alrian arrived downstairs. Of, Alrian began to say, but was cut off by a loud groan. He spun quickly and noticed the main doors of the inn slowly bending over. Suddenly they splintered into large chunks and a massive shape occupied the doorway. Alrian knew what it was instantly. He looked over at his father. Yes, I know what it is. Laura, can you fetch the swords? Vincent said calmly without taking his eyes off the creature. Is that a shade? Laura said. Yes, Vincent said. On my way, Laura turned and sprinted off. My body is my weapon. I will engage the creature while you wait for yours. Certain said, rising gracefully from his seat. There was an intensity to the look in his eyes. The shade stepped forward and grabbed a nearby patron who hadn't had time to flee. The rest had retreated to the bar and hidden behind it. The poor man screamed in terror, but Certain didn't hesitate. He dashed ahead, engaging the shade head on. Shade threw the limp body it was holding at Certain, who adjusted his stance to duck underneath. He didn't just dodge, though. He caught the body and carefully set it down on the ground behind him. The shade was enraged, lashing out at Certain. He blocked the attack with his arms and slid under to continue his approach. The shade moved to strike him again, but Certain was too fast. He landed a strong blow on the creature's side, knocking it back. It's tough, Certain said. Incredibly tough. It's why we need these, Vincent said. Laura had returned with the two blades. The diamond on the end of Alrian's sword glowed furiously. I'd say it works, Alrian said, accepting the sword from Laura and looking it over. Then he set it aside. Before his father could say anything, Alrian launched into an attack. Last time he had been on the sidelines, but this time he could prove how much he had grown since then. He led with a wave of force, which rocked the shade slightly. Be careful, it looks like the same one. It remembers our last fight, Vincent shouted. Alrian heard, but did not respond. He was completely focused. Fire didn't do much, but maybe it was the intensity. I'll overload it. He drew on his spark and started building for a fire-based attack. But this time, rather than just let it loose, he tried compacting it. He launched a miniature ball of flame. It was so hot that it started to ignite the air that it passed through. The shade didn't even try to block the attack, which hit right in the middle of the chest. Damn, I missed, Alrian whispered. Before he could initiate another attack, he saw that his previous one was behaving strangely. Rather than just exploding on the surface of the shade's skin, it was still continuing. It's burning right through, Vincent said. The shade seemed to notice too, trying to shake off the ball of intense heat that was slowly passing through its body. But once it realized the attack was not fatal, it stopped and focused its attention back on Alrian. I have to get the upper hand so we can finish it. His force attack had been quite powerful, but hadn't done that much to the creature. He decided that he could overcome that with sheer quantity. He concentrated and drew up several strands of force. Alrian unleashed them in a barrage, trying to hit the same target area with each strike. He could see the attacks landing, each one having a minimal effect on the shade. But it did seem like something was happening. Laura noticed the attack and pulled out her new dagger. This will do the trick, she said, and hurled the dagger at the shade. Despite the movement of the shade and the multiple attacks from Alrian, the dagger flew true and pierced the shade in the chest right where the heart was. The monster staggered back, not expecting the attack and furiously grasping for the dagger. However, Certain was faster, darting in amongst the confusion and striking the dagger with his open palm, forcing it in up to the hilt. The shade stumbled back and fell against the bar. As it came to rest, its skin started to change, undoing its transformation. The black surface was crumbling away, revealing pale skin underneath. Alrian looked on in wonder. Lara retrieved her dagger, wiped it quickly, and stashed it away. Never forget that this was once a person, even if they are beyond help now, Vincent said, walking closer and sheathing his sword. I don't want to alarm anyone, but I think we have a bigger problem here, Silas said, pointing at the bar. Aurion's concentrated flame ball had passed through the body of the shade and was about to hit the kegs behind the bar. 11. Alternate Paths Everyone out, Vincent shouted, pointing at the door and making his way there. The group scrambled out as fast as possible. I can probably stop it, Alrian said. No time, and too risky, Vincent said, grabbing Alrian's arm. A whoosh sound and a forceful shock wave buffeted them, and as they looked back at the inn, they could see it was being consumed with flames. I wonder, Alrian thought. 
He watched the flames with interest. If he could create flames and issue them from himself, maybe he could bring them back. Let's try this, Alrian whispered. He reached out with his hand, trying a reverse of his previous spell. It was a twist on the fireballs. Instead, he was drawing the flame back to him, trying to build it into another ball. He visualized the ball of flame hovering above his hand and containing all the flames and fire that had overtaken the inn. He could feel the heat and power concentrated in a single spot. Alrian opened his eyes and looked. The spell had worked. What are you planning to do with that? Vincent said, looking over at Alrian. There was a curious concern in his features. Extinguish it, Alrian said. But what he really wanted to try was to integrate the flames and the power. What if the spark was more than just a concept? Maybe it was more literal than that. He tried feeding the flames into himself, trying to absorb their essence. He could feel himself heating up and fireball shrinking. Stop it! That's not safe! Dump it! Vincent shouted. Aurin couldn't understand the concern, then looked at where Vincent was pointing. His arm was glowing bright red and looked wrong. Aurin panicked and looked around, finding a patch of dirt next to the inn. He funneled all the flames into it without any finesse. The ball of flames streamed over and collected within the dirt, extinguishing but not without displacing quite a bit of dirt. Aurian sank down to his knees. What were you thinking? Vincent said. Aurian looked around and the whole group were looking at him with concern. That's my line. Do you have an answer? Selah said. I was just trying something out. I saved the inn, didn't I? Aurian said. This isn't a game. You shouldn't take risks like that, Selah said. Your mother's right. The situation was contained. You didn't need to do more, Vincent said. Yes, I did. I have to grow and learn an incredible amount in a short time, and there's nobody around to teach me. So I will take every opportunity to do that, Aurian said. Vincent sighed and walked into the inn. Sailors followed after him. Laura walked over to Aurian. See, I'm right. You should listen to me more and not take as many risks, she said, hoping to get a smile from Aurian. When she didn't, she tried a different angle. They're just worried. Don't take it to heart. I know, but there's this incredible pressure on me, and I have to do it. I can't let everyone down. Alrian felt older, like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. You have help, so don't forget that, Certain said. Yeah, look at the monk. He did the killing blow on that shade. Now that's team effort, Laura said. Well, you're right about that. Let's take a closer look at it, Alrian said. Laura helped him up, and they walked over to look at the body of the former shade. At least it works. But look here, mine isn't the only wound in the heart, Laura said. We encountered a shade earlier, and it took a dagger in the heart and was knocked overboard. This must be the same one. I wondered how it tracked us here, Alrian said. Overboard? Yes, we fought it on the ferry, Alrian said. Wow. Laura wiped the dagger she had pulled out earlier on her clothing and hid it once more. Certain was kneeling over the body. I haven't seen one of these up close. It looks like the body has completely reverted to a normal state. What a strange process, he said. I don't understand it myself. But this is what happens to people who have an advanced state from the blight, Alrian said. We worn out our welcome, Vincent said, tossing a bag at Alrian. Time to leave. We will camp outside the town. At least we have horses now, Salus said, joining them. It looks like the same shade that attacked us on the ferry, Alrian said to his father as they walked over to the stables. I know, I recognized it instantly. How? Alrian couldn't contain his surprise. Since when was his father an expert on shades? I've seen a few in my day. They tend to closely resemble the person they originally were. It's plain as day if you look closely. I'll remember for next time. I'd like to say there won't be a next time, but that would be a lie. We need to divert from the main path. I'm not sure what tipped them off, but they tracked us too easily. I'll think it over tonight, Vincent said. They entered the stables and only the horses greeted them. Where is everyone? Laura said. Evacuated. They don't feel safe now. I can't blame them, Vincent said. I know the feeling, Laura said. The group saddled up and rode out of town. Alrian could sense eyes watching them and hoped it was just scared townsfolk and not more creatures of the blight. After a short ride, they took a minor dirt track and left the main road. Can you give me a light? Vincent asked, and Alrian paused for a moment. 
After a minute, a small orb of light danced above Vincent's shoulder. Thanks, Vincent said and continued writing. I wouldn't have tried that if he hadn't asked. Good to know, Aurion said to himself. The group rode on in silence until they came to a small clearing. We will set up camp here. Aurion, help me with the horses, Vincent said. Aurion nodded and helped guide the horses to a nearby spot and tie them up. He was about to head back when he noticed his father's eyes looking directly at him. What happened back there, Vincent said. What do you mean? Is something happening with you? I've never seen you act so recklessly. Your mother is worried. Vincent looked worried too, although he didn't mention it. I almost died when I fought Branthor. It was only through luck and sheer determination that I caught him off guard. But I can't let that happen again. There's too much at stake and... And? There seemed to be stuff spilling over from when I drank from the pool. Knowledge of spells, intuition on how to combine things. I can't discern what is something that should work and what is some crazy idea of mine. Or even things that should work but I can't do yet, Arian said. Vincent looked at him thoughtfully. I hadn't thought of that. I guess I need to find out more about how this all works. You're right, though. You don't have the luxury of time to slowly learn all you need. Just make sure you rely on the rest of us to help. It's not a criticism of you. It's just a safety net. All right, I agree. I'll let everyone help and try not to do too many crazy things. Alrin wasn't sure how long that would last. Good. I feel better now. I thought it was Mom that was the worrier. Alrian knew his father had been worried, too. It is, Vincent said and walked back to the camp. Vincent and Surgeon took turns taking watch, but the night passed without incident. The next morning they snacked on some bread and Vincent addressed the group. I've been doing some thinking, and I have a plan for how we move forward. We're all ears, Lara said. We need to split up. I'm confident that you and Surgeon can support Alrian. Silas and I will go a different route. Why, Alrian said. We know we are being tracked, so it's better to split up and divert their attention. Silas and I can go back to the main road and continue on to Plinth. It's a massive town, and we can do some digging into who and what are following. With any luck, we will draw them in, Vincent said, tossing a lump of hard bread into the dying embers of the fire. So where do we go, Alrian said. There is another path and a longer route. You can follow it and stay off the beaten track. It will cost you time, but it will be safer, and you will have the necessary seclusions to work on your spells, Vincent said. We'll be crossing the river, Certain said. Yes, exactly. It's a well-known detour, but the best plan given the circumstances. Where will we meet you, Certain said. You can find us at Plinth. By the time you arrive, we would ideally have taken care of our pursuers. Then we will set off together for the desert. If we miss there, we can agree to meet at the desert entry. We will find you, Vincent said. That would work, Certain said. There is a single desert entry? Won't that be obvious? There are many, but only one will take us where we need to go, and it is not well known. I have discussed this with your father, Certain said. If you say so, when do we part ways, Aurion said. As soon as we pack up, Vincent said. Aurion nodded, a bit surprised, even though he understood the reasoning. They packed up in silence. Aurion double-checking, he had everything with particular care. Once he was prepared, he walked over to the horses. Vincent was standing there talking to Celis. While well, you two make sure you take care of yourselves, Aurion said as he approached. Will do, boss, Vincent said, winking. You'll do well, Celis said, giving Aurion a hug. Isn't it fun? All of us on adventure together, she said, gesturing at the group. It would be more fun without a shade crashing the party, Vincent said. He doesn't mean that, Celis said, speaking behind her hand and pretending to whisper. How will we find you in Plinth, Aurion said. Don't worry, we will find you, Celis said. All right, I guess this is it then. See you soon, Aurion said, giving them a wave. He mounted his horse and rode back towards the camp. As he turned, he saw his parents mounting up and preparing to ride in the opposite direction. Impulsively, he drew on his spark and prepared a spell. He shot a flash of fire through the air, arcing high over the trees and vanishing in the distance in the direction that Vincent and Celis would be heading. We've got our marching orders, Vincent said to Celis with a chuckle, and the two of them started to ride away. Are we doing the right thing, Celis said. Of course. He needs room to grow, and we can help from afar. 
Vincent needed to be strong to make sure his wife didn't worry. As long as you're convinced, it's hard for me to let go. I know, Vincent said, giving Celis a kiss. Let's get moving. The faster we get there, the more we can do, Vincent said. I'll race you, Celis said, spurring her horse on and laughing. Alrian saw his parents disappear into the distance and turned back to face Lara and Certain. Should we head out? Certain said. Definitely. Are you familiar with the route? Alrian said. Yes, I have traveled through here before. We should hurry up and try to cross the bridge as soon as possible. Once we cross the river, it will be harder to track us. Let's go then, Alrian said, letting Certain take the lead. Lara rode alongside him, but looking straight ahead. Alrian thought about his companions. Would certain skill strength and familiarity of the territory, and Laura's instinct and adaptability he had nothing to worry about. Together they had taken down the shade that had eluded them with Falric's aid. Why am I so worried then? Alrian asked himself as they rode. He couldn't shake the feeling that they were not out of the woods yet. Twelve. The Quiet Road. The way back was quick and simple, and Alrian didn't spot a single person. They were able to move onto the secondary path without fear of being watched. So now this is uncharted territory, Alrian said half to himself. For you, perhaps, but we are far from safe. This is still a well-traveled alternate route. Many do not continue the way we are going, so the further we travel, the safer it will be. But I again suggest we make haste, Certain said. Agreed. While we ride, though, I had a question, Aurion said. Yes, please ask. Certain slowed so that they were closer together. It's for both of you. Until recently, I had never encountered the Blight. Blighters and shades are new to me. But what about you? I feel like I've been quite sheltered, Aurion said. You may have been, but don't feel dismayed. It's a good problem to have. I am lucky in that my exposure has been quite limited. The areas where I have lived, and especially with the monks, have been unpopular places for creatures of the Blight. A few people or much food or water, Certain said. Do they still function like a person? Aurion said. In terms of having to eat and drink, yes, but their minds are warped. They also seem to have some sort of communal connection. You don't see them attempting speech much, yet they seem to be able to coordinate. What about you, Lara? Aurion said. My whole life they have been present. I hate them with a passion but I've enjoyed the relatives safely of Avaria these last few years. I think they've only recently infiltrated this place in any numbers, and I'm sorry to say that's largely because of you. Lara pointed directly at Aurion. Sorry, Aurion said. Don't be sorry. They fear what can destroy them. Exactly. You have the knowledge now deep within you. You must unlock it and set things right, Certain said. You make it sound so easy, Aurion said trying to lighten the mood. He did get a laugh from them both. He kept an eye on the scenery as they went by, and it looked like another relatively deserted area. Alrian looked for signs of people passing through and didn't see any. The path seemed undisturbed, and they didn't see anyone in either direction. I thought you said this was a well-known route, albeit longer and more secluded, Alrian said to Certain. It is? Then why is it so quiet? There's no sign of any activity, Alrian said. That's a good point. I admit I haven't traveled through here recently. Perhaps things have changed. Are you familiar, Lara? No, I haven't been this way, Lara said. Alrian spotted a clearing coming up off the right of the path and diverted his horse. Come here for a moment, Alrian said. The others followed, Lara giving Certain a confused look. Certain didn't have an explanation. Shouldn't there be signs of people camping here? Alrian said. It is not that far from Branktor. Maybe it's not a popular spot, Lara said. Not that far? Anyway, since we are here, I need a break, and I want to try something. Alrian dismounted and tied up his horse to a tree. Certain and Lara followed. So we lucked out a bit last time, but then I did almost burn down an inn. If we encounter another shade, what's the plan? Alrian said. My attacks seem mostly ineffective. I think their skin is too protected, Certain said. Do you have any attacks that penetrate? I think that underneath they're still vulnerable. And their heart seems to be the weak spot, Alrian said. I do have something, but it requires focus and attention. Hard to use in the middle of a fight, Certain said. But what if we bought you time, Lara said. Possibly. I, I need to be in close proximity, too. Certain had a thoughtful expression on his face. 
That's fine. I, I don't currently have an effective way of defeating them with my magic. I can only assist. Laura and I have the right weapons to pierce the Shade's skin, but the amount of force required is quite substantial, and it's not always reliable. So maybe we can try your attack next, Arian said. It's worth a try. Uh, what are you proposing? See that tree over there? It looks pretty sturdy. Let's try a coordinated attack. Laura and I will provide an initial attack to distract and wear it down, and you can come in with a big finish. Sure, I'll signal when I'm ready. Certain sat on the ground, legs crossed, and began to meditate. Do what you do. Pretend it's a shade, Aurion said to Laura. After you, Laura said. Aurion stepped to the side and began to prepare a barrage of spells. His best success was the force-based waves, and he decided to try a variation of that. He wove a pattern of intertwined waves, all hitting the similar zone, but at various times and from different directions and angles. He kept the intensity a little lower, just in case the tree wasn't as sturdy as it looked. Once Laura could see the tree begin to be hammered by invisible force, she started running in an arc towards it. She opened with an array of tiny daggers hurled with precision. Thud, 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 thud. They impacted with the tree in a neat line. Alrin adjusted his spells to avoid the areas where the daggers were implanted. He glanced over at Certain and saw no change. Laura darted back and began another run, approaching from another direction. She produced more daggers and they hit one by one neatly underneath the first row. Alrin watched her throw the last one and try to catch it with a wave of force and push it even harder. The dagger wobbled slightly but stayed on track, only this time disappearing completely into the tree trunk. Ready, Certain said. Laura tossed a small vial at the tree, and it smashed against the trunk, letting out a cloud of smoke. Certain stood and ran towards the tree, keeping his right hand above his hip. Once he reached the tree, he raised his hand and held it just above the surface of the trunk. He unleashed all the internal force he had accumulated all at once. Alrian heard the almost deafening blast and ceased his attacks. Certain remained in place, sinking to a crouched position. Laura stood down, returning to Alrian's side. Once the smoke cleared, Laura gasped. Wow, she whispered. That's quite effective, Alrian said. Only the stump of the tree could be seen. And what was remaining looked to having cleanly sliced in an arc. There were tiny fragments of splintered wood floating through the air. Perhaps I overdid it, but we needed to be sure. Certain stood with difficulty and walked over to join Alrian. I feel bad for that tree, Alrian said. It was a necessary act so that more good can be done. The tree knows that, Certain said. If you say so, how long does it take you to recover from that? Laura said. Completely? A day. I can be effective again within a few minutes, but any additional attacks will be less powerful. So just don't miss then, Laura said. Of course, Certain said. I'm happy with this. If for some reason the Shade survives that attack, we should be able to disable it or finish it off. I like the smoke screen. Nice touch, Alrian said. Well, he did say he had to be very close. That's a vulnerable place to be. So why not mask his approach as much as possible, Lara said. I hope you have more of those. Quite useful, Certain said. I do. I can make them. The ingredients are a little hard to get hold of, but I have my sources. Lara tapped her nose and looked around innocently. I bet you do, Alrian said, laughing. They took a short meal break before heading out once more. As they rode, Alrian steered his horse over to join Certain. I was curious about the power you have. Where is it from? Alrian said. It is the power of the body. You all have it, but do not use it. It takes both physical and mental training to master it, Certain said. So there's no reason I couldn't do that? Alrian said. Theoretically, but I am not one of the four masters, so I don't know all the secrets. I suspect, however, that your other power would make this task difficult, as you would need to essentially not use it at all. That makes sense. So anybody could do that with the right training, or the right situation, not as effectively or as controlled. There is a story shared with us about a young mother whose son had been trapped under a fallen tree. There is nobody to help, and there are wolves circling them. What does she do? Destroy the tree or prop it up with something else and get the boy out, Laura said. Impossible without the right tools or training, and there is no time for planning and execution. So what she does is lift the tree and push it aside, and then carry her son home. But how does she do it? 
I don't know, Aurion said. Because her need is so strong, her body can perform the impossible. She does not know how it was done and could not do it again when asked. But because it is her only choice, she can do it. So it is with this. We train our bodies and acquire the knowledge of how they work, but we unlock the power with our minds. We use our wills, Certain said. You use your will to unlock the power in your body and direct it as you see fit, Alrian said. Exactly. Only the four masters have ascended to the heights of control and passed the final test. It is known as the Vault of Silence. Vault of Silence? You mentioned it before. Is that what I described in my dream? I believe so. If they allow you to undertake that test, then you can achieve the same mastery, perhaps. But I do not know all the details. That is one reason it is known as such, Certain said. The silence part is also keeping the trial secret, huh? Laura said. Exactly. I believe that the information shared about it is only to give the monks something to strive for. Sounds daunting, Alrian said. It should be. Much of what we do is masked in secrecy, and I'm not sure how far down the path I was. But I don't think I was anywhere near ready for that trial. Certain had a downcast look again. And you just obliterated that tree with the instruction from your mind? That paints quite a picture, Alrian said. Those words hung in silence, and Alrian let his horse fall back in pace to be beside Lara. You'll be fine. Don't forget you have us, she said. I won't. It's just such a huge mountain to climb. Anyway, that's a future problem. Let's just enjoy the ride, Alrian said. The road started to incline upwards, slowly but surely. As they continued, they started to see glimpses of the river. It was larger than Alrian expected and seemed to move with speed. The bridge is up ahead, Certain said. As Alrian caught up, he finally saw it. Built with wood, the bridge was not as impressive as Alrian expected. The main surface was a plain walkway, but it looked sturdy and was secured on each end by large columns and decorated elements. What really caught his attention, however, was a single shape in the distance. It looked like a man standing in the middle of the bridge. We have company, Lara said. Who is it? Arian said. I don't mean to alarm anyone, but I think it's a case of what, not who, Lara said. A shade? Likely, Certain said. See what your sword says, Lara said. Arian pulled out his sword and examined the stone on the pommel. It was a light glow, but matched the color exactly from when they last encountered a shade. So it is, Arian said, tensing up without even realizing. He dismounted and tied up his horse, signaling to the others to do the same. Thirteen. An Old Friend they approached the shade carefully on foot, watching its movements. I don't like it. It's just waiting for us, Lara said. Something definitely seems different, Certain said. You're probably right, but we need to take the advantage. We are prepared. Let's see if we can take it down before anything bad happens, Alrian said. Did you want to take the bridge out? Lara said. No, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder for this thing. We finish it now. Alrian needed to do this right. He couldn't stand having another shade hunting him down. For his peace of mind, he had to see it destroyed. Fine by me. I will wait on the edge of the bridge and begin my preparation. Be careful of the tight quarters. Certain knelt down before the bridge and started to meditate. It's still just standing there, Lara said. I know, but let's open the attack. We don't want Certain charging in without cover, Alrian said. Lara nodded and pulled out a handful of daggers. Go! Aurion whispered and started preparing his spells. As Lara threw her first salvo of daggers, Aurion hurled his force spells, focusing on the legs. He wanted to make the shade unsteady on the bridge. Lara's daggers bounced harmlessly off the shade, and it remained motionless. Aurion's spells also had no effect. My throwing daggers didn't work. I'll need some assistance, Lara said. Sure. Aurion couldn't understand why his other attacks had just failed to do anything, but he didn't have time to ponder over it. He instead changed his focus to supercharging the speed of Lara's daggers. They flew faster and harder directly at the Shade, who was still motionless. Three daggers dug into the Shade's torso with the additional force provided by Alrian. But again, the Shade didn't react. I don't like this, Lara said. I know, but certain we'll be ready soon, Alrian said. 
Here we go again, Lara said, and prepared another round of daggers. Alrin prepared his spells and watched them fly, throwing twice as much force behind them. He was finding it easier to spot and catch the daggers with his force waves. The shade made no attempt to dodge, and the daggers made a neat row just below the first three. Ready, Certain said, and Lara stepped forward to lob a crystal vial through the air. It smashed right before the shade, throwing up a smoke screen. Certain rose swiftly and moved with incredible speed, as if he was flying along the ground. He disappeared into the smoke, and Alrian heard the impact of Certain's attack. It connected, Lara said. Definitely, I hope that did it. Alrian found the smoke screen a hindrance, unsure of what happened. He started to walk closer, and Lara joined him. As the smoke cleared, they saw Certain kneeling before the shade. It had been knocked back, but otherwise appeared unharmed. What? That can't be, Lara said. I felt something strange happen. I, I can't describe it, though, Alrian said. Suddenly, the shade reached out and grabbed Certain, drawing him close. Certain cried out in pain as the shade spun him around and seemed to dig its fingers in. We meet again, Certain shouted in harsh and disjointed words. What are you saying? Alrian continued approaching his friend. You left me for dead, Certain said. Alrian stopped dead in his tracks. What is it? Lara said. No, it can't be, Alrian said. Yes, this is what happens when you turn a wizard further, Certain said. What is he talking about, Lara said. Alrian looked closer at the face of the shade and saw the confirmation he was after. This shade is Pranthor. He's become something else. I don't know how, but he survived and he morphed into some sort of monster. That's why none of our attacks worked on him, Alrian said. No, Lara said, shocked. I did not expect this. It is new, but I will conquer this form, Certain said. The pauses in between words had reduced, but it seemed hard for him to communicate. What do we do? Do we need to rescue Certain? Lara said. Let's see if we can just release him first. Then together we can come up with something. I get the feeling that it's not completely in control, so we may have an opportunity, Arian said. How do we do that? Let's just grab him. I'll use my sword to sever the hand holding Certain back, Arian said. Good, I'll come with you. I'll try and distract it, Lara said. The two of them carefully advanced, step by step. There was no further communication from the Shade via Certain. What do you want? Alrian said. You know you can still join me, Certain said. Why would he join a freak like you? You're an absolute monster. All you deserve is a sword through your heart, Lara said to Branthor, lacing the words with as much spite and disdain as she could muster. Certain and Branthor pivoted to look at Lara. Branthor's face still seemed straight and emotionless, but Lara thought she could see the anger within it. Alrian took the opportunity to draw his sword and empower his swing with additional speed and force. Before Branthor could react, Alrian sliced through the shade's hand, freeing Certain. Lara reached out and grabbed Certain, dragging him away. Branthor let out an unearthly scream that seemed to come from the depths of the ground. Alrian helped Lara drag Certain back to safety. He looked back as they ran, and Branthor was motionless but still screaming. Then there was silence. Lara and Certain collapsed just past the bridge, and Alrian stopped to look back. There was no movement. Then Branthor rose. He lashed out with his arms, the bridge starting to disintegrate around him. Branthor reached out, but there was nothing to hold on to, and he fell into the river. Alrian leaned over, trying to see where Branthor had ended up, but there was no sign of the shade. The river carried on as if nothing had happened. Thank you for the rescue. Certain seemed to have recovered his senses. Are you all right? Alian said. I believe so. Felt like a puppet at the hands of a child. Certain had a distasteful look on his face. He does not seem in full control of his new form. I can believe that, but he seemed almost indestructible, Lara said. He might be. My spells had no effect. Whatever he is, he is more than a normal shade. 
And what he just did then? I don't think that was a physical attack. I think he accessed some of his spark, Aurion said. An almost invulnerable monster with magical powers? Now that's a disaster, Lara said. He may never regain control. We don't know, Certain said. Regardless, we need to be ready next time we encounter him. We can't always rely on him destroying a bridge and floating away, Aurion said. How do you think he found us, Lara said. It has to be deduction. He sent the Shade to confront us at Vainbly and came here himself. It is the main alternate route, isn't it? Lara said. That would mean he either knows where we are headed, is coordinating his attacks, or maybe even both, Aurion said. He drank from the pool of knowledge too, didn't he? Lara said. Yes, even before I did. Then he may have all the same information. Maybe he also had the vision about the monks. If he did, we are in grave danger. We must get there before he has a chance, Certain said. Was it absolutely critical that we cross the bridge? Aurion said, looking out. The bridge was completely destroyed, with only remnants hanging from either side. It is ideal. Let's find a way down there and see if there's another way to cross. Certain stood up by himself and tested his legs. Everything okay there? Lara said. Yes, I'll be fine. Need to stick to normal activity levels for the next day, though, Certain said. Can't promise anything, Aurion said, trying to make a joke out of it. Certain looked at him and didn't react. Let's try over there, Lara said, pointing at a mostly overgrown track. She took the lead and the others followed. There's no way we can get the horses down here, Aurion said. We'll have to leave them. I'll just untie them so they can go forge, Lara said. As she darted off, Aurion inspected the track closer. It appeared to be an old path that was overgrown and worn down by the elements and time. Looks like it hadn't been used in a long time, Certain said. No need with the bridge, Lara said, returning. I'll miss those horses. We made great time, Aurion said, looking back, trying to catch a glimpse of them. They will survive. To be honest, I am more comfortable on my own feet. Others will be along and find them soon enough, Certain said, starting on the path and stepping over a slippery stone. The group had to walk slowly and carefully, as the path was quite steep and the growth had to be continually pushed back just to make progress. Aurion almost tripped and lost his balance several times, but he held on and hoped that his friends didn't notice. After an hour, they had managed to find their way down to the bank of the river. It looks quite swift, but I can't offer much wisdom here. I grew up in and around the desert, Certain said. I'll take this one, don't worry. Lara started to wade into the river, one step at a time. After a few steps, she wobbled and quickly regained her balance. Heading straight back, she kicked her legs out to try and shake off some of the excess water. What do you think? Aurion said. Too dangerous to cross safely, although we could manage it. But I have a better idea. Lara had a wicked smile which was slowly breaking out. Why does that make me nervous? Aurion said. No reason. You're the one that takes all the foolish risks around here, Lara started looking around. She's right, you know, Certain said. Fine. What is it, Aurea said. Why fight the river when we can use it to our advantage? Go with the flow, as it were, Lara said. If you're thinking what I think you are, Certain is going to be more nervous than with the horses, Aurea said. Fourteen. Going with the flow. Lara inspected some of the plants by the shore. She selected a few samples and sliced the long tendrils with her dagger. This will work for a short-term solution, she said. We're going to build a boat of some kind, Aurion said. More like a raft. There's plenty of trees around, and you and Certain are handy at knocking them around. For now, he can do the knocking, Certain said. The monk didn't even look up when speaking. He was so focused on his recovery. I'm on it, Aurion said. Lara watched him concentrate, a comical expression on his face. She suppressed a laughter and watched carefully. After a pause, she heard a noise nearby and watched a branch fall to the ground. Alrian ran over and inspected the fallen limb, unbridled glee in his steps. Lara joined him and looked for herself. The cut was precise and perfect. You could be in for a new career as a carpenter, she said. I don't think my father would approve. I guess he would rather you be a blacksmith. With the right care and focus, I could probably work the metal with spells instead, but I think the time for that has passed. Alrian broke eye contact with her. You never know, Lara said, trying to keep things light. Under her direction, Alrian cut down the nearest tree and cut the trunk and branches to her specifications. 
Lara prepared the ropes by binding together the strands from the plants. Certain joined them at this point and lashed the logs together under Lara's watchful eye. It took longer than she had expected, but Lara stepped back and saw what looked like a serviceable raft. Not my finest work, but it should float, she said. Are you sure? Certain said. Of course. Let's go test it. Lara identified an appropriate spot on the bank and pointed it out. The three of them pushed it into the water, and Lara waded in further. While Certain and Alrian steadied it, she climbed on. Watch this. Lara jumped up and down on the raft. It rocked a little and took on some water, but kept its buoyancy. I'm satisfied. Please don't do that again, Certain said. Alrian couldn't help laughing. He climbed on next and helped Certain on board. Can you shove us off? Laura said to Alrian. He held on tightly to the raft and leaned into it. The raft lurched away, almost flipping over. But Certain and Laura were able to scramble and balance it out. Then the raft was caught in the river's flow. And now we wait, Laura said, sitting back and looking very satisfied with herself. The countryside was going past at a reasonable rate. I must say I'm impressed. We seem to be going quite quickly. Is this a more direct route? Alrian said. I believe so. What do you think, Certain? Laura said. Probably. The benefit is also that we will continue overnight. Perhaps we should take turns sleeping, he said. <laughs> Definitely. This isn't exactly the safest vessel, Laura said with a laugh. Have you given her a name, Captain? Alrian said. Her? Laura said. I thought all ships had female names. Only in the books. But for you, sure. Let's name her Lady Grace, after her poise and elegance, Lara said. Alrian burst out laughing again. Even certain cracked a smile. Is that an aspirational name? Alrian said. No, she is exceptionally graceful already. Look at how she navigates these dark and stormy waters, Lara said with a straight face. Can't argue with that. You even got certain to smile. He has not been this jovial since we first met him. It was fueled by alcohol then, as you know, Certain said. How do you feel now? Lara said. Not quite myself yet. I feel as if life has been muted. Before I was in a haze of loud sounds, bright colors, and ridiculous antics. Now that they have been stripped away, things seem duller than they should. I know it's just perception, but it may take time to readjust. How long did you live like that? Alrian said. It must have been a few years. I'm amazed that I didn't completely lose my skills and conditioning. I can't explain it. And that all stemmed from one event? Yes, sadly. It was like the floodgates opened and I was swept away. I relinquished control so I could pretend I had no responsibility over my actions. But that is not true. I was just hiding away. Do you miss it? The mind and the body still ache for it. I find myself thirsty despite having drunk lots of water. It might be a while before that passes, but it wasn't real. It was a long dream with no substance, and I don't want to lose myself like that again. Certain looked out over the river, not really focusing on anything in particular. We'll help you with that, and I'll continue trying to get you to crack a smile, Laura said. Sounds fine to me, Certain said. Good, good, Alrian said, watching the terrain fly past. They rode the river in silence for a time, each lost in their own thoughts. Certain broke the silence abruptly. I've been watching our progress, and I had a good idea, he said. What is it? Alrian said. It would help to provide you with some training in times like this, so that you might be better prepared for your trial. What did you have in mind? I must admit I know little of magic, but there is a certain visualization and mental focus, right? Yes, when I prepare a force spell, I am visualizing what will happen, applying my will, then fueling the spell with my internal force or spark. Good. Then we can do an exercise to help you train your will. Certain peeled off a sliver of wood from the raft and tossed it into the river. It landed on the water, but instead of bobbing along the surface, it rose up and floated just above the water. That's odd, Lara said. Whatever it was looked like magic to her. Yes, and it's not hovering in place. Somehow it's still moving with the water, just floating at a fixed height above. Are you doing that with your mind? Alrian said. Yes, now you try, Certain said. Alrian looked at the sliver of wood, then worked on peeling off another one. He tossed it off the raft and it bobbed on the water as expected. Try harder, Certain said. 
Alrian went silent. Laura watched him with interest. The young wizard's eyes squinted increasingly. Eventually, the tiny piece of wood lifted up and floated alongside Certain's piece, and Alrian let out a loud breath. There, Alrian said. It's not the same, Lara said. Alrian's sliver of wood seemed motionless, yet Certain's seemed to go with the flow of the river. You have achieved an appropriate result, but not mastered the process. Keep trying, Certain said. Alrian kept it up, and soon sweat dripped down his face. While he was still trying, Certain spoke up again. Lara, why don't you try it, he said. Me? Of course. It's using your mind. There's no magic involved. Alrian had an advantage in that he has been practicing the visualization more. But otherwise, there's no difference, Certain said. Watch out, I'm going to beat you. Lara prepared a sliver of wood of her own and threw it next to the two others. It plopped into the water and floated along. Not like that you won't, Alrian said. Lara scowled at him and returned to her concentration. She knew how to focus herself. Surely this piece of wood wouldn't mind falling in line? Little by little it began to rock from side to side, then floated slowly up to match Alrian's piece. See, Lara said. Well done. I'm still winning, though, Certain said. Neither Lara nor Alrian could seem to make their piece move the same way as Certain's. The competition continued in the same fashion for a while without any change. Alrian and Lara seemed to be quite tired from the effort, but Certain was relaxed and confident. I think it's time to mix things up, he said, and leaned over and whispered something into Lara's ear. Really? Lara said with interest, and refocused on her tiny wood shaving. She tried harder and harder, then just sat back. Her piece of wood was moving in concert with Certain's. Looks like I did it. How's things over there, Alrian? Laura said. Alrian's piece was the same, but looked stilted and forced in comparison to the other two. That's not fair. You told her the trick, Alrian said. No, I gave her a hint. But you need to discover it for yourself, Certain said. Alrian just huffed at them both and went back to his concentration. After some intense focus, his piece of wood moved more, mimicking the flow of the water. Nice try, but you're faking it. It's unrealistic, Certain said. Alrian gritted his teeth and kept trying to work even harder. Finally, something snapped. He relaxed and sat back, losing the intense look on his face as if he had given up. But now his piece was in sync with the other two. I don't understand, Alrian said. Give it a minute, Certain said. Alrian looked thoughtful. I hope he gets it. Hang on, I'm not controlling the piece of wood, but I'm maintaining the belief that it must float above the water, Alrian said. Exactly. Beliefs are powerful things. See the difference between forcefully propping up the wood shaving and changing your belief to alter its behavior, Certain said. Wow. So how much can you do with this, Alrian said. Everything. You are only limited by the strength of your will. Some things will be harder to alter than others, and knowledge of the way the world functions does make things easier, Certain said. So anyone could do this? Why aren't they, Lara said. Firstly, they don't believe it is possible. Very few would accidentally find a way to do this. Secondly, a strong will is required. The two of you have already gone through many trials. So you are better qualified to do it, Certain said. Incredible. I'm starting to understand how you can do what you do, Arian said. Excellent. This class is over. But let's see how long we can keep our tiny wood shavings floating, Certain said, grinning at them. You're on, Laura said. I'll win this. You just watch, Arian said. You know, you're a pretty good teacher, Laura said to Certain. She was impressed at the ease with which he had gotten them to succeed. Thank you. I hadn't considered that. You're probably not as far behind in your monk training as you think, Alrian said. Perhaps, but it may be for nothing. They may not accept me back. If they're as wise as you say, they definitely will, Alrian said. Shush, I need to concentrate, Laura said. The competition wasn't over after all, and she had to win. Fair enough, Alrian said. Hours later, Certain let his wood shaving gently drop to the surface of the water. You could have kept that up all day, Lara said, accusing Certain. Of course. Did you really think you would beat him? Alrian said. Well, I beat you, Lara said. Alrian didn't reply. 
I think we may be nearing our destination, Certain said. In the distance, they could see walls, indicating a city of some kind. I wonder if we will find my parents there, Alrian said. Of course. Lara scanned the distance as if she were able to see them. She had a bad feeling, as though there were more troubles ahead, but she kept that to herself. Fifteen. Investigation. Vincent urged the horse to go faster. Now they were on the open road, he wanted to travel as quickly as possible. Salas did the same, pulling even with him. This reminds me of the old days, she said, a glint of mischief in her eyes. It sure does. We were so carefree back then, Vincent said, his voice taking a heavier tone. Yes, well, these are serious times, I admit, but I know I'm ready for another adventure. Aren't you? Yes and no. I've been dreading this. Because you knew that Alrian may be a wizard? Yes, and I knew that it wouldn't be an easy life, given what my father accomplished. He will rise to it. He already has. You've taught him well, Salas said, reaching out to place a hand on Vincent's shoulder. We both have. Now we just need to support him. Vincent placed his hand over his wife's. And we are. What do you expect us to find out there, Salas said, taking her hand back. We have been tracked the whole way. The only explanation is that Branthor built a network of followers. Regardless of whether Branthor is alive or not, we still have to deal with that. I don't believe that shade attack was random. I think you're right. Just as well you have the world's best thief with you, Silas said. World's best? I'd like to see the finalists for that prize lined up. That would be a sight, Vincent said. Yes, maybe even some contenders that we don't know about. I hope so. The world has changed a lot in the last twenty years or so that we've been hidden away, Vincent said. The extent of the changes was evident, even in the empty stretch of road they were riding down. So how do we pinpoint these followers? Any tricks we can use? Celis said. I don't know of any ways to detect tainted ones, other than that diamond we gave to Alrian. I think we will need to be observant and do an investigation. Who would you start with? Guards and officials, Celis said. Why? If you want to track people and have access to information, that's the best way. I'd say if we find tainted ones in official posts, they will be connected to Branthor. Sounds reasonable to me. I'll be the muscle and you can be the brains, Vincent said. So, the usual? Sellers said with a smirk. Vincent shook his head gently and laughed. The usual, then, Vincent said. The city gates of Plinth loomed large, yet appeared unchanged. The black metal gate was as imposing as ever, and the stone walls looked just as ancient as Vincent remembered. Are there more guard towers now, Vincent said. I think so. Lots more guards, too, Sailor said, looking around. Seems like a lot more security overall, Vincent said. Definitely. Take a look at her, Sailor said, directing Vincent to a guard. The woman was referring to a drawing and questioning a young couple trying to enter the city. They're looking for someone, Vincent said. Exactly. Why don't you hang back and I'll investigate, Silas said. She threw her reins at Vincent and hopped off the horse. Within moments, she had disappeared into the crowd. There she goes, Vincent said to himself. After a moment, he stopped trying to look for her and shuffled off the main road with the two horses. Silas felt the thrill from the intrigue and curiosity of the situation. She had to get a look at whomever they were after and needed to do so without revealing herself in a crowded thoroughfare. Good exercise as a refresher. As she approached the guard, Salas tried to blend in with some other travelers. She continued walking and leaned in to try and catch some of the conversation. You aren't listening to me. You are a young couple and look almost exactly like the ones I have here, the female guard said. It's a passing resemblance at best. What does that have to do with us, the young man said. He was quite agitated and trying to contain himself, but slowly failing. I can't let you in. It's too much of a risk. What I can do, though, is take you into a holding area, where you can be interviewed by someone else. If that passes, we will let you in, the guard said. Just do it. We need to enter the city, and they will discover soon enough that we aren't who they are looking for, the young woman said to her companion. Fine, but I think this is ridiculous, the man said, trying to get the last word in. The female guard nodded. Yes, I appreciate your frustration. This way, please, she said, leading them into a side passage off the main gate. As she rolled up the drawing, Silas managed to get a quick glance at it. Then she reversed directions and made her way back to Vincent. So, he said, not good. 
they're holding that young couple for a further interview because of their likeness to a drawing. And the drawing looks like... Alrian and Lara. She could see Vincent's expression drop. I had feared that. Yes, it's not subtle at all. Salus was worried by the brashness of their actions. How far had they infiltrated? Do you think that guard is in on it? Probably not. But I would suggest that whomever comes to interview the couple will be, Salus said. Sounds logical. I guess we need to infiltrate that guard post then, Vincent said. Exactly. And you are going to help. Of course, and I'm sure you have a plan already. Vincent had a weariness to his voice. Yes, I do. Let's head over to the armorer that makes the guard uniforms. You can find that out, right? Celis said. I'm sure I can. Let's get to it, Vincent said. Celis winked at Vincent, then expertly leapt back into the saddle. I don't know how you can still do that, he said, chuckling. I'm allowed to have a few secrets of my own, Celis said. Fair enough. I won't ask. Together, they rode through the gates, avoiding any unwanted attention. At least they're not looking for us, Salus said. Yet. Yet? After whatever you're going to pull off today, they most certainly are going to, Vincent said. Not necessarily, Salus said, her voice trailing off. But they both knew that there were little chance that their investigation would go unnoticed. Vincent introduced himself to the first blacksmith that they encountered and steered the conversation around to who did the guard uniforms. Oh, that's most likely John down the hill. Why, the blacksmith said. Well, I'm looking for work and I'm over making household implements. I'd like to do something more interesting, Vincent said. After a few of those, I doubt you'd find it interesting, but fair enough. I could use an extra hand. Let me know if you're interested. Or maybe see me after you get bored, the blacksmith said. Definitely. Thanks for the help. Vincent left the workshop and met Celis back on the street. You found it all right, she said. Yes, it should be just down the hill. Man named John. See, I told you. You did indeed. What's the plan? You just distract the blacksmith and I'll take care of the rest, Celis said. As you wish. Vincent was curious to see what she would do. The guard armor was not fully plated, but it would be heavy and noisy. There was only one blacksmith at the bottom of the hill, and Vincent approached him directly. John, is it? Vincent said. Yes, who is asking? My name is Will. I'm interested in some blacksmithing work, and I heard that you work on the guard uniforms. That's right. Why are you interested in that? John said. He was looking at Vincent with suspicion. I've been working in a small town so long, there, there's only so many knives and horseshoes and other boring items that I can make. I thought the work you do might have a bit more sophistication to it, Vincent said. You're right about one thing. It's more sophisticated. But it's still boring, just a different kind, John said. Change is as good as a journey, so they say, Vincent said. All the same, I don't think I can afford to bring on more help. Not with what they pay for these, John said. Do you mind if I work with you for free, then? I could learn some new skills. You could get some free labor and... We can both profit before I move on. Vincent could see John's mind ticking over, considering the pros and cons. I could use the help, but you should understand that I have an exclusive contract for these. It will do you no good trying to set up shop here, John said. I wouldn't dream of it. I can see that you're busy today. Could I get a quick tour, then we start proper tomorrow? Vincent said. I will need to structure my day differently, so that works for me. Come this way. John waved at Vincent and disappeared further into the workshop. Salus observed the conversation and smiled. Thanks for the help, my dear husband. Once the two men had disappeared, she snuck into the workshop looking for a suitable uniform. She spotted one that looked like it had just been completed. No, too obvious. She continued the search, locating a temporary store nearby. This will work, Salus said to herself. Not everything was there, but the main elements were. It wouldn't be too difficult to complete the look herself. Once she had extracted the chest pieces and helmet, she paused to listen out. She could hear voices in the distance, but wasn't sure if they were coming closer. It's a noisy place. I'll just get going, she told herself. She found a bundle of leather and wrapped up the pieces within it, and left the shop as quickly as she could. Once she was out of the door, she slowed her pace to look less suspicious, then found a quiet alley nearby to rest. After a few minutes, she heard footsteps and readied herself. It's just me, 
Vincent said as he turned the corner. He saw Sellers ready to pounce. She visibly relaxed and stepped aside to show off her prize. Nice work. Clearly I bought you enough time, Vincent said. It was a charming gesture, but you didn't need to. Are you going to try this on now? Yes, if you'll assist, she said. Vincent looked out for passers-by and helped sell us into the outfit. You'll need a white tunic to match, he said. I know, I spotted a stall not far from here. Would you mind? No, I'll be right back. Vincent quickly left and returned shortly, showing Celis the clothing. Approved, she said, and they adjusted her outfit to allow her to put it on. How do I look, Celis said, like an unusually attractive guard, Vincent said. Right answer. Just try not and get it too dirty. You need to return it tonight, Vincent said. Why? I'm going to work there for a few days. Whatever for? I could learn a thing or two from John, and it gives us a reason to be here. I thought it would help us blend in. Celis had to admit that he made sense. That would be useful. I guess I'll have to be extra careful then, she said, winking at Vincent. What's the plan, he said. She leaned in closer and whispered to him for a full minute. I stand around and bail you out if you need help, Vincent said. Exactly, she said and waved goodbye. Good luck, Vincent said and watched her leave. Celis walked down the street with confidence. She had to assume the role of the guard perfectly. The guards belonged here and were respected and obeyed, so she acted like she owned the place. She strode into the guard block without even pausing. As another guard passed by, Celis nodded her head, and the guard did the same. Now to find that interview room, Celis said to herself. The building was one long corridor with many rooms off either side. This must be built alongside the city walls. She noticed that one door in the distance had a guard posted outside. That was promising. Celis walked up to the door and addressed the guard. Is this the couple that are awaiting questioning? She said. Yes. Are you the examiner? The guard said. No, I'm here to relieve you, as the examiner has been delayed, Celis said. Oh, that's unusual. Are you sure? Yes, they aren't sure how long it will take, and you are needed back on patrol, Celis said. Great, thanks for letting me know the guard said and left the post. This is too easy, Celis thought. She opened the door and stepped inside. The young couple were seated at a table, but the rest of the room was empty. They looked up at her expectantly. Sorry, I am not the examiner, just checking in on you. One should be on the way soon, Celis said. Fine, the man said, and did not engage in any further questions. Celis stepped back outside and stood just as the previous guard had. Now it was time to wait. After an hour or two and many guards passing back and forth, she noticed someone different walking down the corridor. It was a male guard, but he was wearing a black cloak with white trim. He looks different. I must keep an eye on him. The guard walked briskly, then stopped suddenly in front of the door. The couple awaiting questioning are inside, the guard said. His speech was precise and calculated. Yes, Celis said, thinking it best to be as brief as possible. You are dismissed, the guard said, waving her away. Yes, sir, she said, and turned to leave. After she had taken a few steps, she heard the door open and close. She didn't have a good feeling about him, and the sound of the lock clanking shut was chilling to her ears. Celis wasn't sure what to do. She had identified the examiner, but was fearful for the couple. It wasn't based on anything, but she just didn't feel right. So she decided to circle around and find another way to access that room. Turning around, Celis walked past the room and listened out. She didn't hear anything. Continuing on, she located the next door and entered it. It was another holding cell, but was empty. It looked identical to the one she had already seen. That's a start, Celis said to herself. She examined the room to look for any strange designs or flaws in the construction that would allow her to access or hear from the adjoining room. The stone was solid and ceiling was well constructed, but she did notice a smaller stone slightly out of place near the floor. She carefully lowered herself to the ground and manipulated the stone with her hand. Very slowly it moved. With some persistence, she was able to remove it. There was a gap behind the stone and another stone on the other side for the adjoining room. She wouldn't be able to budge the other stone, but she hoped that it might be able to be moved. She reached into the hole, but couldn't touch the other stone. She used a dagger instead, levering it just enough to dislodge it. This created a passage for the air to travel between the rooms. Now she just had to try and listen in. 
I can see immediately that the two of you are not who we are looking for, the male voice said. Silas assumed that it was the examiner. Good. Can we go? The young man said. Not quite yet. There seems to be a complication, the examiner said. What's going on? We have been completely cooperative through all this, the young woman said. You've been caught up in something by mistake, but unfortunately that means that you need to be dealt with. Perhaps after I deal with the person listening in on this conversation, the examiner said. Silas heard footsteps approaching her. 16. Dark Tidings Silas knew that somehow she had been detected. She pushed up quickly and considered her options. She couldn't wait for him to find her. She had to be aggressive and take him off guard. She wouldn't have the element of surprise, but he might not expect her to be so bold. She headed for the door immediately and looked out into the corridor. There was nobody. This is it, Silas told herself, and ran over to the holding cell next to her. She tried to minimize the noise, but she maintained her speed. The examiner seemed confident. She had to try to exploit that. As she reached the door, she heard a scream from within. Silas burst through and assessed the situation. The examiner was holding the young woman hostage with a knife to her throat. Well, hello. Lovely of you to join us, he said to Silas. This is against regulation. Why are you doing this, Silas said. What would you know of regulations? You are not a real guard, he said. Who are you really, Silas countered. I am the one asking the questions here. You're not really in a place to be making demands, the examiner said. He pointed to an empty chair. Take a seat, he said. Silas considered the request, then complied. I need to keep him thinking he is in control. Then I can use an opening. You look somehow familiar, but I can't pick it, the examiner said. We've never met before. I wouldn't forget that face, Silas said. The examiner's features were not extraordinary, but he had a deep black scar on his forehead. You mean this? It's a souvenir from my encounter with some rather nasty blighters. Such bothersome creatures, but useful with the right motivation and stimulation, he said. You're tainted, then. You admit it? Yes, there's no harm in doing that. None of you will leave this room alive, the examiner said. The young man started to yell in protest, but an icy look from the examiner silenced him. What do I call you? Silas said. You can call me Brian. Not that it matters, really. He dismissed her with his eyes, looking elsewhere. Brian, interesting name. So, have you been tainted long? Silas said. I said I was doing the interrogation here, Brian said, tightening his grip on the young woman. She whimpered as the knife edged closer. Ask away, Silas said. There was not yet an opening that was safe. Let's begin with your name. What is it? Silas. Good. That wasn't hard, was it? Why were you spying on this couple? Brian said. Silas decided that she would answer truthfully. It would help her later when the tables were turned and she was trying to get information from him. I noticed that they were stopped for looking like people I know. I wanted to see who was asking. Now my fears are confirmed. Oh, this is interesting. I want to hear more. Brian half turned to face her. I can't concentrate properly seeing that woman so distressed, Silas said, trying her luck. Naughty, naughty. Trying to convince me to let her go when you drop the juicy information. So amateur. But you know that. I'll let you have this one. Brian withdrew the knife from the young woman and shoved her into the corner violently. Her husband ran over and comforted her. You two stay there for now. If you become a distraction, I'll deal with you permanently. He turned his attention back to Silas. So, can you talk now? Yes, I can. I have a question, though. What makes you so confident? You're just a man who is tainted. You don't have any special powers, she said. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But I suggest you answer my questions, and this will go smoother for everyone. You don't want to make me angry. Brian twirled the knife in his hand to ensure his words had the correct impact. I'd need to see the sketch again, but it looked like my son. Silas watched Brian's reaction carefully. His eyes lit up in interest. Take as close a look as you want, he said. He removed a rolled up parchment from his cloak and threw it at her. Silas unrolled it and studied the picture. It was a very good sketch of Alrian and Laura. Silas adjusted her seated position and loosened one of the knives strapped to her foot. 
There's no doubt about it. That's my son. Why are you looking for him? Celis said. Never you mind. The important thing is, where is he? Brian said. He started to walk over, licking his lips. It was like he could taste the information and he wanted more. Celis saw the opportunity and took it. She used her leg to fling the loosened knife at Brian's leg. What? He cried as it made impact. And Celis used the opportunity to jump up onto the table and vault off it, launching herself at Brian. He didn't notice in time, and all he could do was throw up his hands. They landed on the ground, Celis with a knife at Brian's throat, and Brian using all his strength to hold it at bay. I can do this all day, and time is not on your side, Brian said. Why is that? I have reinforcements coming, reinforcements of the blighter variety. If you do that, you'll blow your cover. Silas knew that she had to dissuade him from doing that, if it were at all possible. Not if there's no witnesses. It'll be so tragic, Brian said. Silas banged her right boot on the ground, and a small blade popped out. She used that to kick Brian's left leg. He cried out in pain, and Silas used that moment to overpower him and flip him over. In seconds, he was face down on the floor with his arms pinned behind him. You can't possibly escape, Brian said. Watch me. Celis pushed harder and Brian stopped struggling. She quickly extracted a short rope and bound his hands. Are you all right? Run for it, Celis said to the young couple. They looked bewildered, but Celis' speech seemed to snap them out of it. The young man helped his wife up and they ran to the door. They're coming, Brian said in a sing-song way. Get up, Celis said, kicking Brian in the small of the back and dragging him up. He complied and stood shakily. This leg injury is going to slow me down, he said. You'll live. We're leaving. Sailor shoved him closer to the door, but kept a knife pressed at his back. On the double, Brian said, mocking her. They entered the corridor, and Sailors could hear commotion from one end. I told you they're coming, Brian said. This way, Sailors said, pushing a prisoner in the opposite direction. He began walking, and Sailors stayed close behind. She could hear the noises of conflict getting louder and louder. Would you mind if I had a rest? Brian said. He was practically laughing and was struggling to contain himself. Yes, keep moving. Sailors really hoped that there was an exit at the other end of the corridor. She hadn't scouted that far ahead. They're inside! Two arms! A male voice shouted. Sailors didn't even turn around. She just pressed on and forced Brian to increase his pace. She could see the sweat forming on his dark locks. Either walking with that injury or something else was causing him quite a bit of exertion. As they reached the door at the end of the corridor, Celis pushed Brian to the side and kicked the door open. The last rays of daylight peeked in and Celis felt relief. There was a small training area before them and a path. Keep moving, Celis said, pushing Brian out of the door. They shuffled slowly through the yard, Celis looking back to see if they had company. Nothing yet. As they reached the path, she could see that it led to a main street. Almost there, she said. Just then she heard another scream and watched a hapless guard be overwhelmed by blighters. He fell to their attacks and they started to pour out from the compound. Sailors pressed on even faster. Brian almost fell instantly due to the shove. Oh, who might you be? Brian said. He stopped completely, looking at a man on the path. The man stepped forward and punched Brian in the face. He fell in a heap instantly. I wanted to do that for a while, but I don't have the strength to carry him, Silas said. Happy to assist. I think we better make a move. Vincent reached down and picked up Brian, slinging him over his shoulder. I don't know how you made it here, but I don't care. Can you move with him? Silas said. Fast enough. Do you think they can track us? He said. No idea. Let's just get some distance between us. Silas put her knife away and started to run. Vincent did his best to keep up, and they pushed for the main street. The blighters seemed distracted and weren't sure where to go. Silas and Vincent ducked off the main street and took any available lanes. After ten solid minutes, they slowed and took a breath. Any sign of them? Vincent said. I don't think so. Silas glanced around, but the streets looked empty. She let some of the tension go. Good. Let's take it a bit easier from here. Where will we go? John gave me the keys to a place we can stay. Let's start there, Vincent said. Great. Take us away. Celis looked back once more, but couldn't see or hear any blighters. They seemed to lose the trail when you knocked him out, Celis said. I doubt it's a coincidence. He's tainted, right? Yes, he admitted it. Even seemed proud of the fact. Crazy. Well, let's get him back so we can ask him more. However, we need to be comfortable with the possibility that he can call more of them upon us. 
Vincent upped his speed and caught up with Silas. They arrived at the tiny house within minutes. It was surrounded by what looked like an abandoned workshop. This is it. He runs a few jobs through here when he needs extra hands, and they stay here. It should work well, Vincent said. At least we will have some privacy, Silas said. They entered the house and Silas located a chair. Vincent plonked Brian down, then bound his feet to the chair. That should hold him. Let's wake him up, Vincent said. Not just yet. Let me find something. Silas rifled through her things and found a small vial. She showed it to Vincent. What is that, he said. It's a serum that should keep him talking. Hopefully it still works. I used to use them all the time to ease key information out of people, Silas said. I thought you just got them drunk. This works better, and sometimes they work well together. Let's see what he has to say, Silas said. Vincent shook Brian a little until the man began to show signs of consciousness. Where am I? Brian asked. Once his vision improved, he saw Silas and Vincent standing in front of him. Right. I was knocked out. Nice punch there, Brian said, nodding at Vincent. We have some questions. Drink this. Silas shoved the vial into Brian's mouth, and he swallowed it without question. You probably didn't need that, but it doesn't hurt, does it? Brian said. No, you won't feel anything, Silas said. Good. My mind feels very fuzzy, though. What did you want to know anyway? Why are you after this couple, Silas said, showing Brian the drawing he had tossed to her earlier. Vincent sneaked a peek at it, too, and noticed the perfect likeness for Alrian and Lara. Just following orders, they're to be found, Brian said. Whose orders, Vincent said. Wraith. Brian squirmed after he said it, as if he were trying to retract the words. Never heard of him, Vincent said. He's a new player, at least in this form. Brian seemed surprised that he had said that. Looks like your vile concoction is working. Good. Why does Wraith want these two? Silas said. He didn't say, but then again, I never asked. I guess they are a problem for him, Brian said. How do you communicate with him? Do you meet somewhere? Vincent said. Oh, I met him once, not that I had to, really. I think he wanted to impress us, so he made an appearance. No, we talk up here, Brian said, tapping his head. You can communicate via thoughts, Vincent said, surprised. You don't know anything, do you? How do you think I called all those blighters before? We're all linked. Everything you have told me about yourself, I have passed on, Brian said, quite pleased with himself. To whom, Silas said. Everyone who is tapped in, all those who are tainted, can access the channel. It's like a river of consciousness that we all share. Those more powerful can broadcast their message and rise above other chatter, Brian said. I see, Vincent said, starting to pace around the room. Tell me more about Wraith. What does he look like, Silas said. Like a shade, Brian said. A shade? He's a shade? Vincent said, yes, believe it or not, he's a strange one, but he's mighty powerful, so we listen. Yes, we do. Did he have a name before he was turned? Vincent said, yes, Brian said. He seemed to be holding back. What is it? Silas said. Brian started to twitch, like something was affecting him. He started to have trouble breathing. What is it? Vincent said, grabbing Brian by the coat. The, the Branthor. Brian said before collapsing down in the chair. Vincent stepped back, surprised at the response. He noticed that Brian didn't seem to be breathing, so he leaned in close to examine him closer. He's dead. I don't believe it, Vincent said. How? Sellers felt panicked. Not sure, maybe it was the psychic link they seemed to have. If that's the case, it means Branthor is on to us. It means he always has been. What about Alrian? We must think. It's not safe here. I'll go on the lookout. If they try and enter tonight, I'll find them. Good. Why don't you change out of the guard uniform before you go? I'll take care of that and figure out what to do with Brian, Vincent said. Their day had taken a vastly darker turn. 17. Denied Entry Laura skillfully guided her companions in steering their makeshift raft towards a safe landing spot. There was a low embankment with a lot of mud, perfect for a solid dock. Lean more this side. Paddle faster, she shouted. 
Alrin and Certain did their best, still somewhat confused by her angry and rapid instructions. Easy, easy there, Lara said. The raft shuddered with a quick contact with the bank, but stopped completely. Not bad for a maiden voyage, Lara said. I'd do it again, Alrian said. It was definitely a learning experience, Certain said. Lara wasn't sure if Certain was keen on their little river excursion, but he had been a good sport and they had made good time. Do you think we can reach the city gates before nightfall? Alrian said. Plinth isn't that far. We should be able to. But I'm not an expert on this area. It depends on how close we landed, Lara said. Either way, I don't think such a thing as nightfall will be able to stop us, Certain said, looking at Lara. You're right. I can get us in anywhere, anytime, provided we can find our way back onto the main path, she said, picking her way between trees and large shrubs. They were in a heavily wooded area with no signs of any trails or paths. After an hour of uncertain heading, they found what looked like a minor path. This has to be it. Let's follow it, Lara said. Fine by me. It's the only thing even slightly resembling a path around here, Alrian said. Certain didn't comment, just followed quietly. Everything all right back there? Lara said. Of course, don't mind my quietness. I'm not usually that talkative anyway. It comes in fits and spurts, Certain said. You make talking sound like a disease, Alrian said. That's probably a good comparison. It is quite infectious, and some people are terrible carriers, Certain said. Lara laughed. I like your brand of humor, Certain. It's a little strange, but always surprising, she said. I've never heard it described as such, so thank you, Certain said, performing a small bow. That may be the road we are looking for, Alrian said, pointing out a much wider track that was connected up ahead. Looks about right. Let's follow it. Lara led the group there, keeping a little ahead to spot any potential dangers. When she was satisfied, she slowed down and waved the others on. They followed along and joined the main road. Signs of life. We must be close now. Lara pointed at a few travelers in the distance. I have a good feeling, Alrian said. Lara couldn't agree. Something still felt off to her. It was probably just the encounter with Branthor, but her gut wouldn't let her relax. The city gates loomed large in the distance, and Laura could see a crowd of people milling in front of them. Something was definitely off. Looks busy, but at least we made it in time, Alrian said. Something doesn't look right. I can't put my finger on it yet, but I don't think that's normal, Laura said. Alrian gave her a puzzled look but didn't question it. As they approached, they heard commotion and yelling. I told you something was up, Laura said. There were signs of a recent battle at the gates, with the guards bloodied and weary. They had formed a line blocking entry to the gates, and they were actively pushing people back. Let us in, an older man was pleading with him. No entry, the gates are closed, the guard said. His tone suggested that he was sick of repeating it. Certain, why don't you go and ask them what the problem is? Alrian will hang back and observe. I'll tell you to see for myself, Lara said. Certainly, he said, and started to make his way through the crowd. He was insistent yet polite, and made consistent progress through the large throng of people. Certain stopped in front of a relatively energetic and talkative guard at the end of the formation. Excuse me, can you please explain what all the commotion is about, he said. I'm sorry, but there's just been a blighter attack. It occurred after we detained a suspicious couple, so for security reasons we are letting nobody else in. I'm sorry, try again tomorrow the guard said. Of course, safety is the primary concern, although I do fear for my own safety being trapped outside. Should I be on the lookout for anyone in particular? Certain said. I can't comment on the specifics, but we have a drawing here, the guard said, removing a parchment and handing it to Certain. He examined it carefully and returned it. And these two tried to gain entry? Yes. Well, Two people matching that description. If you spot them, I advise you keep your distance and come alert the guard of their location. They may still be at large. Good advice. Thank you for your assistance, Certain said, bowing. You're welcome. Thank you for your understanding. Take care. I am sure the situation will be improved tomorrow, the guard said. Certain returned to the others as quickly as he could navigate through the impatient mob. Blighter attack is why they closed the gates and are keeping people out, Certain said as he joined his companions. That makes sense. Not good for us, Lara said. It gets worse. They detained a couple that look exactly like you two. They even showed me the drawing they are using for the comparison. Even if they open the gates tomorrow, you can't enter. They're looking for you, Certain said. 
That I did not expect. You contained your reaction well, Lara said. What? That's ridiculous. How many guards are there? Could we just storm in? Alrian said. Calm down. It must be some sort of misunderstanding, Lara said. They think we are tainted or something. We've done nothing wrong. I can't believe it, Alrian said. It could be a coincidence that there was a blighter attack or it could be related. Either way, there's no way the two of you are passing through the gates anytime soon, Certain said. Maybe I can destroy part of the wall, Alrian said. A man with only a hammer sees everything as nails, Lara said. I think it would work. What do you suggest, Alrian said. Certain and I should sneak in or climb the wall. We will find your parents and figure out what's going on. Then we can decide whether to pass through the city or go around it, Lara said. That is a good plan, I agree, Certain said. Sure, but it's not as fun as my idea. Magic makes everything better, Alrian threw a mock fireball at the walls. There'll be plenty of opportunity for that, I have no doubt. But let's start with a stealthy approach. Do you think you are best suited to infiltrate? Certain said to Lara. Yes, leave this one with me. Let's find a place to camp, and once we settled, I'll come back. I'll have a better chance once the crowd disperse and the guard relaxes a little, Lara said. Let's go. Alria made a start and the others followed close behind. What's the big rush? Lara said to Alria. It's just so frustrating. We're hitting problem after problem. It's like we're always one step behind. I'm working so hard on improving my magic, but it's not helping, Alrian said. There will come a time when we may need to rely on it. However, growing in strength and experience is more than just increasing your power. Most of us can achieve quite a bit without a touch of magic, Certain said. That makes sense. It's like something inside that I just need to unleash, Alrian said. Unfortunately, your mentor Falric is not here. I'm sure he would know what to say. Maybe there's a way you can deal with that without blowing things up, Lara said. You're right. I'll consult my book and think it through, do some exercises. It will keep me occupied while we wait, Alrian said. They continued walking and found a nice clearing a little bit off the main tracks. Certain and Alrian settled in and Lara prepared to leave. Keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid, Lara whispered to Certain. Of course, we'll be fine. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Wish me luck, Lara said loud enough for Alrian to hear. Good luck, Certain said. Don't get caught, Alrian said. I'll do my best, Lara said with a wink and dashed off into the cover of the nearby trees. Lara took her time weaving back through the woods. She didn't want to return too quickly and also wished to avoid being spotted by anyone. If the guard had showed the drawing to certain, there could be others on the lookout for her and she didn't want to bring unwanted attention. Once she returned to the city gates, she noticed that the crowd had mostly dispersed. The gates were firmly closed and there were two guards posted in guard station above the walls. I can't waltz in the front door. I'll need to find another way in. Without going too close, she started to skirt around the walls to see if there were any additional entrances. As she progressed, she didn't find any, but she did notice that there were no more guard towers. They don't expect to encounter anyone outside the main gate. I wonder if there's a way to climb the walls, Lara said to herself. Since it was quiet, she approached the walls and looked at them closely. There were quite a few cracks, metallic supports, and other decorations on the wall to act as climbing aids. Of course, if she fell, there was no safety net, but with the help of her dagger, it would be possible. Only one way to find out. This better not end horribly, Lara whispered. She scrambled up the wall, using a large crack as her initial handhold. Next, she swung herself up to another crack, using her dagger to wedge in and hold her weight. It was a little unsteady, but worked. Only a million maneuvers left, Lara thought, staring up. Maybe I should have let Alrian blast a hole through here, she said, as she shuffled up to a metal bar she could hang from. Her fingers started to slip, so she furiously kicked around to find a better foothold, and once she did, moved to another handhold. Sweat started to pour down her face. Looking down, then regretting it, Lara realized that she was halfway up the wall. May as well keep going. After some mental preparations, she began again. There was a relatively sizable chunk of wall missing halfway up the remaining distance. If she could get there, she would be able to rest a bit before completing the climb. Feeling a second wave of energy coming on, Lara pushed forward with confidence, spotting the best handholds as quickly as she needed them. 
With a concerted effort, she was poised to leap into the safe nook, but her feet slipped. Lashing out frantically with her dagger, she pierced the wall enough to slow her descent, find another handhold, and propelling herself into the space. That was not very ladylike, she said, laughing quietly. Her adrenaline was pumping as she considered what could have happened. After taking a minute to calm down, she took more care approaching the last leg of the climb. With great relief, she toppled over the top of the wall. Recognizing it as a battlement, she quickly scanned both directions to see if there were any guards patrolling. She noticed a torch in the distance to her left and started to crouch run in the opposite direction. Great, another torch, she whispered. There was nowhere to run. She crept over to look at the way down inside the walls. There were a few houses and some trees nearby, but nothing to climb down easily. That tree isn't so far away, she thought, as she heard footsteps converging from both directions. Not wanting a confrontation, she leapt out into the darkness, aiming for a relatively thick tree branch. She landed on it but couldn't maintain her balance and stumbled further into the tree. Her hands couldn't seem to grasp any of the branches, and she braced herself for a rough landing. Suddenly she stopped. One arm had somehow snagged something, and she was hanging in mid-air. It was hard to see what was below her, but it looked like grass. Please don't break anything, she told herself as she let go of the branch. 18. A New Lead As she saw the ground approaching, Laura put her hands out and tried to go into a roll. She had partial success, but didn't land straight and tumbled out of control, thumping into another tree trunk. Everything was dead quiet. I'm alive, but how noisy was that, she thought. The eerie calm continued, raising her tension. She heard voices conversing above her, but couldn't hear what they were saying. I hope those guards didn't notice, she wondered. When nothing happened, she slowly tested all her limbs. Everything seemed to work. Taking care, she stood up a bit shakily, but as she walked, everything seemed to improve. Let's not do that again, Lara said to herself. She tried to appear like she belonged as she stumbled around looking for a main road. It would help if it wasn't so damn dark, she whispered. But the darkness was also useful since it kept her hidden. She crept past the nearest houses and found her way to some signs of life. Now, assuming Vincent and Silas are here, where would they be? Lara mused. She decided to try and head to the most populated area of the city. That would be a good place to start. It just depended on whether the couple wanted to be found or not. Laura didn't notice many people on the streets, which made sense if there had been a blighter attack recently. That made her job a little easier, although she could stand out a little because of it. The buildings became bigger and bigger, and Laura realized she had reached the main hub. She had been here before, and as she stopped to look, the place became more familiar. Her unorthodox entry and the had confused her a bit. Deciding to take a methodical approach, she walked over to the main gates to start her search. The buildings in the area were devoted to the guards, and it looked like they had borne the brunt of the blighter attack. What drove them here all of a sudden? Not a good sign. Moving on, she came to a crossroads. To her left, she could continue on to the trade and commercial districts, or she could go straight and enter the workers' area. Vincent likes to associate with other blacksmiths, but I doubt he'll be able to stay there. I'll try the local inns, Lara thought. She headed left and followed the lights and signs of life. The bleak, quiet street she had encountered quickly melted away. It seemed like the people who weren't hiding indoors were out celebrating. As Lara walked past, she decided to try the quietest inn. There was no way that Vincent and Celis would be joining the celebrations. After scouting a few locations, Laura settled on the jocular javelin thrower. The crowd wasn't bursting out into the street, and the noise level seemed lower. She stepped in and looked around. The clientele was a lot less jocular than whomever the inn was named after, with minimal conversation. Most were just nursing their drinks in silence. However, Laura did spot some friendly faces in the corner. She made a beeline for them. Bit of a depressing place, isn't it? Laura said. Laura! Great to see you! Vincent said, jumping out of his chair to envelop Laura in a big hug. Where's Alrian? he said, instantly suspicious. Camping outside with certain. I had to climb the bloody wall to get in. Laura made a show of dusting off her clothes. Yes, I'm not surprised. It's been a bit of an adventure here. Take a seat. We have some information to share with you, Celis said. I'm sure you do. 
But you won't believe what happened to us, Laura said as she sat down. Vincent and Silas sat quietly waiting to hear. We ran into Branthor. He's become a shade, Laura said. She looked at Vincent and Silas' reactions and was confused. You don't seem surprised about that, Laura said. The shade part is interesting, but otherwise it confirms what we just heard. Branthor is calling himself Wraith and running quite a network of tainted ones, Silas said. Figures, we have this absolutely crazy encounter, and you have uncovered the same information. Tell us what happened, Vincent said. We went the alternate route and nothing interesting happened. We saw this figure on the bridge and it looked like a shade. We attacked it with everything we had and nothing seemed to really damage it. That's unusual. How did you get away? It grabbed certain and used him to talk to us. It seemed distracted or unable to fully control its new form. But you know what worked on it? That sword you made. We managed to sever the hand holding certain and it raged, destroying the bridge and disappearing, Lara said. Good to know we have a weapon against it. We've had some similar excitement here, finding a tainted one deep in Branthor's network. He summoned the blighters to attack us. We think that perhaps as he was talking to us, he was killed via his mental link, Vincent said. How is that even possible? Laura said. She felt a chill go down her spine. I'm not sure, but clearly there's a lot we don't know about how they operate. Let's get some food and drink and talk this all through, Vincent said. Laura relaxed a little and settled back into the chair. Hours later, they had shared all the details of their exploits. So where to from here, Salas said. I think we should continue our investigation and let Alrion continue to the desert, Vincent said. So we're the diversion, Salas said. Yes, I don't like what happened here, but at least that army of blighter was not directed at Alrion. It might help keeping us a smaller group. We have certain to guide us there, Laura said. Yes, he's all you need. Hopefully, with this information, you can dodge Wraith and his attackers more easily, Vincent said. Wraith? Laura said. I don't think it's worth calling him Branthor anymore. He has become something else. May as well use his new name. Wraith it is. I guess I'll return to Alrian tonight, and we can leave tomorrow avoiding the city. That's best. They'll still be looking for you. Perhaps even more keenly since they have associated the blighter attack with your presence, Salus said. More forest, yay, Laura said. It'll be worth it. One more thing, Vincent said, leaning in closer. Yes? Take care in the desert. It's a bleak place, so I hear. We may try to join you later if possible, Vincent said. Laura said her goodbyes and left the inn. She felt re-energized by the familiar company, food, and the news. There wasn't much for her to go on, but she still felt like it was a success. She had found Alrian's parents, shared the situation, and learned some key information that may help them travel more safely. Laura walked back the way she came, wondering if she should try and sneak out via the main gate or try her climbing trick again. I really don't want to scale that wall. Once is enough, she said to herself, looking over at the looming structure. As she went to turn, she almost walked into a man standing right in front of her. Sorry, she said before looking more closely. He was tall and in a dark cloak, his face hidden. Not a problem. I did in fact step in front of you, the man said. He was in no hurry to move either. It's you. What's going on? Laura said. Come this way so we can talk more, the man said. Laura followed along, puzzled at why this mysterious wizard was contacting her again. How are you? He said. Fine. We've had a few adventures, but nothing we couldn't handle. Good. Things are going to become more difficult soon. You won't be able to hide your journey to the desert, the wizard said. Laura stopped in her tracks. How do you know about that? It doesn't matter. Let's just say I'm invested in your journey. You're going to need help. Alrian needs more training, the wizard said. He stopped off the main path under a tree. Give this to the monk. He will understand it, he said, handing Lara a slip of paper. She unfolded it and read the contents. What is this, she said. Directions to a wizard who lives in the desert. You must make sure that Alrian meets him. He is called the Desert Wizard for good reason. He is going to wonder where I got this information, Lara said. You'll figure something out. What's important is that you find him and that he trains Alrian.
Laura thought that was a good plan, but she didn't trust this mysterious wizard. I can do that. How is it that you can just tell me what to do, she said. Because I'm asking things you already want to do. That doesn't make any sense. It will, in time. I won't hold you up any longer. Good luck, the wizard said. How will I contact you if I need help? Alrian knows how. But he doesn't know about you? He will discover the way. Don't worry about that. Just don't lose that note. It's critical, the wizard said. He gave Laura a short wave and vanished. Gone again. How do I keep getting caught up in these things, Laura wondered. She pocketed the note and thought about how to get out. Not climbing that wall again, she told herself, and headed for the main gate. She noticed that there was only a light presence guarding the gate. Not trying to keep people from going out. It would be easy to sneak past, but the gate itself would be an issue. However, she did notice something peculiar. She crept closer, avoiding the guards and sticking to the darkness. Once she reached the gate, she took a closer look. This is useful, she whispered. There was a square cut into the side of the gate. It looked like it opened. She carefully pushed it to see what it did. The square moved forward, revealing a small opening in the door. Probably used for accepting things through the door or negotiating. I wonder if I could fit, Laura thought. There was only one way to find out. She glanced back and saw that the guards were continuing their patrol, not particularly paying attention to the gate. Here goes. Laura grasped onto the gate frame with both her hands and thrust her head through the square gap. With a little finessing, she was able to get her shoulders through, then she fell out onto the other side. A quick movement as she landed helped soften the blow, and she stood up quickly. There were no signs of movement on the other side of the gate. That was a lot easier. She dusted herself off and walked off into the night, slowly increasing her pace. The crowds had subsided, but she could see small fires in the distance, where some were camping overnight. All they had to do was climb that wall, she thought with a laugh. Quickly weaving through the woods, she found Certain and Alrian seated comfortably leaning against some trees. Alrian had hung a magical light sphere from one of the hanging branches, which illuminated the area nicely. You look like you've had a bit of an adventure, Alrian said, looking up from the books he was reading. Don't get me started. Next time I consider climbing a city wall, just stop me, please, Lara said. That's quite an impressive feat. How did you get down, Certain said. With great difficulty and luck. I'll fill you in on the details, but there are two important things. First, there was a blighter attack in the city. It was due to a tainted one. He was looking for Alrian and me, Lara said. That's not a good sign. What's the other thing? Did you find my parents? Alrian said. Yes, they told me all about the man they discovered. We think the tainted share some sort of mental link and coordinate their movements that way, Lara said. That may explain a lot. Alrian looked deep in thought. We need to better understand our enemy, Certain said. We have news too, Alrian said. What's that? Lara said with concern. Nothing should have happened while she was away. I found another message in this notebook. Take a look. Alrian handed it to Lara to review. Find Ashra in the desert. He will advise you further. Who is Ashra? Lara said. She had a sinking feeling in her stomach that she knew what the answer would be. I have heard that name before. He's a wizard. Hates visitors, which is why he lives in the desert, Certain said. Interesting. Do you know how to find him? Lara said. No, he doesn't like to be found. It's a lead, right. We will figure it out, Alrian said. I wasn't sure what to make of this, but I think it will help. Laura retrieved the slip of paper the mysterious wizard had given her and handed it to Alrian. Where did you get this, Alrian said. Some raving drunk was going on about a wizard in the desert. I thought it would be a good lead, so I stole these directions, she said. This is awfully coincidental. You finding this and me seeing this message... What did that man look like? Alrian was looking at Lara with a questioning gaze. Unremarkable? Maybe he got it from someone else. He had nothing else of interest to say or on him, Lara said. Alrian turned the paper over and handed it to Certain. I can follow these directions. It would make sense to head there before the temple. It's more or less on the way. Additional training sounds quite important to me, Certain said. Then I guess we see where they lead. But I don't like this. I feel like we're being led by the nose, and I don't know by who, Alrian said. Wow, I thought you would be happy with this. It's another wizard, isn't that good? Lara said. 
Sorry, it's not your fault. Why don't you tell us more about what my parents said? There could be something in there that is crucial, Arian said. Lara was happy to do so. She didn't want him thinking too much on how she could have happened upon that information just as the mysterious message was left. At least now she knew for sure who was leaving the notes in Alrian's book. But she still didn't know his identity. Next time I'll find a way. 19. Enter the Desert The next morning Alrian rose early. He didn't sleep well and was anxious to get a move on. I just have to see if there's anything to this wizard, or if it's a trap. I want it over with, Alrian said. We can rush to get started, but we mustn't rush the journey. The desert is a hard place to traverse. I know the way, but we must take care. If we are attacked while we are weakened, it will be disastrous, Certain said. Are there many tainted in the desert? Lara said. It depends on where you go. Usually not, as it is not a good environment for them to survive. I saw more than I expected on this journey, so we should be prepared for anything, Certain said. We won't be able to go through the city, so we may lose some time. Does it matter which way we enter? Lara said. It does, but all our current options are equivalent in utility and danger. This detour won't have much impact, but I do agree we should start now, Certain said. Alrian did a final check, and they left their makeshift campsite. Do we need to stock up on water? Alrian said as they walked. No, provided we take a small amount with us. The wizard will have a source, Certain said. That's if we find him. You said he doesn't like visitors, Lara said. We will find a way. It's too important, Alrian said. Exactly. Besides, you have me. I can survive in the desert, and so will you too, Certain said. They spotted a small, fast-flowing river on their walk and stopped to fill a flask each. Certain paused, looking over his flask. He swapped it with another and then filled it to the brim. What was that about? Alrian said. Certain retrieved the flask he had hidden away. For a long time, this flask here meant something different. It was my supply of alcohol and, and everything that went with that. But now it is something else, something better, he said. Are you using it? Lara said. No, it's my penance, a reminder of my excesses. Certain's voice had a pang of regret. A reminder of how strong you are, Alrian said. Thank you, I will remember that. Certain put the flask away and started off once more. They took a meandering route, avoiding the city and using the best paths available. This took longer than they had initially wanted. Slowly, Alrian saw the terrain transform. The colors of the grass and plants slowly changed, from bright green to washed-out green and yellow. The grass became thinner and shorter, and the trees were also reduced in height. You can see the availability of water decreasing, Certain said, pointing out the surroundings. I was just thinking the same thing, Arian said. Are we close? Lara said. Yes, we are. We have come further than I had expected. We will stop soon, Certain said. Stop? I don't see the desert. How far is it? Lara said. Not much further. It is a little deceptive. However, from here on, it is best to travel at night. We need to rest soon so we can make proper progress when it is cooler, Certain said. You're the expert, Alrian said, slapping Certain on the back. Trust me, it's better this way, Certain said. Alrian was trying to imagine the intensity of the heat, but struggled. I trust you. It's probably going to be one of those things that needs to be experienced to be explained. I can explain, but you won't know. Not really, Certain said. Night works for me, Lara said. We already knew that, Alrian said. Certain let out a small chuckle. Let's make camp up there. It looks relatively sheltered and quiet, he said. They put down their equipment and tried to make the area comfortable for sleeping. Alrian had difficulty getting to sleep, as it was only the afternoon. But sleep eventually found him when he least expected. A firm hand woke him from sleep, and Alrian noticed Certain standing over him. It's time. Great, Alrian said with a start, jumping up. Certain and Laura were ready to go. I see you took the time to get yourself sorted before waking me, he said. You need your beauty sleep, Laura said. Certain had a grin on his face. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll just need a minute. Alrian took his time preparing, not wanting to miss anything. Let's go, Certain said, heading out. Lara and Alrian followed close. How dark will it get, Alrian said. 
traveling by moonlight is possible depending on its size. However, we may need additional light, Certain said. Just let me know, Aurion said. I will, although I suspect you won't need my prompting. We will be entering the desert shortly, Certain said, pointing at a spot in the distance. It was harder to see, but the grasses seemed to be almost completely withered out. There's still some grass or maybe shrubs, Lara said. Yes, that's normal. Not every part is completely sandy, although the overall effect is the same, Certain said. They walked on in silence, taking in the new environment. The ground was shifting more under their feet, gradually becoming less solid. Certain walked with purpose, but still regularly paused to get his bearings. I thought you were the desert master. You seem to be stopping a lot, Lara said. Realizing the folly in having contempt for the desert is usually the last lesson one learns, Certain said, and Lara laughed. Alien stumbled on a small mound that he didn't spot and paused to create a ball of light. He visualized it attaching to an invisible string and floating above them. As he walked, he looked at it and monitored its progress, pleased that it seemed to be behaving as he expected. The light is a big help. It's not usually practical to have one, Certain said. Happy to help. And it'll stop me tripping as well, Alrian said. How can you make sense of these directions, Lara said. They rely on markers and waypoints that only those familiar with the desert would understand. Whoever wrote these knows the place well. Many people would be unable to use these references to find the way, Certain said. Good thing we have you. I've been thinking, and I want your opinion. Do you think this is a setup, Alrian said. Do you mean, are we walking into a trap, Certain said. Yes, exactly. We recently learned that Wraith, as he calls himself, now can communicate and coordinate a network of tainted. What if this lead is just to direct us how he wants? This lead was definitely not from a tainted person, Laura said. Maybe not directly, but maybe it was planted with that person, Arian said. Laura felt confident that he was wrong, but was unable to prove it. I just don't see it, Laura said. Regardless, we can prepare ourselves and look out for signs. It would be very hard to hide that kind of presence in the desert, Certain said. Fair enough. Let's remain cautious. Alrin wasn't convinced that they would really find a wizard out here. Part of him was also anxious that maybe they would. How would a wizard react to him? Especially one that hates company. The walk dragged on, but Certain kept a strong pace that made Alrin feel like they were at least getting somewhere but he had no idea of the distances required, so he just followed along. He played over scenarios in his head for how he would deal with blighters, another shade or even a hostile wizard. That last was the most worrying. He still felt like he lucked out when taking on Branthor and wasn't confident he could handle himself with an experienced wizard. This is all crazy. I shouldn't have to be worrying about wizards. The creatures of the blight are supposed to be the enemy, Alrian thought. Certain paused, reviewing the directions again. He held them up to Aurion's magical light. We are up to the last step. This is unusual. I was sure that nothing lay down this way, but perhaps this is why the instructions are correct, he said. If I wanted to be alone, I would live in a desert in a place where locals thought nothing existed, Laura said. I still keep thinking, what kind of person would do this? Can we even expect help? Aurion said. We shall remain cautious, but there is no need to worry. All types live in the desert. Let us give this wizard the benefit of the doubt, Certain said. You're right. This wizard is going to help one way or another, Aurion said. I'll make sure of that, Laura said, flashing a smile at Aurion. The party turned off and took a right into an even more sparse area of the desert. There were no signs of passage and nothing to mark the way. Yet Certain kept walking with confidence. Slowly but surely, they started going through their water supply. The journey became increasingly difficult, and there were no markers to show how they were progressing, and they could see the sun beginning to rise in the distance. I hope we get there soon. Otherwise, we may be stranded in the sun, Lara said. We have ways of dealing with that, but let's hope we find him soon, Certain said. They trudged on, but soon they saw what looked like a small building in the distance. Finally, Aurion said. It exists. The desert is so tricky, I'm relieved that we made it, Certain said. I thought you were more confident than that, Lara said. I was confident that we were following the directions properly and that we were reaching the proper landmarks. 
However, this wizard is like a myth of the desert. There are many tales of him, but nobody you meet has actually seen him, Certain said. Don't speak too soon, we may be in the same boat. Does that hut look a little deserted to you? Laura said. As they approached, they could see inside the hut. It was tiny and sparse, with a mattress, some blankets, and a table being the only pieces of furniture. A thin layer of dust covered everything, suggesting that the place had been vacant for some time. Certain ran his hand along the surfaces and examined the quantity of dust. This is not unusual for the desert. It could be that someone had just been away for a matter of days. We should not give up hope, he said. Any clues here? Alrian gently probed the mattress to see if it hid anything and looked over the table. I don't see anything to suggest that a wizard lives here, but maybe that's the point. He doesn't like to be visited after all, Lara said. What's that over there? Alrian pointed at the lone window in the hut and what was visible in the distance. It looked like a tree. An oasis. That would explain why he chose this location and why he may not need to spend as much time here, Certain said. Oasis? Those are real, Lara said. Yes, but they are quite rare and well-guarded secrets. They are very easily overwhelmed if overused, he said. I could use a drink, and maybe we will find the wizard there, Alrian said. It's worth a look, Lara said. Of course, but let us approach with caution. There could be traps. Certain led the way, stepping cautiously across the desert sand. Lara and Alrian followed close behind, looking around for signs of danger. Something seems off, but I cannot describe what it is. Stay alert, Certain said. I'm ready, Alrian said. Laura removed her dagger from her jacket and twirled it in her hand. As they advanced, they could see the tree was next to a small pond that was encircled by small green tufts of grass and shrubs. Signs of life, that's promising, she said. We shall see. Certain walked closer and the other two kept pace. As they were about to reach the tree, it started to shimmer. And once they stepped closer still, the tree vanished. Instead, they were confronted with a stone wall. A mirage? Classic, Lara said. I suspected something was off. I didn't sense the amount of life that I expected from an oasis, Certain said. There is something to be said for an appreciation of the classics. How did you find this place? A male voice said from behind them. Alrian spun quickly to see who... 20. An Important Lead Vincent escorted Laura out of the inn and made sure she was safe before returning inside. He navigated through the crowd and sat back down next to his wife. Things are escalating a lot faster than you expected, Silas said. I know. We have underestimated what we are up against. I did not think that Alrian would be intercepted like that, Vincent said. Hopefully after Laura tells them of Wraith's network, they can be more careful. At least they are near the desert now. Yes, it will be easier to hide in the desert and less chance of running into tainted. I don't think they like it in there. Fingers crossed. So what do we do now? Investigate here more or try and meet up with them, Silas said. We're definitely on the radar after that attack and the death of the tainted guard. We would lead them straight to Alrian, wouldn't we? I think so. My gut tells me there's more here. I doubt that Wraith's network would end with one guard. Let's dig around here more and see what we can find. Worst case scenario, all we do is act as a distraction, which still helps them. Sounds good to me. Vincent looked quite satisfied. You're just glad you get to do more blacksmithing. Do you miss it that much? Silas said, making a face at him. No, but it does help me focus. I feel like we have been caught off guard, so I'm glad to slow down a little and feel our way forward, rather than acting rashly. Banging a few things with a hammer is just a bonus, Vincent said. Let's head back then. It is safe to return, right? Yes, there's nothing there, Vincent said. Good. I would find it hard to sleep otherwise, Silas said and stood up quickly from the chair. Vincent walked ahead and they left the inn together. The next morning, Vincent went to find John and made sure the blacksmith was distracted while Silas returned the armor she had borrowed. Why don't you start over there? I've got some pieces that need finishing. Here's a sample of how they should look. John handed Vincent a metallic cylinder that looked like it fit around the arm. Sure, I can follow that. Come grab me if you're unsure. We'll move on to the tricky stuff later, John said. Vincent walked over and placed the finished piece next to the pile of half-finished ones. 
I was pretty sneaky, wasn't I? Silas whispered. You were. Don't blow it now, Vincent said. I'll be around here and there. Have fun, Silas said and quickly crept away. Vincent got to work on the first piece. He could see that it was a simple job and wouldn't require any input from John. He decided to lose himself in the work for a while. After a few hours, he heard some commotion and walked over to investigate. I know for sure that you are selling pieces on the site. Don't even try and deny it, a female voice said. As I have said before, I don't do that. I value this contract, and I have no idea what you are talking about. John looked quite frustrated. As Vincent approached, he could see a female guard standing over the blacksmith. We had a female impersonating a guard wearing a full uniform. We have checked, and this is the only place it could have come from, the female guard said. I'll check again, but everything is here, John walked off. Yes, the guard said, looking at Vincent. I just heard an argument and came over. I'll leave you to it, Vincent said. The guard instantly dismissed him with her eyes and returned to glaring at John. Vincent walked back to his work area and looked around. Where is she when you need her, he said, muttering to himself. Right here, Silas said. Good. Did you hear the argument over there, Vincent said. Yes, hard not to. Do you think it is suspicious? Definitely. Only the man we captured knew I was there. This guard must be tainted as well. You're welcome, Vincent said and returned to his work. That's right. You go back to the blacksmithing and I'll follow her, Silas said. Sounds good to me, Vincent said, grinning. Silas crept away and found a good vantage point to watch the guard. John returned and repeated his story. The female guard spat in disgust and stormed off. Here we go, Silas said to herself. She started walking, keeping a safe distance between herself and the guard. Now where is she off to, Silas wondered. The guard had turned to the right, veering away from the guard building. Silas upped her speed, rushing to the corner so that she would not lose her lead. Once she reached the corner, she peeked around it. The guard was looking back to see if she was being followed, but Silas managed to quickly hide herself. Just as well I was cautious, Silas thought. A few seconds later, she ducked her head out and saw the guard turning another corner. Silas quickly dashed down the street, slowing as she reached the corner and followed the same process. As before, the guard was carefully looking behind. The cat and mouse game continues, Silas whispered. After rounding the next corner, there was a long, straight road. The guard walked quickly, not looking back. Silas made sure that she walked near other people or buildings so that she could hide herself if required. But the guard seemed to have decided that nobody was following and just charged ahead. Silas noticed a building at the end of the street. It had a high, pointed roof with lavish stonework on the walls and a series of steps leading into the entrance. That looks quite formal. This is interesting, Silas said to herself. There was a steady stream of people filing in and out of the building, so Silas upped her pace and entered alongside another group. Inside, she found a large open room with benches all around the sides. It looked like there were public officials working there, making notes and having conversations. She looked around the room, trying to spot the guard. It was almost too late, but she noticed a guard turning into a room at the end. Silas quickly crossed the space and glanced up at the sign. Council chambers. This just gets even more interesting. She stepped inside and looked around. There was no sign of the guard, but a door slammed in the distance. Silas approached the source of the sound. At the end of the hall, there were two doors, one on the left and one on the right. Which one, she wondered as she crept down the hall. It wasn't obvious as she progressed, but she did hear voices coming from one of the rooms. This must be it. Silas checked the other door, and it opened. Nobody was inside. That was lucky, she whispered but she wouldn't be able to repeat her trick of listening in because the rooms were on opposite side of the corridor. She looked up at the ceiling and didn't notice any obvious places to climb up. I just have to risk it, she thought and returned to the hall. She left the door open for the empty room and sidled up to the other door to listen closely. As she pressed closer, she could make out the voices more distinctly. So you have no leads at all then, a male voice said. I am sorry, counselor. I have exhausted all the avenues. It is not apparent how the intruder got access to a uniform, the female guard said. Unacceptable. Wraith will not tolerate this kind of failure. We need to deal with this quickly. 
Do you understand why we are meeting in person? The counsellor said. Yes, because we don't want to broadcast the fact that we have nothing yet. Exactly. Questions are being asked. We need something immediately. What's the best lead? I've cross-examined all the guards. Everything was accounted for and verified. It can't be a guard. It has to be the blacksmith. But he's adamant about not creating more uniforms. Do you believe him? Yes, I do. But maybe someone accessed his stocks. It's the only explanation available, the guard said. Go back there and be friendlier this time. Try and find out how someone could have gained access. Maybe ask about unfamiliar faces showing up. We need to really work this. You don't want to see what happens to people who fail, the counselor said. I understand. I'll go back to the blacksmith with a new approach, the guard said. Silas quickly backed away from the door and returned to the other room. She closed the door as quietly as possible and waited to hear what was happening next. A minute passed by slowly and another, but soon she heard the sound of the other door opening and footsteps proceeding down the corridor. Once she decided that it was relatively safe, she slowly opened the door enough to catch a glimpse of the person leaving. It was the guard, as expected. The counselor must still be inside, Silas thought but she didn't have a name or a face to identify him. She had to decide when to confront him. I can't do it here, it's too public. I'll have to tail him and find an opportunity. She wanted to go warn Vincent that there would be additional questioning, but this lead was too important. She had to follow the trail further. He'll be fine, I'll check in later, she decided, and waited for the counselor to make a move. Within a few minutes, she heard footsteps and a door slamming. She listened to the steps retreating down the hall, then snuck a peek. There was a balding man in a long black robe about to exit the hallway. She quickly retreated back into the room in case he looked back, then entered the hallway. He had already left, so she made her way down the corridor as quickly as possible. She took care leaving the council chambers to make sure she was not watched. It looked safe, so she quickly mingled with a group wandering through the hallway. Searching the crowd, she spotted the counselor nearing the exit. She sped up, ducking in between people and trying not to draw too much attention. I'm just someone late for an appointment, Silas thought. She had to make sure she caught up with the counselor once he left the building to keep on his trail. As Silas left the building, she slowed, then stopped. People were walking in all directions, some of them wearing the same black robe. Again and again, she looked everywhere, trying to find the balding man. Finally, she saw him turn into a side street and rush to catch up. I'm probably going too fast, she thought, but it didn't matter. It was fine for people to notice her. It was so important to find this counselor. He was clearly high up in the group of tainted and would have valuable information. Sellers reached the street he had entered and stopped to assess. She was just in time to watch him enter a house at the end of the street. Hopefully that's where he lives. She walked with more care down the street, trying to fit in. She looked over the houses and noticed that they were all quite large and had gardens. It was clearly a special street reserved for people of importance who also had strong finances. As she arrived at the house, she noticed that it had a large iron gate in front. The gate wasn't locked, but it looked quite noisy. Silas walked up and down and found a smaller section that could be climbed. I wonder how many of these I have climbed in my life, she thought with a laugh. In seconds, she was up and over, landing softly on her feet. She rocked a little and regained her balance. Not as easy as it once was, Silas said to herself. But she had entered the property without alerting anyone. Rather than entering through the front door, she walked down the side of the house and looked for a servant's entrance. About halfway down, she spotted a plain door and tried the handle. It was unlocked. Here we go, Silas whispered and entered the house. She could hear people milling about and the sound of clanking pots and pans. Avoiding the kitchen, she headed towards what she thought looked like more formal spaces. She passed through two sitting rooms and spotted a library at the end of the house. She couldn't hear anything, but decided to investigate anyway. In her experience, rich people liked to pretend the help didn't exist. Libraries were set up for that quite nicely. She padded quietly down the hall, using the long rug to hide her footsteps. She kept her eyes and ears open, but couldn't notice any signs of life. But her instincts told her this was the right place. So she persisted. She couldn't move on until she had eliminated it as an option. 
As she reached the doorway, she noticed that a large reading chair had been moved, and there was a man sitting there looking out at her. Please come in, he said. Not again. I must be getting sloppy. Twice now she had been caught snooping by Tainted. Did you prepare me a chair? She said, acting like she expected it. Sorry, no. I had no time for arranging for additional furnishings. You'll have to remain standing where I can see you, he said. There was a hint of venom in his polite talk. What would you like to discuss, Celis said, giving him a chance to open the conversation. He gave her a positively evil grin. 21. The Mirage The man before them was dressed in light sand-colored robes. His hair was a mixture of black and gray and was tied back but uncut. He had a wild beard and fierce green eyes. The desert wizard himself, Certain said. You have me at a loss. Yes, I am Ashra. Who are you? And I must repeat my question. How did you find this place? We had directions. I'm Alrion and I'm a wizard, Alrion said. I can see that. Very few people know how to get here. I need to find out more about those directions. But for now, why are you here? Ashra said. We're heading to the desert temple so that I can undertake the trial of the monks. I was hoping to get your help, Alrian said. Desert temple, eh? I take it he's one of the monks. Looks a bit out of sorts, though, Ashra said, pointing at Certain. Hello, my name is Certain. I am accompanying Alrian to assist with his quest and will rejoin the monks, Certain said. Then who are you? Ashra said to Lara. The name's Lara. I'm a specialist in the art of acquiring hard-to-get things. I'm also assisting with Alrian's quest, Lara said. A wizard, a thief, and a monk. What an odd bunch. So tell me, what is this quest you are talking about? I will cleanse the blight from the world, Alrian said simply. Ashra was silent for a moment, then burst out laughing. Oh, that's cute. Cleanse the blight from the world. You, you would sooner cleanse the air from it than accomplish that, Ashra said. My grandfather cleansed Avaria. I can recreate his spell. A key part of what I need is at the temple and guarded by the monks, Alrian said. Ashra abruptly stopped laughing and started stroking his beard. Grantheon. Yes, I remember him. No doubt you want to master the power of will. That's what the monks are known for. It would take great will indeed to cleanse the blight. Come back to the hut and tell me more about your journey so far, and I will decide whether I can help you, Ashra said. He started walking off without waiting for an answer. Alri looked at Certain and Lara for input. We've got nothing to lose. Let's see what he thinks, Lara said. Agreed. He seemed to know about the monks. He may even be able to give us additional insights or advice in addition to any wizard training, Certain said. I hope he's not completely crazy, Alrian said and started walking. As they entered the hut, they could see three glasses filled with water and a clear jug nearby, also full. Drink your fill and tell me a story, Ashra said. He settled into some cushions in the corner. Alrian had to look again to trust his eyes. The hut seemed a lot nicer and much more furnished than when they had passed through. Just a parlor trick to confuse any that may stumble through here. Please sit, Ashra said. Alrian found somewhere to sit and began to talk. A few hours later, the three companions had shared their story. Ashra had been quiet and not asked anything. That's it, he said. Yes, Alrian said. You're incredibly lucky. You should have died several times already, Ashra said. You're probably right, Alrian said. No, I'm definitely right. It's not just luck. There's something else at play here. Alrian didn't like the implication. What do you mean, Alrian said. You have the mark of a wizard on you. Is Falric the only one you traveled with? Yes. There was nobody else, Ashra said. He stared intensely at Alrian. Just one thing, Alrian said reluctantly. He retrieved his notebook from his pack and showed it to Ashra. Ah, now this is interesting. It's a wizard communicator. You can share messages anywhere across the world. Where did you get this? I found it in the Wizard Academy. 
As part of my initiation, I was directed to select a relic at random from their store. This was it, Aurion said. Falric knew about it? Yes. When did you receive the first message? After I visited the Pool of Knowledge, after Falric died. Are you sure that Falric died? He was more of a thinker than a fighter. He would know how to use these quite effectively, and he might just continue to assist you with this, Ashra said. I have wondered, but I couldn't find any sign of him. But I can't help thinking that if these messages were from him, he would tell me, Alrian said. Perhaps. Let's leave that as something to puzzle out later. But I definitely believe that a wizard is monitoring your progress. How did you get the directions to come here, Ashra said. I found them, Lara said. Found them? Where? Somebody was boasting that they had insider knowledge on the desert and could find a wizard. I pickpocketed him, Lara said. No, that doesn't make sense. Show me the directions, Ashra said. Certain stood up and handed over the slip of paper. These are too specific, meaning the person who wrote it must have knowledge of this place. Very few do and they would not commit it to paper unless absolutely necessary. Something is wrong, Ashra said. Well, that's what happened, Lara said with an annoyed and defensive tone. If you insist, but I must wonder, who really gave you these directions? Ashra said. He paused and stared off into the distance. Well, either way, we made it here. Are you going to help us? We answered all your questions and told you everything, Alrian said. Maybe. I need to see something first, Ashra said. What? I need to see you in action. Beat me in a fight and I'll consider helping you. Seriously? If I can beat you in a fight, I probably don't need your help, Alrian said. Your journey of learning is never ended. I don't care if you drag from the pool of knowledge. There is always more to learn from others. There's a free lesson. But by requirement stance, you will get nothing from me until you beat me, Ashra said. If that's how it is, I'll just be leaving, Alrian said, standing up quickly. He had pinned so many hopes on finding this wizard, despite not really looking forward to it. But the wizard had just cast doubt on them all and refused to help. He wasn't going to waste his time any further. By all means, show yourself out, Ashra said. Alrian stormed out of the hut and started walking. Lara and Certain quickly caught up to him. You're being too impulsive. We need his help. You almost died fighting Branthor the first time. We couldn't really manage him the second time. What's your plan? Lara said. She's right. Ashra must know a lot of useful information. Maybe there's strategies or special applications of your magic that will be key to our success, Certain said. He's just an arrogant loner who wants to show off. I don't have time for that. The sooner we get to the next trial, the sooner I'll learn something useful. Alrian increased his speed. We need to regroup. We cannot progress without proper water supplies. It is unwise to travel in the heat of the day, Certain said. I've left now. I don't want to go crawling back, Alrian said. We've come a long way, but we can't throw it all away now. Swallow your pride and don't risk our lives because of your childishness, Lara shouted. She stopped walking. Certain stopped beside her. Alrian stopped and looked back at them. Then he looked ahead. Something was off. Alrian walked slowly forward. Unbelievable. Alrian stopped and turned back to his friends. Look at this wall. Does it look familiar? Alrian said. That's the same wall we came across at the Mirage, Certain said. He's messing with us still, Alrian said. I'm impressed, Certain said. Clearly he doesn't want to let you go yet. At least talk to him again. Lara had calmed down and looked Alrian in the eyes. He could see the concern on her face. Looks like I don't have a choice, Alrian said and turned to head back. The other two followed close. Certain marveled at the illusion as they walked. Asha was seated casually on a pillow and he appeared surprised that they had returned. Welcome back, he said. Nice trick, Alrian said. It's not a trick. How do you think I've lived here all these years? So I figured you weren't finished. What else was there to discuss? I know I'm a little unorthodox, and you do seem a bit unsettled by my approach. But this is a necessary step. I must test you in the heat of battle, and you must hold nothing back. Can you do that? I can, 
I just don't understand why, Alrian said. It's not a big thing. You won't be hurt. Is there something else troubling you? Ashra said. He stared at Alrian, which made him feel as if the eccentric wizard could hear all his thoughts. Alrian felt a cold shiver running down his spine. I'm just a little nervous about my power. It's a little wild and I have had very little training. Alrian found that very hard to admit. Don't you worry. That's what I would expect. Do you see an academy around here? Ashra said, gesturing at the barren desert. No? Exactly. Here's an additional piece of information that may interest you. I have been in the Vault of Silence, Ashra said. Aurium was dumbstruck. How interesting. I was not aware of anyone doing that, Certain said. It is not something the monks advertise, perhaps contrary to what you have been told. But that's all I can say, Ashra said. You win. Let's get this over with, Aurion said. Excellent. Follow me, please, Ashra said. He jumped up from his seated position with startling agility and left the hut. Come, everyone, Ashra said, and continued walking. They walked past where the mirage was and continued down a tight, winding path between sand dunes. There were rocky formations holding the sand at bay. Just as the sun was getting to Alrian, Ashra stopped suddenly. There was a fork in the path. There was a branch off to the left. Your friends should go left. It will lead to a vantage point up on the ridge. We will continue down, he said. We'll be watching, Lara said to Alrian and started off. Certain slapped Alrian on the shoulders and followed close by. Once they had left, Ashra spoke again. I have been where you are now. I have seen the Academy and what it can offer, and it's a fantastic environment. But I wrestled with my power the same way you are now, with persistence and experimentation and seeking whatever knowledge I could find, he said. He poked Alrian in the head. I don't know how that works up there, but I can sense your apprehension. You have started to do things that you are not aware of, correct? Ashra said. That's right, Alrian said. Don't worry. Your mind will protect you. You have to quiet it and let it do its work. Where we are going is a safe place and protected. Don't worry about me or the environment. You must treat this like you are in a life or death battle. Otherwise, I cannot help you, Ashra said. If you insist... Alrian said and followed Ashra down into the natural arena. He wasn't sure if he was more nervous or more excited. But despite his reluctance, he knew Ashra was right. He needed to test himself before his next battle. 22. An Offer Alrian stood still, watching his opponent. Ashra stood with the relaxed stance at the opposite end of the natural arena. A gust of wind pushed sand and dust along the hard ground. Whenever you are ready, Ashra said loudly. Alrian heard the man but wasn't sure how to start. He thought back to how they had launched their assault of the shade version of Branthor and how ineffective it had been. Forget about that, just let go, he told himself. Shuffling his feet, he adjusted his stance and started to gather his spark. It was time to begin. Alrian began by throwing some ripples of force at Ashra, hoping to unsettle him, or at least make him do some defense. Ashra must have seen them coming, because a wall of earth arose before him and easily absorbed the attack. Earth, too. How interesting. Branthor had been strong with that, and it had proven hard to deal with. How about this, then, Alrian thought, preparing a fire spell. He focused an intense beam of fire and force and projected it at the wall of earth. There's no way it will withstand this, Alrian thought. He was curious how the other wizard would counter it. He didn't have to wait long for the answer. As the fire began to hit the earth wall, it became wet. There seemed to be water seeping out of the wall, deflecting the heat and turning it into steam. How, Alrian wondered, confused by what he was seeing. He let the spell go and the area around Ashra was now covered in a haze of steam. As Alrian was readying another spell, the ground beneath him parted, causing him to stumble. As he looked down, he saw a jet of water spray up. He had no time to dodge it, and the force of the spray knocked him over. Alrian scrambled to his feet and watched the ground for more attacks. There was nothing else yet. I have to do more, Alrian thought. He paused for a moment, then stoked a spark once more. He channeled it into a huge wall of fire, completely separating both halves of the arena. That should buy me some time, he thought. 
and started to move slowly to avoid being a sitting target. As he moved, he had an idea of how to attack. First, he created a large ball of fire and threw it into the air, holding it high above the wall of flame. Show yourself! Are you scared of my next attack? Alrian shouted. He could see Ashra's silhouette standing on the other side of the wall of fire. Then it began to move. Alrian stared in disbelief. Ashra was walking through the wall of fire. When he emerged, Alrian let out a surprised gasp. The figure before him was no longer Ashra. It looked like a shade. The figure shrugged off the flames that had come from the firewall and focused its gaze on Alrian. This is not possible, Alrian said to himself. In a panic, Alrian increased the intensity of the wall of fire, then flung down the fireball at the shade. The fireball flew fast, but stopped suddenly, as if it were being held by another force. Now you go down, Alrian whispered to himself. He concentrated all the flames, heat, and power of the wall of fire into a wave that was half as high, but twice as powerful, and sent it forward. He saw his fireball deflect aside, but his wave of fire continued unrestricted. This may actually work, he thought, ready to disperse the flames once they started to get too close to him. However, the flames passed through the shade and did no discernible damage. As Alrian prepared to extinguish the flames, a huge shift in the ground occurred. A large amount of earth rose up towards him. It was a dome of reinforced sand that not only smothered the flame, but quickly enclosed Alrian within. Alrian furiously threw waves of force at the sand structure, trying to break a hole in it. But the sand absorbed each attack and stayed resilient. This is not happening. You have lost, Ashra's voice said from outside the dome. No, Alrian shouted. He channeled everything he had into one last attack. He poured his fear, frustration, and embarrassment, and the rest of his spark into a modified wave of force. It started as a white-hot glowing orb above him, and it expanded out quickly. It shimmered and exploded outwards, obliterating the sand prison and everything in the area. Alrian fell to the ground, exhausted. As the dust settled, he looked around him at what had just happened. A spherical shape was neatly cut out of the sides of the arena, and the surface was now perfectly flat, like it had been swept and polished. On one ridge, Alrian could see Ashra standing tall, and Lara and Certain were crouched behind him. What did I do? Alrian rose to his feet and stumbled, so he dropped back to the ground and sat down, waiting for his friends to return. Lara and Certain had concerned looks on their faces. Ashra had a blank look that was indecipherable. You are not ready, he said to Alrian. I know. I don't think you do. Where did you learn how to craft a light bomb? I don't know. It must have come from the pool, Alrian shrugged. It was as good a guess as any. Partial knowledge is incredibly dangerous. You very nearly killed your friends. Such a spell is not taught lightly, and much caution is used in its practice and application. You don't even know what you did, do you? I know enough to recreate it, but you're right. It was all instinctive. You have good survival instincts. That attack would certainly have destroyed your enemy or forced him to retreat. But the cost is too great. If I were not here to shield your friends, they would be gone, Ashra said. Alrian let that sink in. I'm sorry, but what are you? Alrian said. I am a wizard. What did you expect? But the shade? An illusion to test you. It caused quite a stir, I can see. I was actually up on the ridge with your friends for the majority of the battle. My instincts are pretty good too, Ashra said. He was commenting on what was happening, which helped us follow along. Lucky he was there to protect us. What about next time, Lara said. I'm really sorry. Maybe I can work out controlling this spell for next time, Aurion said. You will not, Ashra shouted. Why? It's too dangerous. It cannot be easily controlled. You should forget that you even know it. What do I do then? I have no effective spells against Wraith, the, the creature that Branthor has become. Alrian felt incredibly frustrated. I will train you and show you how to harness the power of earth and water. You have too few tools at your disposal. You will then? Yes, on one condition. Which is? You never use a spell you don't understand, where there is the potential for friendly casualties. 
I never quite understood what the legend of the Pool of Knowledge were about, but now I know for sure. You have everything ever used and recorded stuffed into that mind of yours. Anything could come out. You cannot let yourself lose control. The risk is very high. This is why I will train you. It would be incredibly irresponsible otherwise. Who knows what you could do, Ashra said. I accept your condition. But first I have a question. Yes? How did you do water spells? And how useful will they be in the desert? Aurea said. Ashra laughed and even certain chuckled. <laughs> there is much water in the desert, some in the air, but most of it is deep underground. You just need to know how to harvest it. I imagine the desert wizard is quite adept at that, Certain said. You're quite correct. It is also a rather important ingredient in my illusion spells. Illusion spells require water? Of course. Once I explain, it will make perfect sense. But for now, let's return to the hut and rest, Ashra said. He leaned down and offered a hand to Alrian. The young wizard accepted it and rose again to his feet, a bit more steadily this time. Do you need assistance, Certain said. No, I'm all right now. Each step, I regain some strength, Aurion said. Very well, we are here to help, Certain said. They walked together, following Ashra back to the hut. The hut was cool and comfortable compared to the intensity of the heat outside. How long have you lived here, Aurion said. Many years. I don't fit in well with society. Your grandfather approached me back in the day and offered me a place in the academy but I declined and stayed here, living out my days in peace, refining my spells and helping the odd traveler. Secretly, of course, Ashra said. The stories are true, Certain said. Yes, well, some of them at least. What stories, Lara said. Tales of travelers who are lost, thirsty, and unable to move. They find themselves in a mysterious oasis, and a voice tells them to refresh and guides them on the path out. They've even given a name to the voice. Which is, Lara said, caretaker of the desert. That's you, the man who doesn't like people, Aurion said. I didn't say I helped everyone, just the ones I came across that I can't avoid helping. It gives me a way to practice my craft, Ashra said. On your own terms, Aurion said. Exactly. I don't want every man and his dog wandering out here and forming an orderly line at my front door. It's more fun this way. When does training start? Tomorrow. I know you're in a rush, but you need to recover today so we can do it properly. That's fine. I understand. Maybe you can at least explain a bit about the illusion spell then? I may as well. And it may benefit your friends to know a little about it too. Have you ever seen a rainbow? Ashra said. Yes. They're created by the light passing through water and splitting into distinct colors. Building upon this basic principle, you can make the light do whatever you want. With a few tricks to complete the illusion, you can fool people into believing that your image is real. Wow, I hadn't thought about it that way. Knowledge is so important as you are discovering. It is the gateway to the formerly impossible, Ashra said, giving them a wry smile. Sounds like something I could use, Lara said. I'm sure you could. Unfortunately, there's very little that can be accomplished by knowledge and will. You need the power of spark to fuel these spells but knowing the principles may help you to see through the illusions of others and understand the limitations of what Aurion will be able to do, Ashra said. True, but I'm definitely disappointed, Lara said. Sorry, that's just how it is. The wizards get the interesting toys, Ashra said. Why don't you come with us? You can train me on the way and escort us to the desert temple, Aurion said. Absolutely not, Ashra said without hesitation. Why not? This is my home here, and I feel a responsibility for aiding in your training. But I will not be pulled into your quest. It is yours alone. Besides, as I mentioned before, I think there is already a wizard following your progress. I can't convince you? Nope. This is the way it must be. If you want more help, figure out who that wizard is that's already involved, Ashra said. He gave Aurian a cryptic smile. You've figured something out, haven't you, Aurian said. Maybe, maybe not. But all of you should rest and prepare. Tomorrow we begin, Ashra said. He gestured at the room, pointing out food, water, and cushions. Then he walked out of the hut. Such a strange man, Certain said. But he will help in some way. That's what counts. Aldrian pondered what kind of training he would receive. 
From early impressions, it would be quite different to what he received from Falric. 23. Impending Danger Vincent put down his tool and wiped the sweat from his brow. John was sure working him hard. I guess he's trying to get back into the good graces for the guards. They seemed pretty persistent with their questioning before. Thinking back, he realized that he hadn't seen Celis for a while either. It's not like her to dally. Maybe she actually found something, Vincent mused. He wandered around to see what John was working on. Hello there, Vincent. How are you doing today? He said. Great. I finished up those pieces you asked for. Vincent pointed over at his completed work. Really? You're pretty fast. I must admit I wasn't sure what to expect. I have a lot of experience, just not in these. It's been a good exercise, Vincent said. You've done way more than I thought. I'll have to give you some gold to compensate you. Don't be silly. You're letting me stay. That's payment enough. Earlier, was everything all right? What ended up happening with that guard? Oh, I really don't know what their problem is. Everything here is business as usual. I did like the tone either. John seemed quite hurt by the accusatory manner of the conversation. Yeah, they didn't seem particularly friendly. Lots of accusations being thrown around. Are they always like that? No, not generally. No, they aren't the friendliest folk, but generally politer and by the book. Something must have really stirred them up. John heard footsteps nearby and turned to look at who was approaching. Speaking of which, he said and stepped forward. Vincent looked over and noticed a female guard approaching. Hello again, blacksmith. How are you? She said. She flashed a smile that Vincent was certain was purely false. Same as before, busy. To what do I owe this pleasure? John said. I realized I was a little harsh earlier and wanted to come apologize. You have been a trusted partner to the guard for a long time, and I didn't give you due respect. To explain my actions a little more, I would just like to add that we're under a lot of pressure. It doesn't excuse my actions, but I hope it provides some context, she said. John looked to be swayed by her words, but Vincent was more skeptical. That's good of you. Not enough folk take responsibility for their actions these days, John said. Absolutely. I don't think I was properly introduced to your colleague before, the guard said. Vincent, nice to meet you, Vincent said, offering his hand. The guard took off her gauntlet and shook his hand. Her grip was firm, a little too firm. Vincent was used to strong shakes, and with his strength could crush a hand if he wanted, but he was surprised. Glinda, nice to meet you also. You are new here, she said. Yes, he joined recently, helping me get through the additional work. He's been a big help, John said. Been in town long, Glinda said. Not that long. Looking to pick up some new skills and work on some more interesting pieces. I've done enough horseshoes for a lifetime, Vincent said, chuckling. Glinda smiled, but continued her questioning. Of course. Have you seen anything suspicious around? Maybe you've left things where they shouldn't have been, she said. Can't say I have. It's been quiet here. John, have you seen anything left where it shouldn't be? Vincent said. No, everything's been where it should. I even double-checked today just to make sure, he said. Of course. I just need to make sure I leave no stone unturned. This is quite a high-pressure environment right now, Glinda said. John nodded sympathetically. Tell me about it. I've got huge orders to fulfill and no time to do it. The work is detail-oriented, so it's incredibly time-consuming, he said. I understand. Please think about it and let me know if you hear anything. You can come to the guard station and ask for Glinda, Glinda said. Will do. Thank you for coming back. I really value a good working relationship with the guards, John said. And we value your work, too. Good day, Glinda said and left. What did you make of that, Vincent said. She's had to change her tune, probably due to someone higher up getting annoyed. She was almost convincing, but you could see through it all. I agree completely. She clearly could care less about you, but had to come back and be politer. One to watch out for. Wise words. You had enough for the day? Yes. If you don't mind, I'd like some time to explore the city and rest. Vincent scanned the background and took note of the direction in which Glinda had left. Not a problem. You've done a day's work anyway. Let me get you a few gold to enjoy yourself. John reached for his pouch. No, I insist. If you're really adamant at the end, we can figure something out. But for now, I'm happy with the experience. It's invaluable, Vincent said. 
As you wish. Have a good rest. See you tomorrow, John said. Thanks, you too, Vincent said, and returned to his work area. He put everything away and changed clothes. If I rush, I can catch up to her, Vincent thought. He was worried about not seeing Celis again, and decided that Glinda was his best avenue. He jogged along the street, trying to catch sight of the guard again. She wasn't headed towards the guard station, but in the opposite direction. He considered trying to follow her, but decided that it wasn't the best idea. Being direct would suit him better. Once he was within range, he shouted. Glinda, have you a moment? Vincent said. The female guard stopped and turned around. She had an annoyed look on her face, but forced it away when she saw Vincent. Yes, of course, she said. Great. I was thinking about what you said and thought of something that might help. I did see a woman around the other night. I didn't think anything of it, but since I saw her more than once, I remembered her face. It could be nothing, but... This is fantastic, Lead. Let me think for a moment. Glinda seemed to stare off into space for a while. Suddenly she refocused on Vincent. Would you be able to recognize her if you saw her, she said. Absolutely. Come with me, then. We could definitely use your help, Glinda said. Happy to help, Vincent said with a smile. The guard walked off with purpose, and Vincent followed close behind. Do you have this woman in custody, Vincent said. No, but we have a suspicious woman that is our main suspect. You could provide the additional verification we require, Glinda said. This is not good. What is Celis mixed up in? It could be a coincidence, but it really seemed like they had Celis and wanted to confirm she was the one they were after. That strange pause and look from the guard. Maybe that's what they look like when they communicate, Vincent thought. It was a good theory, and they suspected the guard was tainted. Now he just had to think about what to do if his suspicions were right. He was definitely walking into a dangerous situation. He mused over the scenario as they walked. Vincent noticed a disruption up ahead. There was a shape moving fast through the crowd of people. From the reactions of the people shifting and complaining, it was coming towards them. Suddenly a shape broke out from the crowd and leapt at Glinda. It was a tiny girl with short brown hair. She tackled Glinda, and the guard caught the girl and swung her into a more comfortable position. Baby girl, I am working right now. Where's the rest of your friends? Over there with the teacher. They're talking about the trees. It's so boring. If you pay attention, you may learn something interesting. I have to escort this gentleman somewhere, so please rejoin your friends, and I will see you after work. Sorry, Vincent said, shrugging his shoulders and apologizing to the young girl. She responded by playfully poking her tongue out at him. All right, I guess I can do that. See you later, the girl said jumped back to the ground and tore off with fantastic speed back through the crowds. She's quite energetic, that's good. Such a nice age, Vincent said. Thanks. I take it you have kids, Glinda said. Just the one. But he's older now, doing his own thing. No more running hugs, Vincent said with a chuckle. Yeah, those can't last, can they? Glinda said. Her tone of voice had changed, and she was silent for the rest of the walk. Maybe we've all misjudged her. What could an ordinary person do when put in an extraordinary situation? What if she had to play along to keep her daughter safe? He's with me, Glinda said, and Vincent broke out of his inner thought. They were in front of a manor house with a large gate and guards. This looks like trouble. He started to focus on the job ahead. Glinda led him down a side passage and into the house. Vincent could tell the house was home to a very important person. It was richly furnished and had extremely elaborate floorings and paintings. I hope she's here. In here, please. Glinda didn't even look at Vincent while she opened the door. He stepped inside and saw it was a drab gray room with no furnishings. He could see Silas sitting in the corner. He rushed over immediately. Did they hurt you? He said. No, I'm fine. I refused to talk, so they threw me in here. I think they were planning something else, but they suddenly changed their minds. Good. When you didn't return, I told the guard that I saw a woman sneaking around so that they would bring me in. It worked, Vincent said softly. I see you recognize her, perhaps even know her, a sarcastic voice said from the doorway. Vincent looked up and saw a well-dressed man in ornate robes addressing them. Glinda had retreated into the corridor and had turned to leave. And who might you be, Vincent said. None of your concern, he said. He's a counselor, Silas said. Corrupt official. That's a bit of a cliché, isn't it? Couldn't help yourself, Vincent said. 
The counselor pursed his lips but suppressed an outburst. I am quite pleased. We have the spy and her accomplice in our custody. Wraith will give a lot to have his hands on you, <laughs> the counselor said with a dark laugh. He continued to smirk, then slammed the door. Vincent stood up and examined the room. It looked solid and the door was heavy and metal. There was a keyhole, though. Do you think you can pick this, he said to Silas. Probably, but I don't want to try just yet. We haven't gotten the information we need. That counselor runs the show around here. Looks like it. That guard reported in to him. She's a piece of work, isn't she? I had thought that too, but we ran into her daughter on the way here. It showed another side of her. Maybe she's just caught up in this. But she's tainted, I know that for sure. Salus looked adamant and quite irate. Yes, but do you think that's by choice? Especially with a daughter to look after, Vincent said. Salus started to speak, but stopped. She looked thoughtful. I hadn't considered that. You could be right, she said. I think I am, at least on this. Do you have a plan? Yes. Let's appear like we can't escape and see what they have in store for us. They appear quite confident. They didn't take anything from me, Silas said. Sure, we can give them a hard time if they are asking for it. I just hope we get something out of this. Did you have anything better to do? Silas said with a laugh. I don't suppose that I do. At least we're here together. Vincent was all jokes and comfort, but he didn't feel right. These people were more dangerous than they appeared. But for now he would wait and see what opportunities were presented. 24. Sand and Water Arian followed Ashra out into the oasis. As you know, this is an illusion. I'll demonstrate, Ashra said. He snapped his fingers and the lush scenery disappeared and was replaced by the desert, some rubble, and a stone wall. It's still amazing to see, Arian said. Yes, it's a neat trick, but very difficult to do. We're not going to start with that, and we may not even get there. But at least I will help you understand the principles at work and how to get started with manipulating water. The first thing we need to do is to tap into your senses, Ashra said. He sat down on the ground and directed Alrian to join him. It's really hot, he said. It is, but it's not dangerous. Your reaction to the heat can be managed. It's just another sense, something that will come easier once you complete the Vault of Silence. Ashra paused for dramatic effect. Can you tell me more about that? No. Concentrate on what we are here to do. Place your hand on the ground like this, Ashra said, demonstrating by placing his own palm on the ground. Done. Now, there's a large reservoir of water below us, but it's deep. You need to visualize a drop of water falling from your palm through the earth and rejoining the water below. Imagine that single drop rippling through the calm surface of the water and sounding like the toll of a high-pitched bell, Ashra said. Alrian concentrated hard but struggled to do so. The only water he could imagine leaving his palm was his sweat from the extreme heat. I can see that you are struggling. I'll help a little, Ashra said. He snapped his fingers again and a large tree put them in shade. Alrian felt cooler and more focused immediately. He focused again, visualizing the droplet of water passing through the layers of earth and dripping into a large reservoir. He could hear the bell-like chime of the water echoing in the space, and his mind filled with the awareness of the body of water. Yes, that's it. Draw it up into your palm, Ashra said. Alrian didn't know how to do that, but he could imagine it. He pictured himself scooping a handful of water and saw it materialize in his hand. Wow, my hand is wet, Alrian said with surprise. He lifted his hand and saw the water below it sink back into the ground. He felt the wetness of his hand and was amazed. But how? Can anyone do that? He said. No, you need spark for that. But the heavy lifting is done by your mind and visualization. How are you feeling? Ashra said. Refreshed, which makes me wonder where the shelter came from, Alrian said, looking around. It's all in your mind. Ashra said, snapping his fingers. The shade and shelter vanished, and the sun was beating down on Alrian again. Do you believe that I can create shelter and destroy it with merely a thought? No. Alrian could almost believe it, though, but he would have felt silly to admit that. Then how did I do it? An illusion? Precisely. But how did you feel when I did it? 
I felt like I was cooler, sheltered, and I could focus better, Aureus said. Exactly, and yet the same amount of sun was hitting you, and the ground was just as hot. But your perception changed, so you felt more comfortable. Let that sink in, Ashra said. He stood up and paced around the area. Aurion was amazed by the revelation. Seems like there's a lot you can do with illusions, Aurion said. There certainly is, but they are very difficult. We'll only be able to lay down the groundwork before you leave. Why? I can't keep you long, a day or two at most, and we also need to work on other things. For now, I want you to fill this bowl, Ashra said. He retrieved a plain circular bowl and placed it down in front of Aurion. Fill it with water? Yes, you can draw it, so let's gather it, Ashra said. Sure, let's give this a go. Aurion concentrated once more and began the visualization. Hours passed, and Aurion had finally filled the bowl. I feel like I have sweated enough to fill it twice over, he said. You also lost some to the heat of the desert, Ashra said. That makes me feel a bit better. Good. You did well. Now drink it and let's move on, Ashra pointed at the water. Drink it? Isn't that a waste? Do you see any other water around here? <laughs> we can't have you fainting on me, Ashra said, laughing. Aurion drank the water and it seemed particularly refreshing. You can work on that more as you travel but water is an essential element in many different spells. Next, we will work on earth manipulation. You need to understand how to use it and how to counter it, Ashra said. He walked away and made a motion with his hands like he was pulling up the earth. A small mound of dirt piled up in front of him. This should be easier for you. It's developing an affinity with the earth, then using force to manipulate it. You seem to be pretty good at using force through the air. This is just a different application. Ashra said. Sounds sensible, Aurion said. It is. Try it now. Focus yourself and gather up a pile of dirt like mine, Ashra said. Aurion looked at the ground and gathered his spark, fueling the fire within. He sent his force at the ground and imagined drawing out the earth into a mound. However, the opposite happened. He managed to fling the dust everywhere. He could hear Ashra laughing amidst it. That's an effective escape tool, but not quite what we're after. Pull, not push, he said. That's what I was trying to do, Aurion said, annoyed with himself. You need to think about what you are doing, and not just assume that a simple change in your thinking will alter the result, Ashra said patiently. Aurion thought over what the older wizard had said, and decided to try again. He broke down his actions into smaller steps. It was working. He could sense that the process was working differently, and slowly but surely he created a small dust pile. That's better. See what I mean? Ashra said. Yes, there are fundamental steps that are different that I didn't alter the first time. Yes, your instincts are good, but you can't shortcut everything. But you see this pile, it's not useful. It has no strength or structure, Ashra said, kicking his pile of dirt. It dispersed without effort. He focused again and created a small wall of the same height. Come and examine this, he said. Alrin walked over and felt the wall with his hand. It's solid, he said. Good. And what else? It's not as dry. Is there water within it? Good. The sand and dirt here is so dry it is harder to maintain forms with it. A bit of water to bind it works wonders. Now you try and build a wall, he said. Alrian looked unsure but looked back down at the ground and started to concentrate. He started to assemble the pile of dirt and place his hand on it to assist with drawing the water. And it worked, but not the way he had hoped. The water pulled into the middle of the pile, muddying it and not assisting with any structural integrity. That's quite a common problem, Ashra said. How do I fix it? Aurea said. Less water and more distributed. You need to find a way to draw the water with more finesse. A pool of it doesn't help, as you can see. Is there a trick to it? Of course, but it's something you need to puzzle out, Ashra said. He disassembled his wall and created himself a chair to sit in. He sat back, crossed his legs, and watched Aurion work. Show off, Aurion thought. He had to figure out how to make the wall work. He could see how useful the technique was. I need to first figure out how to draw less water, Aurion said to himself. He started by practicing variations of how he drew the water, but instead of water forming into a greater body, he imagined thin, wispy strands of it traveling through the air. He used the strands to define blocks and bind them together. It started working. 
His pile of dust and sand started to form into something with more structure, even though it wasn't particularly neat. That's the way, Ashra said. Once Alrian had finished, the desert wizard stood up and walked over. He kicked the wall, and it practically disintegrated. Needs a bit more strength, he said with a chuckle. Just a tiny bit, Alrian said, sharing a smile. You done well. Let's rest for a while, Ashra said, heading back to his little hut. Alrian followed closely, pausing to look back at the remnants of his small wall. They found Lara and Certain lounging in the hut, avoiding the heat. Aren't you hungry? We ate hours ago, Lara said as they approached. Alrian hadn't realized how much time had passed. No, although I can definitely eat now. Too much concentration required, Alrian said, flopping down onto one of the cushions. How's he doing? Certain said to Ashra. Fairly well. I don't have a comparison because I don't teach others. But I think he's getting the principles, which is the most important part. We will practice more today on what we have learned and try a few new things tomorrow, Ashra said. How long will it take? Alrian said. Years. But you get two days with me. You'll be leaving tomorrow evening. How is that going to be enough? Time is against you. Your enemy has been one step ahead the entire time and knows everything you do since he has also drunk from the pool of knowledge. Have you considered that? Ashra said. Alrian felt defensive immediately. Sure, but I still need to prepare. He's practically invincible. There is always a way. All I can do is help you start down the path. You must follow it yourself. Be prepared for anything is my best advice, he said. Alrian ate quickly and took the opportunity to rest out of the heat. Just as he became comfortable, Ashra abruptly stood up. Time to get back to work. You have rested enough, he said. Have fun, Lara said. You too. I hope I don't miss anything, Alrian said, trying to make a joke. We shall keep a detailed log, Certain said, getting in on the joke. Alrian shook his head at the lameness of the reply and followed Ashra back to where they had been training. The hours passed quickly once more, and Alrian refined his ability to draw water and form the earth into a simple wall. He felt pleased by that, but wasn't sure if it would be effective for anything useful. That's enough for today. Let's join the others, Ashra said. Together they walked back to the hut and found Lara and Certain in the same spot. It looked like they hadn't moved at all. Having a nice time, Alrian said. It's not too bad. I could get used to this. I'd get bored, though, I think, Lara said. Some additional time to rest and recover is quite important. I would advise it for you if we had the capacity to spare it, Certain said. Someday, perhaps. I've been meaning to ask, where do you get this food from? Alrian pointed at the various breads and biscuits and other food that was available. I do leave the hut occasionally, you know, but I do also have to provide for myself quite a bit, Ashra said. He walked over to a corner of the hut and lifted the dirty brown rug there. Underneath was a trap door. This is interesting, Lara said, jumping up immediately. Ashra opened the trap door and revealed a ladder going down into the ground. He started to descend and the others followed close. Alrian found himself in a giant cavern. There were stores of food on shelves carved into the walls, benches and other furnishing. Two fire pits were in the middle of the room. This is your kitchen then, Certain said. That's it. I use a few shortcuts, but otherwise it keeps me busy. I usually sleep down here as well when it gets particularly cold. This is incredible, Laura said, walking around the room. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is my home, so I need a few things. I can't live off the wind and sand, you know, Ashra said. Certain laughed. Aldrin, recover as best you can. We have an early start tomorrow, Ashra said, starting to prepare a meal for dinner. Alrin awoke suddenly to Ashra's face in close proximity. Time to start. We eat later, Ashra said. Alrin rose quietly and they left Certain and Lara asleep. A short walk later, they were back to the training area. First thing today, I want you to build a curved wall. Same principles as yesterday, but more complexity in the construction, Ashra said. He demonstrated by building a wall that curved slightly towards him. You used something similar to enclose me in the fight, Alrin said. Exactly. That's the end game for a technique such as this. It can be used for many different things. Enclosing an enemy, shielding a target, hiding things, or protecting them from harm. I don't expect you to master it now, but I want you to understand the principles, Ashra said. Alrian could see the benefits and threw himself into the practice. 
His few two attempts were barely curved at all. When Ashra chided him for being too cautious, Aurion changed his approach and made a wall that couldn't stand at all. But the extreme curvature did teach him something about the technique. He ended up with something similar to what Ashra had built eventually. I think you're beginning to understand. Still lacking strength, Ashra commented, collapsing the wall with his palm without exerting any effort. What can I do to improve that, Aurion said. More compacting of the sand, injecting more spark into the binding process. It takes a bit of experimentation to understand how it works. Ashra did another quick demonstration. I see, Aurion said, preparing to try again. Leave that for now. I have another thing you must learn. Wait here a moment, Ashra said. He walked off back to the hut and returned soon after. He was holding a large red cushion. The color was a little faded, but it was still a bright red. You're going to make this cushion blue, Ashra said. Really? Yes. Observe, Ashra said. He waved his hand over the cushion, and it looked vibrant blue color. Wow, that was quick. Come over here, Ashra said. Alrin walked around, and Ashra directed him to look at the cushion from behind. It's red, Alrin said. Yes, it is. The first rule of an illusion is that you need to understand how it will be viewed, Ashra said. Is it possible to completely cover something, Alrin said. Yes, but it requires you to consider all the angles and prepare appropriately. The spell becomes much more complex. It's a trade-off between the quality of an illusion and the effort of creating and maintaining it. So you can't just create it and leave it? You can, there are ways, but it lacks the nuance that your mind brings to it. Suitable for things that would not get close scrutiny, but the effect eventually fades. For now, though, let's just focus on something that you must create yourself, Ashra said. How do I do it? You draw water like we have practiced, but you imagine it as a light spray intersecting with the air and the light, bending the rays. Then you inject your vision into the water and create the illusion. Sounds tricky, Aurion said, doubt entering his voice. It is, but it's incredibly useful. Just try to make this cushion green, Ashra said. I'll do it. Alrim reminded himself that he had come a long way and already learned some new skills. This was just another one. He concentrated and found the underground water reservoir, drawing the water once more. He tried to disperse it and use it as a fine blanket in front of the cushion. It looks like you're wetting it. Finer again and not so close, Ashra said. Alrim doubled his efforts and kept trying. He kept the vision in his head completely clear. The cushion was not blue, it was green. You're getting it? Keep going, Ashra said. He could see that the pillow was starting to appear green in places where Alrian had been successful. As he watched, the cushion slowly alternated between the two colors in constantly changing patches. Then all of a sudden, it locked in, and the cushion was green. That's it. Now just open your eyes, Ashra said. Alrian opened his eyes and saw the cushion was still blue. Come around here and look, Ashra said. Alrin walked slowly, trying to maintain his focus. As he took the last step, he cautiously looked over at the cushion. It's green, Alrin shouted in excitement. In that instant, the illusion dropped and the cushion was blue once more. Well done. Now you just need to practice some more. By the end of the day, I need you to be able to make this cushion appear any color I specify from any direction, Ashra said. Alrion felt exhausted already from the effort. It wasn't just a case of drawing on a spark. The focus and concentration required were huge. I just didn't expect it to be so tiring, he said. That's why will is such a key component of magic. The more you train and enhance it, the less effort it takes to create and maintain all these spells that require your mind's focus. Raw power is not always the answer, as you are no doubt finding out, Ashra said. Alrin nodded with understanding. He had discovered vast tracts of power, but Ashra had easily beaten him, defeated by the desert wizard's superior will and training. Alrin had to improve in all areas if he was going to succeed. Almost there, Alrin whispered to himself, then threw everything back into his training. 25. Bunkering Down Alrion stumbled twice while walking back to the hut. 
Extreme exhaustion was making every step a challenge. At least the heat is dropping, he thought. The relative cool of the hut was incredibly soothing, and he quickly dropped down onto one of the pillows. Tough day, Lara said. Alrian just nodded. He did well, but you'll need to let him rest a few hours before you leave, Ashra said. What did you learn today? Certain said. Basic illusions? I can make that cushion appear a different color, Alrian said, pointing at a cushion at random. Can you show me? Lara said. Alrian just groaned. He's a little tired. I'm sure he'll perk up and give you a demonstration later, Ashra said. You seem fine, Lara said. I have a little more practice. Alrin has been doing this the hard way. The burden of that extreme focus has worn him out. I'm sure Certain understands what I mean. Ashra gave Certain a knowing look. Yes, until you achieve competence, then mastery. Exerting the will is very draining. We had a little exercise demonstrating that a few days ago, Certain said. And I was the winner, Lara said. That doesn't surprise me, Ashra said with a laugh. He disappeared downstairs and Lara followed him. Don't worry, it will get easier, Certain said. I don't doubt it. I just can't understand it right now, Aurion said. Yes, your mind is too tired, but you are strengthening it every day, so don't worry. Maintaining your will is a constant effort. You cannot just achieve a milestone, then ignore it. But you're a monk. Surely you just have it now, Aurion said. In some ways, yes, but in others, no. Let me show you something. Certain removed a small flask from his robes and handed it to Aurion. It was metallic and had the symbol of the monk order on it. What is this, Aurion said. It was made for the monks by craftsmen who they had saved in the desert. It was originally intended for water, but it was too heavy and impractical for daily use. So it was instead filled with a strong alcoholic spirit and kept in storage. And you took it when you left? Yes. I don't know why. It seemed like an even worse thing to do on top of everything else. And I drank from it nearly every day, just a drop to make sure I could keep it as long as possible. But since I met you, I stopped. A lightness broke up the sadness on Certain's face. He looked hopeful. You haven't drunk from it since then? No, there's still some left. Every day I look at the flask and I am tempted to drink from it, just for a taste. But every day I stop and remind myself that this symbol of my failure can be a sign of my success. If I can return to the monks and show there is still alcohol left in this flask, then I can prove to them that I overcame my weakness and strengthened my will, Certain said. Thanks for sharing that story. I never realized that this was still such a struggle for you. Aurion handed back the flask. Certain carefully returned it to within his robes. I suspect I may never be clear of it, but perhaps I can forgive myself one day and it will become easier. Ah, it looks like the food is now here. Certain rose and helped Lara and Ashra distribute the bread. Eat well. You will need your strength. You must leave tonight so you can make good time. Certain, are you familiar with this area at night? Ashra said. Mostly. It will not be an issue, he said. Good. You all eat your fill and I will pack you some supplies, Ashra said and disappeared again downstairs. Alrian and the others started to get ready, and soon they were standing at the entrance to the hut, packing away the food provided by Ashra. You have been such an incredible help. I was a little resistant, and I'm sorry, Aurian said. Don't worry. We are all under our own pressure. You did well here. Good luck on your journey, Ashra said. Are you sure I can't convince you to come with us? Just to the temple? You wouldn't need to leave the desert, Aurian said. Not a chance. This is your journey, and I have played my part. Everything will be fine. Just remember what I have shown you, and trust your companions. They are quite resourceful. All right, then. Goodbye and thanks again, Aurion said. It was enlightening to meet the legend himself and to confirm your existence, Certain said. You keep that information to yourself. It's too troublesome diverting large numbers of visitors, Ashra said. I think you secretly let some in. You aren't as bad as you make out, Lara said. I'd appreciate if you don't share those sentiments, Ashra said. Don't worry, we won't send anyone here, Aurion said and waved as they set off. Good luck, young man. You have the slimmest of chances, but maybe you will succeed, Ashra whispered, then retreated to his hut. He looked out into the desert and felt a chill run down his spine. Something bad was coming. 
Certain led the way, making as much haste as possible. He wanted to capitalize on the available light. Alrian was a bit slow, but once they worked into a rhythm, the steps flowed easier. What a strange man. I don't know how you could live in such a place all by yourself, Lara said. There must be a story behind that. Something significant changed that man, Certain said. I wonder why, Alrian said. From what he knew of wizards, Ashra seemed positively brilliant. He would be remarkable in any setting, but had chosen to stay in such an isolated and remote place. We shouldn't stop yet, but the light is fading. Can you assist? Certain said. Alrian created three orbs of light and placed one above his right shoulder and positioned the other two with Certain and Lara. A bit brighter, Lara said. Alrian increased the intensity slowly. That's it, Certain said. Alrian took a moment to stabilize the spell and make it easier to maintain, then continued on. They trekked down minor paths which wouldn't be visible unless they were known. But the path ended soon, and they had to traverse up and down sand dunes. Is there no other way, Alrian said, struggling to keep up. He was already tired and had to keep up the light spells as well. There is, but it is a much further distance and would result in more effort. This is definitely worth the additional fatigue, Certain said. Fine, Alrian said and persevered. With each step, he felt like he was sliding back ever slightly, which increased the strain and the feeling that he was not progressing. A bit further, Certain said. Then they suddenly passed over a dune and down into a nice, flat surface. Can you illuminate the distance, Certain said. Alrian repositioned and repurposed Certain's light, casting rays into the distance. Before them spread an expanse of desert. There was nothing as far as they could see. We have arrived at the Plain of Despair, Certain said. That's a lovely name, Laura said. Yes, it's named because we are relatively central to the desert, and there's nothing for a long way. Just flat desert. Many get stuck here and lose their sense of direction and despair. It is the despair that kills the feeling of helplessness. If you keep a cool head and keep traveling in a single direction, you will get somewhere in time, Certain said. Alrian could believe the despair. He couldn't see anything that would serve as a landmark. Definitely not sure I would like to get stranded. How much further should we go tonight, Lara said. As far as Alrian can make it, there is nowhere to take shelter here. and We can rest during the day if we can find somewhere suitable, Certain said. Shelter from what, Alrian said. Dust storms. They're relatively rare and don't last long. But you can be sure if we are caught up in the middle of nowhere, we will get one. Best to move along as far as possible. You've convinced me. Let's get moving. Can you keep up, Alrian? Lara said. For now, let's just get on with it. Alrian let the light dim to assist with his concentration. He had to concentrate more on walking faster and more carefully. They continued in relative quiet for the next few hours. Aldrin had no idea how long had actually elapsed, because the dark and the bare surroundings didn't offer any idea of how far they had traveled. How do you keep us on track, Aldrin said. You learn to develop a good internal compass. There are minor clues spread around, and also our footsteps are a good marker, Certain said. Aldrin paused and looked back. There was definitely evidence of their passing. How long do they stick around? Lara said. It depends on the wind. Hours, probably, not more, usually. There's not as much shifting around here, unless there's a storm, so it can be longer if the weather permits. Are you worried about us being followed? Certain said. Not really, I was just curious. I like to know what kind of trail we are leaving. That's quite wise. It would be easy for someone to follow us right now. We would probably see evidence of their light if that were the case, but you never know, Certain said. Alrian started to imagine people tracking them through the desert, then dismissed the thought. He quickened his pace to catch up to Certain. Just as he drew close, Certain abruptly stopped. Alrian, magnify the light again, please, he said. Alrian complied, giving Certain a good view of the distance. Do you see that? Certain said, pointing. No, what is it? Alrian said. Is that a storm? Laura said. Yes, quite a big one if you can see it from this distance in the dark, Certain said. What do we do, Alrian said. We look for shelter. We can't take any chances. I don't like the way it is moving. It seems unnatural. Certain started to look around at the area. As before, there was nothing around, just a flat expanse of sand. 
I can build something, Arian said. It is our only chance. I just hope you can make it strong. This is going to be a nasty storm, Certain said. No pressure, then. I've just been training all day and walking all night, Arian said with a sigh. Dig deep, please. I've heard of these storms, and they're awful, Lara said. Arian tried to shake off his exhaustion and concentrate. It's approaching quite fast. You've probably got five minutes, Certain said. That will do, Arian said, trying to sound confident. He had made a slightly curved wall, but that wasn't going to be enough. He needed to completely cover them. Here goes, he said to himself and started gathering his spark. It seemed to be in good supply, which was reassuring. It was the mental exertion and fatigue that he had to combat. He first detected a body of water nearby, then began to draw together his wall. Rather than just go with the curve, he visualized it extending further in the shape of a dome. Several times he had to stop and reform a section because it wasn't right, but he seemed to be getting the structural integrity right. I don't mean to alarm you, but it's almost upon us. If we don't have a complete shield, we're going to be buried alive in sand, Certain said. Alion increased his efforts, but also increased his mistakes. I think you just need to finish this, Laura said. Alion didn't look up, but he heard the fear in her voice. His dome was only three quarters completed, and they were all hunched over to stay within it. Get down now, Alion, do what you can't finish, Certain said. Laura lay down quickly and Certain joined her. Alrian slowly sank down as he held his concentration. He could hear the whistling and howling of the wind and the sand flying everywhere. It was almost upon them. He extended his dome just as the first wave of sand hit it. He could feel the impact of the wind and sand on his creation. It's not going to hold. Do something, Laura said. Certain half stood up and braced the weak section with his hands. Alrin infused the sand with his spark, trying to reinforce it. He felt the structure of the dome altering and reforming. It was hardened in a way that he had never achieved in his practice. Over there! Is that another storm? Lara shouted above the howling. Sand was entering from the not-quite-closed rear of the dome. Certain lay down, blocking the gap with his body, and Alrin rushed to complete the dome. As he was extending it, he was trying to strengthen it. He collapsed to his knees and released the spell. The three of them sat very quietly, listening to the storm rage around them. I think you did it, Certain said with caution. Laura crept around the whole structure, listening carefully and feeling it with her hands. I think it will hold for now, she said, looking at Alrian with concern. 26. Key Finding Keys jangled and the lock creaked and groaned. The heavy metal door slowly opened, making even more noise than anything else. Vincent looked up with interest to see who was coming in. Glinda, lovely to see you, he said. I'm here to ask more questions, she said, closing the door behind herself and making sure it locked. Don't trust us, Silas said. Not at all. As you may be aware, you are being held here for Wraith, she said. Oh, he's not nearby? Where might he be? Silas said. Not here. Only the counselor would know his location and plans, Glinda said. The tone of her voice was the same, but Vincent noticed something odd. She seemed to be giving them more information than was actually necessary. So it may take a while for him to get here, Vincent said. Not sure, probably. That's why it's worth me asking you some additional questions, Glinda said. I'm not sure what you want to know. Silas said. We want to know where your son is. Where is Alrian? Glinda said. Her tone was very formal and stiff. I don't actually know, Silas said. And you? What's your answer? Glinda said to Vincent. Sorry, I also don't know. Vincent showed his open palms. Unfortunately, they are not going to accept those answers, Glinda said. That's a shame now, isn't it? Will that look bad for you? Vincent said he didn't have any malice in his voice. He was more interested in getting a real response from the female guard. Yes, it will. They will escalate to more extreme methods of questioning, she said. All we know is that he was here recently, but have no idea where he is now, Vincent said, offering her something. He was here? Tell me more, Glinda said. He didn't enter the city. You had it all locked up. But he managed to get word through to us regardless, Silas said. I see, Glinda said, staring off into space. Perhaps you could satisfy a curiosity of mine. You seem to have that far away look when you're communicating with your 
colleagues. Is that something that you must concentrate to do, or do you always overhear each other? Vincent said. His comments snapped Glinda out of her apparent daze. You have been somewhat accommodating, so I'll answer. It's a conscious communication. You must purposefully broadcast, and the others must be listening out. But there are some who can dominate with their message regardless of the listeners, Glinda said. I see. Like Wraith, Vincent said. Exactly, Glinda nodded. They only know what you tell them? They can't spy on you, Vincent said. No. Good. So if you were to help us, nobody would have to know, Vincent said. Salus looked at him and realized that Vincent had been working towards this. Why would I help you, Glinda said. Because you have a child. You don't seem like a bad person. I don't know how you ended up in this situation, but it's not something you can easily escape. Can we help each other, Vincent said. I don't see how you could help me. I would risk everything for nothing, Glinda said. I'm sure there is something we can do for you right now. But what our son is doing is cleansing the blight from the world. You won't have to live with this forever, Vincent said. That got Glinda's attention. He can cure us. That's not possible, Glinda said. It happened to Avaria. There's your proof that it's possible, Vincent said. But that was twenty years ago, and it was a spell cast by the greatest of all wizards, Glinda said. Yes. My father and Aurian's grandfather. If you help us, you are helping that future. Vincent could see that he had the guard's attention. He could see the struggle in her features as much as she tried to hide them. His assessment had been correct. She wasn't a willing part of this. But she looked afraid. He needed something to offer her right now. I know that sounds like a long shot, but what if we took care of the counselor? He seems to run things around here. If he were gone... Would you be able to disappear, or at least fade back into the background, Vincent said. You don't know what you are suggesting, Glinda said. Yes, we do. We are offering to remove the man who is controlling this city and freeing you up to make your own decisions, Salas said. Glinda seemed to be weakening. You just need to give us the opportunity and we will do the rest. We won't divulge your involvement at all, so you won't be under suspicion. Can you help us, Vincent said. Glinda appeared conflicted. Her fear was obvious, but a look of resolve crossed her face. She had decided. I will help you in this, but if anything goes wrong, I will side with him. I must, Glinda said. Perfectly fair. Silas, do you have a plan in mind? Vincent said. Yes, let me explain it to you both, she said, a smile breaking out on her face. Glinda locked the door behind her and strode down the corridor. Her involvement was minimal, but she couldn't afford to make any mistakes. The trickiest part was just ahead of her. She didn't run into anyone else in the hallways, which was a relief. She didn't know the others that well, and there was little chance that they would notice anything different. But she was glad to not have the encounters. They were a possibility for throwing her off her guard. As expected, she found the counselor in his library. Any news? he said, looking up from a pile of papers. They won't talk, she said. And have you tried persuading them? He said with annoyance. No, I really don't have the skill for it, and I thought that you would have better luck. I figured that in the meantime I could search their accommodation, she said. They wouldn't talk, but you know where they live? The counselor said with suspicion. He had put his papers away and was focusing entirely on her. Glinda cursed herself inwardly. She had embellished too much on the detail with real facts she had been told. They made a mistake, a slight one, then retracted it, but I believe I know where they have been staying and wish to investigate it as soon as possible, Glinda said. I see, that's wise. There may be evidence of their plans there. Go look into it, and I'll let you know if I learn anything or confirm where they have been staying, the counselor said. He rose from his chair slowly. If only you were more resourceful, I wouldn't have to do these things myself, he said. My apologies. Hopefully I can make up for it, Glinda said. Yes, let's hope so. Go on, get out of my sight before I make you join me. I haven't forgotten your reluctance for proper interrogation and may just change my mind and attempt to instruct you further, he said. Glinda bowed quickly and left immediately. Almost there. She went directly to the side entrance of the house and left the door ajar as she left. Finally, she made her way around the perimeter to the front. You are relieved. I am taking over until shift change, she told the guards. Really? 
But there's not long left until changeover. Why? the first guard said. I have to wait around anyway. Figured I could cut you a break. Hurry up before I reconsider, Glinda said. That won't be a problem. Thanks, the second guard said, and almost dragged his companion away. Glinda watched them leave and waited. She had to stop herself from tapping her foot. The nervous energy was almost too much. They better know what they are doing, she said to herself. Vincent heard the steady footsteps outside the door and stepped to the side, ready to strike. As the door opened, he rushed over and threw an elbow at the man entering. He saw the attack coming, but couldn't react in time and crumbled to the ground. Ugly, but effective, Vincent said. Let's get him somewhere else, Silas said. Vincent picked up the counselor, and Silas helped carry him out into the hallway. One of them held the man up under each arm, and Vincent freed a hand to close the door behind them. She better be right about the patrols and servants, because we look mighty suspicious right now, Silas said. She's trustworthy. Let's just be quick, Vincent said. They slowly navigated around several corners, ending up back in a small private library. This looks like the place, he said. They shuffled inside and dropped the counselor down into his large reading chair. I'll watch him while you review the material there, Vincent said, pointing to the pile of papers. Salus quickly leafed through, scanning each page. Not much of interest. It's pretty mundane. Maybe they don't put anything dangerous down on paper, she said. Anything at all out of the ordinary, Vincent said. They have a note about trade routes through the desert, Salus said. Isn't that unusual? We should ask him about that, Vincent said. Good idea. Give me a moment and I'll prepare the elixir. Silas retrieved a few vials from a cloak and mixed them carefully. Down the hatch, she said, as Vincent helped her open the counselor's mouth. He coughed suddenly and woke up looking around the room. What's happening, he said. His voice was a little slurred and his speech slower than usual. You are drugged and you're going to tell us exactly what we want to know, Silas said. The prisoners? How can this be? You underestimated us. Don't even think about calling for help. The concoction you drank has dulled your senses, Vincent said. You think you're clever, but you won't get away with this, the counselor said with considerable effort. If you're so sure, just tell us what we want to know, Salus said. The counselor looked conflicted and confused. His confidence was still there, but he was a little unsure of himself. What could you possibly want to know anyway, he said with satisfaction, like he was both showing off and resisting at the same time. We want to know what Wraith is planning. He's organized you all. For what purpose, Vincent said. Oh, I can't possibly tell you that. But I can share something, something that you will find interesting, the counselor said. He had an odd grin on his face. Did you know that Wraith is in the desert? He's heading for an old temple to destroy it before a certain someone gets the chance to visit, <laughs> he said, attempting a slow chuckle that sounded horrible. Wraith is in the desert? How long has he been there, Vincent said. Oh, I don't know, but he's got an army with him. I sure hope your son isn't there. He'll be in for some trouble, the counselor said again. He couldn't contain his awkward laughter. Time to end this, Silas said. Vincent belted the counselor in the jaw, and the man slumped down in his chair unconscious. What do we do with him? Silas said. I was going to ask you what the plan is. I think we can discredit him enough to neuter his authority. Vincent saw Silas' face light up with the possibilities. Silas scouted ahead, while Vincent half carried, half dragged the counselor along. They had stripped him of all his clothes and soaked him in the expensive liquor they had found in his library. I can't handle the stench from here. Not sure how you are managing, Silas said. Just moving forward, Vincent said. Silas laughed and went further ahead once more. She stepped out and made eye contact with Glinda. Glinda nodded, left the gate unattended, and stepped out onto the street. Coast is clear. Let's finish this. Silas returned to help Vincent, and they rushed out to the grounds as quickly as possible and eased the counselor down onto a wooden bench across from his house. I hope this does the trick, Salus said. You can stick around and monitor the situation. I must go after Alrian, Vincent said. But that's suicide. You don't know the desert, Salus said. Her eyes pleaded with him. No, it's fine. I can manage. I have the directions. Take care. I'll find our son. Vincent gave Salus a quick kiss and ran off into the street. Salus watched him go, all the elation of their escape and victory dispersing all at once. 27. 
The Desert Temple As the storm settled in, Alrian began to relax a little. We should take turns remaining on watch, so we can warn Alrian if there's danger of the shelter breaking, Certain said. That sounds wise. I'm not sure if I could sleep otherwise. I don't trust this. No offense, Alrian, Lara said. None taken. I'm a little amazed it actually worked. How about you both sleep first? I can't sleep immediately anyway. I need to monitor this a bit more and try to relax, Alrian said. No problem. Make sure you wake me before you get too sleepy. Then I'll wake Laura for her shift, Certain said. Then he and Laura slowly prepared to sleep, laying out some blankets to lie on. They took additional care to not bump into any of the walls protecting them. Alrian couldn't sleep yet, but needed something else to focus on. He decided to review his spellbook and that strange notebook he had been receiving messages in. I wonder if it's Falric sending them. He still wasn't sure of Falric's fate, although he secretly wished the wizard had survived. Alrian still carried the guilt of not being able to help his mentor. Next time I won't fail. He saw the notebook first and reached for it. Leafing through the pages, he found a new entry. You must use time to your advantage. That's odd, Alrian whispered, and turned to the next page. There was no other message, just that one. Alrian had the distinct feeling that someone was watching him. Does this wizard know that I'm trapped in a storm? Maybe it's Ashra, Alrian thought. There were some aspects that made sense, but he never met Ashra until recently. The advice seemed timely, but it was too neat. There has to be something else to this, but what? I'm using my time as effectively as possible. We kept my training short so that I would make my way to the temple as soon as possible. Is there something I'm missing? Alrian worked through all the interpretations of the message. He was still missing something, but decided to capitalize on the fact that he was stuck in a storm and reviewed his spellbook. With delight, Alrian noticed that the spells he had practiced with Ashra were now documented in the book. Reading about them from a different author provided an additional perspective and helped his understanding. It was as if what he read resonated strongly with him. Somewhere in my head, I have this knowledge already. It must be the act of joining the lines from something I instinctively know to something I actively know. It was an interesting perspective that he would have to try out on someone. Next time I go to Paperton, I'll have a lot of questions, Alrian said to himself. But first he had other things to focus on. He used the time to do some minor reinforcement of his walls and rework small sections to learn some of the slightly different techniques in his spellbook. As his confidence climbed and the protective dome retained its strength, Alrian felt sleep coming on. It's safe now, and I have no energy left. It's time, he thought. He shuffled over and shook certain. At the slightest touch, the monk's eyes darted open and he was completely alert. Time for my shift? Great, have a good rest. Certain set up carefully and inspected the walls and listened carefully. This will be set in for a while, but I think we are safe. Don't worry, I'll wake you if required, he said. Thanks, I'm exhausted. Alrian laid out a blanket and collapsed onto it. Sleep was close, but it was a restless sleep. He awoke by himself and was quite groggy and confused. Laura and Certain were up and talking quietly. Welcome back. I would ask how you sleep was, but I could tell from all the tossing and turning that it wasn't great, Laura said. I'm not sure. Maybe I was overtired. Is everything all right? Alrian started to test the walls. Seems fine. Storm has died down a bit. It's still too much to go out yet, but I think we are over the worst. Eat, and we shall keep an ear out, Certain said. Alrian drank some water and ate some biscuits and bread. He felt a bit better than the day before. Even his restless sleep had done the job. Have you ever experienced a storm like this? Alrian said. No, nothing quite this bad. It's suspicious, Certain said. In what way? It's unnatural, Laura said. Yes. Certain didn't elaborate, but he looked concerned. So maybe a wizard is behind it, Alrian said. I don't know what's possible, but it seems likely. We should be very careful during the rest of our journey, Certain said. You know, it seems like a crazy spell, but it's plausible, Alrian said after a moment of consideration. At least if that's the case, they don't know where we are. It's not very targeted, Lara said. Agreed. 
We just need to remain cautious and prepare ourselves, Certain said. Sure, I'll review my spells and do some training. Alrian went back to the spell book and tried miniature versions of his spells within the dome. By practicing at a very small scale, he would not disrupt their shelter, and he could focus more on how he was controlling the spells. Hours passed, and Alrian felt in more control of his new techniques. He built a tiny dome that surrounded Certain's foot, and he kicked it away. Oh, that was cute, <laughs> Laura said with a laugh. Certain was about to respond when he stopped suddenly and pressed his ear against the dome wall. Something has changed. I think the storm is dying down, he said. Laura and Alrian became still and tried listening as well. The howling seemed more distant and less enthusiastic. I think you're right, Laura said softly. How long until we can emerge, Alrian said. Let's wait a bit longer, Certain said. They all waited cautiously. Alrian stopped practicing his spells, and Laura sat still, occasionally trying to listen through the wall. After a while, Certain broke the silence again. Can you open a tiny part of the wall? I want to test the environment outside, Certain said. Alrian concentrated and thought about how to adjust the wall. He couldn't just attack it. He needed a way of altering the structure in just the right way. I need a minute to figure this out, Alrian said, and began his work. It was almost like building the shelter again, but this time looking for places that he could remove. He projected an invisible framework over it, then tried moving a section out. The wall shook, but then settled, and a rectangular chunk shuffled over along the sand. Alrian was just about to cheer when a rush of sand blocked the gap he had created. Something must have gone wrong, Alrian said, confused. He was sure he had done it carefully. It wasn't your mistake. I think we are quite buried. Have you noticed the air going stale? Certain said. Now that you mention it. But why now? Laura said. I think it took a long time to build up, but we are quite buried. I have been monitoring it, but didn't say anything in order to prevent panic. The last thing we needed was to unnecessarily waste the air, Certain said. What do we do? Laura said. We need to take a chance that the storm has moved on. Alrian will need to clear a path for us, Certain said. That can be arranged. Let's pack up, then give me the word, Alrian said. The three of them took care of packing their things, working methodically. That looks to be it, Laura said. So I just clear a path in front of us, Alrian said. Correct. Just be careful of sand coming in. Certain shuffled over to behind Alrian, and Laura joined him. Alrian considered his options. I should clear and build at the same time. That's safer, he decided. He drew in a deep breath, then built up his spark. He prepared a tightly compacted ball of force and held it ready. Before he unleashed it, he prepared himself to build up some walls. I hope this works, he whispered, and let his spell loose. The ball of force rocked ahead, displacing a huge curtain of sand. Alrian had not expected so much to come back to him, he quickly brought up a protective wall in front of them and extended the dome roof to try and prevent additional burial by the sand. More sand coming in, Certain said. Alrian tried again, but altered his technique. Instead, he built a moving sand wall and advanced it ahead. The length of their dome kept extending. With a sigh, he stopped it and paused, letting the wall in front of him drop down. You've extended our space. What's the plan? Laura said. We have to assume the sand cover is extensive. I'm hoping that if I poke a hole up, we have enough space we can reinforce an exit before we get buried for good, Alrian said. Worth a try. I will advise you if the situation is worsening, Certain said. This better work. Alrian had underestimated the seriousness of their situation. He shuffled closer and picked a spot in the ceiling. He gathered his spark and prepared another ball of force. But this time, he packed more and more power into it and tried to compact the energy as much as possible. Here goes, he whispered, and put everything into the spell. There was an explosion of force above them, displacing the sand everywhere. But the intensity and power of the force pushed most of the sand out, and they saw the daylight finally. Quick, reinforce, Certain shouted. Alrian created walls either side of the relatively small hole, and only minimal sand dropped back in. We have an exit if we can get there, Laura said, looking up at the daylight. 
Maybe I can build a ladder, Arion said, thinking out loud. He shuffled over, then examined his new reinforced vertical walls. With some experimentation, he managed to create some bricks sticking out of the wall. Lara tested on. It's a bit crumbly. Can you do better? She said. Aulian tried again, putting more water into the mix and compacting the sand further. That'll do. Keep going, Lara said. Aulian built additional blocks and Lara kept climbing. Keep it up. I'm almost there, Lara said. Soon her head disappeared into the hole and she dragged herself out. Wow. Get up here, she said. Aurion let Certain go next, and watched carefully to ensure the makeshift ladder held. Once Certain had reached the top, he called down to Aurion. Can you throw the bags up? Certain said. Aurion picked up the bags with waves of force and gently carried them up to Certain's waiting hands. Once they were taken, Aurion started climbing by himself. The rungs of his sand ladder were stronger than he had expected. I'm getting this finally. He took care, and soon his head poked out of the opening. He had to take care to ensure his sword didn't get stuck as he climbed out of the hole. He dusted himself off and took a look around. There were now sand dunes where before there were none. The whole landscape has changed, Arion said. Yes, an unimaginable amount of sand has settled here. I have a bad feeling about this, Certain said. How will we navigate now, Lara said. Don't worry, I can look at the position of the sun and adjust our course. Eventually, we will start to see landmarks that I can use as a guide, Certain said. Good. Let's get started, Arion said. Certainly. This way, Certain walked off with confidence and Arion followed close behind. Laura lingered, looking back at the mostly buried shelter. Shouldn't you close that up? What if someone fell in, she said. Good point. It's useful, but more likely a person would fall in unexpectedly. I'll close it in. Alion reached out and visualized the structure of the wall, as he had done previously when taking out a small piece. However, this time he started to crack and destabilize the entire wall. The sand shifted suddenly, and the mini dune next to them sunk swiftly into the ground. Alion stepped back with a start, surprised at the speed of the movement. Lucky you weren't standing any closer, Lara said. I know. I won't miscalculate that again, Arion said. The sand is a dangerous and often misjudged element, Certain said. Then he turned back and started walking again. Laura and Arion rushed to catch up. Up and down they went, navigating the new dunes. Certain only paused occasionally to check they were heading in the right direction. There seemed to be a lot of sand and dust still in the air, which helped reduce the sun's rays a little, but it was hot and slow going. Hours later, Alrin was tired and hot. He couldn't see that they made any progress at all. But Certain seemed confident, so he kept going. His mind started drifting off when suddenly he ran into Certain. The monk had stopped completely. What is it? Alrin said. That should be the temple in the distance. Take a look, Certain said. Alrin squinted and looked where the monk was pointing. All I can see is the haze. Is that smoke? That's definitely smoke. I take it you don't have massive bonfires at the temple, Lara said. Not at all. I believe the temple is under attack, Certain said. Aldrin didn't know what to say. Despite everything they had done, they were too late. 28. Wavering Certain started walking again, increasing his speed. What are you doing? What's the plan? Arian said. We must get closer and assess, don't you agree? Certain said. Sure, we don't know what we're dealing with, Arian said, although he felt quite rattled. They had been so quick in traveling here and only paused for a while. Maybe we shouldn't have stopped, Arian said. We may have been caught in the storm anyway, and you wouldn't have had the required training. Besides, you needed that to take on Wraith, Lara said. Maybe it's not enough. My spells did nothing last time. I should have focused on learning how to use this sword. That seemed to work, Alrian said. Don't second guess yourself. Everything you did was the best choice. You weren't going to be an effective fighter in such a brief time anyway, so it's best that you worked on being a better wizard. Don't you agree, Certain? Lara said. Absolutely. 
You need the right focus and mindset to fight effectively. Some of that you have already from your previous encounters, so you are at an advantage. But the body has many secrets which take time to master. Your sword may be an effective weapon against wraith, but you are not ready to wield it properly. There is time for that, Certain said. You both make sense. I just feel a bit lost now that it seems as though he is here and ahead of us. I secretly thought that we could get there first, so I could use the second trial to be better prepared for him, Alrian said. You beat him once with even less training. Don't let yourself get defeated already, Laura said, giving him a big smile. Alrian couldn't help but smile back. His doubts were still there, but he could push them back for a time. They continued on gradually through the burning hot desert. The addition of the new dunes made the going tougher, and Alrian frequently wanted the flat wasteland back. At least it was less work. The route seemed to be slowly taking them higher and higher. Lara mentioned it first. We seem to be slowly ascending. Is that normal? Lara said. No, this is not natural. I suspect it's because we are getting closer to the source of the storm, Certain said. Let's say Wraith or someone near the temple created the storm, Alrian said. That would be my guess, Certain said. Lucky we weren't any closer. We would have struggled to get out from that much sand, Lara said. Arian stopped and looked back. When he looked for it, he could see the gentle slope of the sand all the way back. The amount of sand displaced was staggering. He thought about the power required to fuel such a storm, and a chill ran down his spine. Don't think about it, you're fine, he thought, and took some quicker steps to catch up. We are getting closer. I think we shall see better once we reach the top of this dune, Certain said. You would hope so. That thing is massive, Lara said. The incline was steeper than anything they had traversed yet. It was obviously towering over the rest of the area. With more measured steps, they ascended the giant dune. The sand still shifted considerably, so they had to take care with each step forward. Alrian found this section very frustrating. His footing was constantly slipping back, and he felt like he was making very little progress. But each time he paused and looked back, he could see how far they had come. Not as far as he would have liked for the effort expended, but at least he could see. If I'm right, we should be able to see the temple once we reach the top. Very close now. Certain increased his speed, his urge to see the temple once more spurring him on. Lara also sped up, but Alrian let them go ahead. He wanted to conserve his energy. The monk reached the top first and crouched. He said nothing. Laura joined him shortly after and let out a quiet gasp. Alrian was intrigued by what they were seeing and pushed on to look for himself. He crested the top of the dune and almost toppled over. The ridge was actually quite narrow. Once he steadied himself, he looked out. The desert temple was in clear view. The large blocks of stone covered in sand looked like something from a long-forgotten time. But that was not what took his breath away. The smoke was a sign of danger, as Certain had pointed out. But the horrifying thing was the black mass of seething, tainted, swarming the temple and surrounding it. As far as he could see, the ground was covered with tainted. He could pick out blighters, tainted ones, and even several shades. This is bad, Arian said. It was a lot more than that, but he couldn't put the words together. It's probably the worst case scenario, given the circumstances, Certain said. We can't take that head on, Lara said. We can't take that period, Arian said. There are ways and means. The temple is not yet overcome, so our quest is not in vain. Certain was studying the scene with a thoughtful look. You're just getting sentimental over returning to your home. Lara and I took on a tiny fraction of the force here, and I used the entirety of my spark. She had to save me at the last moment, Arian said. We wouldn't have to fight them all, Certain said. There must be another way into the temple, Lara said. No, stealth takes time. By the time we enter it, it will be too late. The monks will be defeated, the temple will be taken, and the vault of silence will be destroyed or locked away. This is a no-win situation, Arian said. You've dealt with long shots before and succeeded. We can't give up, not at this stage, Lara said. They won't allow you to falter now. We have come too far, and the monks need our help. You have an important responsibility that you cannot give up, Certain said. I can find Ashra, and he can teach me instead. He has passed the trial. He understands how it works and what it teaches. It won't be the same, but at least I can prepare in safety. 
I can't deal with this. It's too much, too soon. No amount of power can overcome these odds, Alrion said. Certain stood up and walked off the dune. He stood in front of Alrion, blocking the way back. To retreat, you must go through me, Certain said. Don't make me do this. Just let me go, Alrion said. Don't be silly, Alrion. Let's just figure this out. Lara reached out for Alrion's arm, but he shook her off. Move, Certain, Alrion said. The monk shrugged and shook his head. Alrion sent a wave of force at the monk's feet. Certain was moved, but regained his footing and resumed his stance. Alrion threw another wave, this time at Certain's chest. The monk absorbed the force, moving slightly, but without losing his ground. You will need more than that, Certain said. Alrion started to get frustrated. Just leave me be, he said. He prepared a fire spell, and as he readied it, Certain moved. He dashed with incredible speed, knocking Alrion to the side and disrupting the spell. Alrian recovered and went all out, throwing waves of force at certain from all directions. The monk seemed to anticipate most of them and either dodged or blocked the force with minimal impact. Alrian kept up the onslaught and prepared another spell. Since certain was within a smaller area, Alrian raised a large block of wet sand and formed a powerful seal around certain's feet. As the sand solidified, it contracted, binding the monk's feet tighter and tighter. Certain noticed it happening and started to struggle with increasing force, but it was too late. Alrian managed to strengthen the block so much that the monk was completely trapped. So it has come to this, Certain said. There was a sadness and regret in his voice. I'm sorry, but I can't do this, Alrian said. Certain nodded and reached into his robes. He retrieved the metal flask and held it out. What's what? Lara said. My saving grace. Certain unscrewed the lid and held it still in front of him. Don't drink it, it's not worth it, Arian said. Certain chuckled quietly. <laughs> you misunderstand, he said. He tipped the flask over and poured it out into the sand. Quite a bit flowed out. Each drop was one that Certain had avoided drinking. They will never know, Certain said wistfully. What is he talking about? What did you make him do, Lara said. He took that flask from the temple when he was banished. He swore that he would not drink from it again, no matter what happened, so that one day he could return and show them he had regained his honor and mastered his weakness, Arian said. Why, certain, she said. If all hope is lost for you, Arian, then it is for me also, certain said. Arian was shocked. His fear at his powerlessness had not only turned him away from his quest, it had damaged his friend's chances at being accepted again by his people. Why would you do that? Alrian said. Because you need to learn. Will is not something you use. Will is a part of how you live. Will means persevering no matter the odds. I will find a way to succeed with an empty flask, just as you will find a way to succeed now, Certain said. I... I, I don't know what to say. Alrian dispersed all the sand around Certain's feet and dropped into a crouch, buried his head in his hands, trying to think. You have come a long way. You have been putting on a big front and showing off with the use of your new found power, but you still carry fear for your enemy and healthy doses of self-doubt. This is normal, especially given the situation. But you mustn't give it power. Acknowledge it and move on. There is much more you must achieve, Certain said. Aurion looked up. The monk was right about a lot of things. He had been trying to compensate with his magic, to bluff about his confidence and mastery. But it had been a front, and had crumbled spectacularly in front of overwhelming odds. Would that realization change anything, though? But where do we go from here? Acknowledging my fear and uncertainty is not going to make that ridiculous army go away, Aurion said. Who said anything about fighting them at all? There is another way, Certain said. I'm all ears. I don't want to deal with that, Lara said, jerking her thumb over her shoulder towards the teeming mass of tainted. You don't take me as the type to just saunter in the front door. Do you think the monks don't have other ways of getting around? Certain said. A wry smile broke out on his face. You have a way of getting us in? Lara said. Yes, provided you have the courage to join me. I'll go. Maybe there's a chance, Aurion said. Me too. I need to see this place for myself. 
Maybe even liberate some treasures, Laura said with a wink. Follow me, Certain said, shaking off the sand around his feet and walking off with purpose. 29. Entering the Temple The trio walked with renewed hope. Certain took them along the newly formed ridge, and they tried to avoid looking at the black mass of enemies. They started to approach the temple in a roundabout way, avoiding danger. We can't do this the whole way. It will take all day, Lara said. I agree. Just a bit further, Certain said. Lara didn't respond and decided to see what the monk had to show them. A few minutes later, he stopped quickly and crouched down. He motioned for Lara and Arian to do the same. This is as close as we can come without the need to approach directly, Certain said. The front door, perhaps, but you said there was another way, Lara said. There is, but not for us. You yourself said it will take too long to take the long way in. If I show Alrian the way, he can enter the temple from the secret passage, and we can create a diversion so that he doesn't get noticed, Certain said. Hang on, you want us to go into that, Lara said. I said we had a chance, not that it was safe, Certain said. Why are you smiling? This is terrible, Lara said. Nothing is certain except death. We don't know when it will come, but that it will claim us eventually. I don't want it to be today, but it wouldn't be the worst end, would it? Certain said. You monks are crazy. Alrian, say something, Lara said. I don't know the area well, and I certainly don't want to sacrifice anyone today. But Certain must know that I can't sneak in unnoticed. If there's a way for you to enable that and survive, it's not a bad idea, Alrian said. Lara is quite resourceful. I've noticed she has a few interesting things hidden up her sleeves. I'm not sacrificing myself just yet, Certain said. If you're going to do this, I'll promise that I'll make it to the trial, one way or another, Alrian said. I guess it's up to us then, Lara said. I'll leave you to ponder about our chances of survival, and I'll show Alrian where the entrance is. Certain led Alrian aside, and they crept down the ridge on the other side. The entrance is marked by a statue of a cat. The cat's tail is actually a lever, and if you pull it, the entrance will be revealed. But you must close the entrance immediately. If the enemy notices it, the temple's defenses will be overrun in no time, Certain said. Understood, Arya said. See that curve in the ridge down there? Yes, I see it. Make your way down there as quietly as possible. You should be able to see the cat statue from there. Await our signal, then make a run for it. I'm not sure how much time you will have. I can do that. Thank you, Certain. I wouldn't have made it this far without you. Now go survive so I can repay you, Arian said. That's my intention. What's the signal? I'm not sure, but knowing Lara, you will know it when you see it, Certain said. I'm sure you're right about that, Arian said and held out his hand. Certain shook it firmly, then headed back. Arian started working his way down. He wanted to get his bearings and locate the statue before he noticed the signal. It would be a disaster if he didn't get there in time. The ridge was quite steep, and following it without going over the top was hard going. He was walking on an angle, and each step threatened to have him toppling down the slope. But he persevered and made consistent progress. Soon he reached the spot that Certain had pointed out and paused for a rest. Once he had composed himself, Alrian crept up the ridge and looked out. They were around the side of the temple, but there was still a large mass of blighters and tainted milling around. It seemed as though they were looking for another entry. Not just a large mass, they're coordinating. This is bad, Alrian thought. He could see why a diversion was required. There was a decent chance that Alrian could make it to the entrance and get inside. But there was a purpose behind the enemy's actions. If they got wind of a secret entrance hidden here, and thought to investigate the statue, it was only a matter of time until they managed to open it. I won't be able to do a single thing. Certain and Lara are on their own, Arian realized. He dismissed the thought and focused on what he could do himself. He noticed strange movement out on the ground and tracked it with his eyes. Something was moving really fast, but wasn't being noticed by the enemy. That is, until it started attacking. It was like an invisible whirlwind of death carving a path through the mass of blighters. It took them seconds to figure out what was going on, and in that time at least twenty of them had fallen. As they began to react in anger, a large explosion went off a bit further away. A wave of blighters was sent flying, sending the whole group into disarray. 
The deathly blur that was certain changed direction, moving towards the explosion. The confused and angry blighters started to follow, the tainted spurring them on. Alrian watched carefully. That was definitely the signal. But there were still one or two blighters that had not followed. He had to make a call. Should he wait more or take them out? I'll wait a tiny bit more, just in case. Despite the commotion and damage that Certain and Laura was causing, the few straggling blighters were not going over. Either they were oblivious or reacting to different orders. They're not that close to the statue. Maybe I can creep past them. It was worth a try. He didn't want to draw any attention because it would detract from what was being done by his friends. Alrian cautiously crested the ridge and slid down on the other side. He rose quickly and kept an eye on the blighters. There were three worth worrying about, and two of them were roving around and not too close to the statue. However, there was one patrolling around that was a danger. If Alrian was careless, he would get spotted for sure. He kept low and assured his hood was up over his face. He slowly moved along, watching all three blighters. As he closed in on the cat statue, he realized that the timing wasn't going to work. The roving blighter would be too close, and Alrian had nowhere to hide. He had to take care of it. Alrian altered his path and closed in on the blighter. He wanted to get close to make things easier. He stalked behind it, waiting until it reached what appeared to be the limit of its patrol. Alrian carefully prepared a wave of force and directed it at the creature's neck, providing a powerful spin to quickly and efficiently break its neck. The blighter dropped silently, and Alrian stalked back to the cat statue. So far, so good. I hope the other ones don't notice. As he neared the statue, he kept an eye on the other blighters. They didn't seem to notice anything unusual, and in the distance, Alrian could still hear the noises of fighting and explosions. I hope they're all right over there. Better take care of this now, he whispered. As he examined the cat, he could see the amazing detail. It looked ancient, too, but was quite well preserved considering the circumstances. He found the tail without trouble and gave it a yank. Nothing happened. Alrian held on to the tail and tried manipulating it in different directions. Down, side to side, and diagonally had no effect. He tried lifting it up, and it started to move. Throwing more effort into it, he managed to force the tail up and heard a nearby clunk. Then nothing. Alrian's eyes darted back to the other two blighters. It may have been his imagination, but they seemed like they were heading over. They seemed to be moving with a bit more purpose than before. Come on, statue, let's go, Alrian whispered. The blighters were still a way off, but if they came too close, he wouldn't be able to hide. Suddenly the ground beneath him shifted, and he almost toppled over. He saw steps appearing in the sand, descending into a dark passage. Alrian ran down as quickly as he could, almost slipping several times. Once he reached the bottom, he created a light above his hand and looked everywhere for another lever. He found one on the wall and yanked it as hard as possible. Another clank, then silence. Where are those blighters? I hope they're not too inquisitive. He was completely exposed if they came close and noticed the stairs down. He strained his ears but couldn't hear anything. With a start, the stairs began to move. They shifted back and up, forming a neat wall where there was once an incline. I guess that's closed. Time to investigate this passage. Certain was beginning to get overwhelmed. Laura's explosives had helped thin out and confuse the blighters, but the tainted that were controlling the horde had recovered from the initial shock and was sending wave after wave at them. He knew from counting the explosions that Laura was almost out of her bombs. He made his way closer to the latest one, hoping to find her. Spinning and rolling, he made his way through the throng like a scythe, cutting down blighters left and right. He couldn't keep this up forever, but at least he could hold his own. He was waiting for another explosion, but it didn't come. Laura, Surgeon shouted. He needed to have an indication of where she was, or even if she was still alive. Over here, bit busy, she shouted back. Certain redirected his efforts and headed in her direction. A deadly claw strike interrupted his train of thought, almost catching him in the neck. A last-minute reaction saved him, and he took the offending blighter down quickly. I'm slowing, getting sloppy, Certain thought. Time was running out. He found Laura surrounded by a wreath of blighter corpses. She was in the center, alternating between slicing with her dagger and throwing knives with pinpoint precision. Out of bombs, Certain said as he joined her. Yes, how much longer do we need to do this, she said. 
Enough time has passed. We are no use to him dead. We need to get into the temple, Certain said. I'm with you there. Any ideas? There are columns holding up the main entrance. They provide a narrow corridor for us to fight through, where numbers won't be as big an issue. Certain pointed in the general direction. If we can get there... Laura threw two knives, taking down two blighters who had managed to get close. Another was right behind him, its eyes beaming murder, and its mouth was slightly open. Laura could see the drool running down its chin and its sharp fangs. Certain was contending with three others and had not noticed. Laura panicked. She wasn't sure she had the right space to fend it off without taking a serious injury. As she was awaiting its move, she noticed the creature slow down, then fall down splitting at the middle as it fell. A blade of rune steel emerged, and Laura finally smiled. 30. The Trial As Alrian became accustomed with the passage, he increased his speed. He needed to enter the temple as quickly as possible and find the trial. There were no guarantees as to what would happen, but at least he had a chance. It didn't look like the temple was overrun yet. He had heard nothing behind him, so it appeared as though he had entered without attracting any attention. If the Blighters discovered their fallen friend, they would not know where to look. The passage was long and winding. Luckily, there were no turns to take, so he could move fast and not worry about losing his way. But that was about to change. The passage ended in a set of stairs. Alrian ran up as fast as he could without risking a fall. He looked up and could not see the end of the stairs. Finally, he reached the end, which was not an exit. It was a dead end. Alrian examined the walls with his light and could see nothing of use. The ceiling at the landing was very low, so he tried pushing on that instead. It moved slightly. Encouraged by the movement, Alrian pushed more, and a piece of stone above him rotated, acting like a trap door. Alrian felt around with his hands and found something. It was a rope of some kind. He tugged at it, and a simple rope ladder fell down and landed on his head. He pushed it away, then tested it. Feeling satisfied, Alrian climbed up and hauled himself out of the hole. He was in a tiny room with no other furnishings and only one open doorway. Here we are, Alrian whispered. He dusted himself off and left the room immediately. He found himself in a corridor with the option of going left or right. It was well lit, so he let his light vanish. This isn't good. I'll try the path on the right. He walked quickly down the corridor, hoping to establish if it was the right way. He passed several rooms that looked like they were sleeping quarters, but nobody was around. Makes sense. Everyone will be out fighting. But that didn't help him. He had no idea where the trial would be. He came to another crossroads and had another decision to make. Right again, he decided, and headed off. This time he emerged in a large hall. Weapons lined the walls, and there was a square marked out in the center of the room. This is not it, he decided. But he did notice another doorway at the other end of the room and kept going. He pressed through and found a staircase going up. May as well try it, he whispered. He was trying to keep upbeat, but he felt so frustrated at not knowing what the vault of silence even looked like. I probably should have asked Certain or Ashram more about it. They could have at least told me where to look, he thought but nobody had expected there to be such trouble. The staircase wound up and up, and rays of daylight stole through the occasional slit. Alrian didn't bother trying to look through. He had no time. He noticed a doorway at the top bathed in light. He ran for it and burst through. Alrian emerged onto a rooftop of some sort. The sun blinded him for a second, and he had to adjust. There was a lone monk on the roof, firing arrows down at the horde of tainted. His tall build gave him a good vantage over his targets. From this view, Alrian decided that things looked even worse. Hello, Alrian shouted as he approached. The monk looked back in surprise but resumed his attacks. I need your help, Alrian said when he reached the monk. Whatever it is, we are in greater need. Are you a wizard? the monk said. Yes, I am here to do the trial of will. It's vital that you take me there as soon as possible, Alrian said. If you don't help me, there won't be a temple left to do the trial in, the monk said. He motioned with his head, and Alrian looked over to see what he meant. There were streams of blighters climbing the walls, using the nooks and crevices built up by the passage of time. If I help with this, 
You'll take me to the trial? Aurion said. I'll escort you myself and introduce you. My name is Graham, the monk said. Let's work together then, Graham. I'm Aurion. Is there a leader here? I would say so. Look over there. See that lone, tainted one? Graham said. Yes, you might be right. First, we can deal with these blighters who are advancing and see his reaction. Aurion took up a position next to Graham and started building up his spark. He formed up many spheres and infused them with fire and hurled them down at the blighters. There was a punch of force behind each one, so not only did the affected blighters catch fire, but they also lost their handholds and tumbled down, taking others with them. Where have you been? This is much faster, Graham said. Trying to get here, we had to bunker down during the storm. Alrian launched another volley, taking out the next row of hopeful blighters. Must be the work of a wizard. Someone has to be coordinating all these tainted and blighters. Haven't seen anything like this in my entire life. The only edge we've had over the tainted is that they weren't organized. This is too much. Graham launched another arrow and took out a blighter that had been hiding and had dodged the previous attacks. After that attack, there seemed to be a lull. They're planning the next move. Look at that tainted one, Graham said, pointing out the same one as before. He was waving his hands and seemingly talking to himself. I think you're right. I'm not sure how effective my spells are at this range. Hard to aim, and he will probably see them coming, Aurion said. You ever worked with projectiles before? Graham said. Yes, I've sped up daggers over short distances, Aurion said. Let's try that, only with an arrow. I can aim true, but I can't shoot that far either. But if I line up the shot properly and you can provide enough force and ensure it flies straight, we can nail their leader, Graham said. Worth a try. Give me a moment. Alrian prepared a lance of air that he could catch the arrow within and propel forward. Are you ready? You have to act quickly. I won't be compensating for height, Graham said. Ready. Just let me know when you're firing, Alrian said. Now, Graham shouted. Alrian let loose the spell in anticipation and focused all his attention on the archer. He saw the arrow launching and caught it with his lance of air. The arrow increased its speed and hurled towards its target. However, the aim was slightly off, and all the arrow did was grace the ear of the tainted one. He screamed in pain and looked over. When he noticed Alrian and Graham standing together, he paused and then started running. Not bad for a first. If you can repeat that same level of force, I can aim the next shot better. But it's going to be more difficult with a moving target. Graham already had the next arrow knocked and was aiming at the tainted one. Just a moment. Alrian prepared another spell and watched Graham closely. Any minute now. There, Graham said and launched his arrow. Alrian repeated his spell, but this time tried to have less impact on the arrow's path. It flew away with rapid speed toward the target. Alrian tracked its progress and was unsure if it would hit, but Graham had aimed true, and the arrow struck the man in the head and he dropped immediately. Wow, great shot, Alrian said. Thanks, but I had help. If you wouldn't mind assisting again, Graham said. Alrian looked back and saw another wave of blighters preparing to climb over the temple walls. He prepared and launched another wave of fireballs, this time completely incinerating all those that had reached the top. They waited patiently for another minute, but no more blighters followed their fallen. I think we've done enough here. Let's go, and I'll settle my end of the bargain. Graham put his bow over his shoulder and ran towards the stairwell. Do you know certain? Aurian asked as they descended. Yes, great monk with an even greater weakness. He will be missed, Graham said. He has returned. He guided me here and showed me the secret passage, Aurion said. I've never heard of anyone returning after being banished and betraying our secrets, too. I'll be glad to see him again, but I'm not sure if he can rejoin us, Graham said. That would be a shame. Aurion knew his friend had pinned so much on being able to return to the temple. He would do all he could to help that become a reality. As they weaved through the various passages and rooms, Aurion realized that he would never have found his way in time. The temple was a maze, and he had trouble keeping track of the way they had gone. This place is huge, Aurion said. Yes, it's been extended constantly over its lifetime. It's a great deterrent for attackers. Something that will be tested today, Graham said. You know anything about the Trial of Will, the Vault of Silence? H have you seen it? Aurion said. I only know of its location. Unfortunately, I can offer no other help, but that's all you need. Alrin appreciated the monk's straightforward approach. 
I appreciate it. Time is of the essence. You are welcome. You have helped us greatly already. I would be interested to hear your story at another time. It would be a curious one for sure. You would need a special reason to turn up here at such a time and still require to take the trial. It's an impossible quest, one that I hope to achieve regardless, Alrian said. Sounds like a challenge. I wish you luck, Alrian. I cannot stay, but I hope we meet again. Graham left the young wizard standing before an impressive set of doors. Unlike the rest of the temple, they were made of a strange metal. Alrian pushed them open, and they floated inwards with ease. Inside was a great chamber, which looked like it had been carved out of the rock. There were four monks sitting cross-legged on the ground. Close the doors behind you, Alrian, one of the monks said. Alrian followed the instruction immediately, then continued to approach. I'm sorry this is such a rush. I need to take the trial immediately, Alrian said. We know who you are and why you are here, the second monk said. Great, how do I start it? Why do you deserve to take this trial, the third monk said. I need to fulfill my quest. I need the power of will to succeed, Alrian said. All could use it, but few can use it. Why you, the fourth monk said. I just told you, I needed to cast the spell, the spell to end the blight, Alrian said. And why do you deserve that responsibility, the fourth monk said. It was given to me, Alrian said. Responsibility is not given, it is taken and born, the fourth monk said. I accepted this quest and all it entails. Yes, I have faltered on my way, but I have made it here today. Isn't that proof enough? Alrian said. Why do you deserve it? The fourth monk said. I don't have time for this. Enemies are at the gate, an army bigger than you have ever seen. Why all this questioning? Alrian said. Only those who are deserving can perform the trial, the first monk said. Why are you deserving? the fourth monk said. Aurion was getting increasingly frustrated. He didn't have time for this. Wraith and all his creatures could break through at any moment. He racked his brain for the right response. He needed a way to convince them. Suddenly he remembered Certain's words. Yes, that was it. I am deserving because I have encountered many setbacks on the way here. I have been almost killed, turned away by people, and almost buried alive in the sand. But I persevered, because will is about persevering no matter what, getting up and trying again. It's about knowing that eventually you will succeed, Arian said. The monks did not respond. Minutes seemed to pass. Arian did not try to add anything. He knew nothing else would affect them. You are deserving. Go forth and perform the trial. You may enter the Vault of Silence, the first monk said. He gestured with his hand and a glowing portal opened in between the four monks. Alrian walked closer and was amazed by what lay within. 31. The Vault of Silence Alrian was in a completely white room. As soon as he entered, he turned back to look at how he had entered, and the entry was gone. He was completely sealed in. That's a little unnerving. But the wonder of the space he was in overcame that. With care, he walked around the vault, examining all the walls. They were perfectly smooth and white, built from a material he didn't recognize. There were no seams anywhere. It was as if the whole space was one surface. The vault of silence. It certainly is impressive, but very minimal. There is nothing here, Alria thought. He reached out and touched the wall. It felt cool to the touch, but was impossibly smooth. He ran his hand around the wall, feeling for any inconsistency in it. There were none. I suppose the trial is to find a way out. As he walked through the vault, his mind was telling him that something was wrong. He stopped, trying to puzzle it out. My footsteps are not making any sound, he said. But no words came out. He tried to call out. No sound was made at all. This vault is actually silent. That seems impossible, Arian thought. But no matter what he did, there was no sound. It was a bit overwhelming, so he sank down and sat on the floor, leaning his back against the wall. I'm here. I can't make a sound, no matter what I do, and I need to get out. 
but it's a trial of will, so that has to be the key. A certain said perseverance is vital. I'll examine every part of the vault to see if there's any weakness or secret. He stood up and walked around the room, taking his time to feel the entire surface. It took a long time, but he managed to complete a circuit, with only the ceiling and other high places unchecked. I'll try a spell. He gathered his spark and prepared a wave of force. He spread it out like a blanket and ran it across the ceiling and other areas he could not access. He didn't notice any resistance to the spell. It seemed that the surfaces were all identical and there were no imperfections or secret nooks. At least my magic works here, Alrion said to himself. He sat down again and thought about how to pass the trial. He had one other tool to try. He unsheathed his sword and examined the diamond. It wasn't glowing at all. Wherever I am, it's not close to the blight monsters. That may mean something, he thought. Holding the sword, he tried several times to pierce or damage the walls. As before, there were no signs of damage. Maybe it's a matter of breaking down the wall without anything external. That would take willpower and persistence. I have an advantage because I'm a wizard, Alrian thought. He was happy with the plan and gathered his spark once more. He systematically hit the entire room with waves of force, then rotated into pinpointing an exact spot. Since the vault didn't seem to take any damage, he increased the intensity slowly to a level he didn't normally try. This is good training, if nothing else. Soon he tired, though, and the room appeared perfectly untouched. This will require further thought but his mind was not at ease. He kept thinking back to his friends and the assault on the temple. Time was not something he had ample supply of. Vincent, it's a relief to see you here. How did you find your way? Certain said, as he knocked down another blighter and stood back to back with Lara. You gave me directions, remember? When we found out that there was going to be an attack on the temple, I rushed here immediately, Vincent said. We'll have to hear your story later when we're not about to get killed, Lara said. I'll cover us. You two make a path through to the temple, Vincent said, as he sliced through another two blighters. Certain took the lead, using his attacks to knock the blighters away as far as possible. And Lara stood close behind, taking out any trying to attack from strange angles. As a unit, the three of them managed to slowly work their way to the temple entrance and take cover between the vast columns of the entrance area and the temple walls. If we make it back there, will the monks let us in? Vincent said. They should, if we can make it safe enough to risk it, Certain said. That's quite an ask, Lara said, slashing at another blighter. The reduced space meant that there was less space for the blighters to attack them, but it also meant it was harder to strike back. Do you have any other interesting things to throw? Certain said. Only a few, and I'm saving them for later. But I have something that should help us get inside, Lara said. We'll need it, Vincent said, cutting down another blighter and kicking the lifeless body away. As they neared the main entry, they saw the monks shooting arrows and throwing metal discs through a rectangular slit in the massive metal doors. Here's the plan. I'll create a space, you do some sort of diversion, then we'll get the monks to sneak us in, Vincent said. That sounds possible, but we need to tell them the plan. We may be stranded otherwise, Certain said. They fought their way closer, so Certain could speak with the monks. Friends, if we can make a safe opportunity, can you open the doors, Certain said. The banished one returns. Interesting timing, one of the monks said. I am here to help. Let us in so that we may recover, then fight again, Certain said. Let them try. If they can create a gap, we can manage the doors, a second monk said. Very well, do your best, the first monk said and ducked to let his companion fire another arrow. When you're ready, Certain shouted to Vincent. The blacksmith waved his hand to signify that he understood, then started advancing. His blade whirled with skill as he stepped forward, pressing the blighters back with his fury. In their surprise, he managed to cut down a tainted one and push the offensive even further. Lara followed close behind, watching Vincent's progress. He needed to wait as long as possible so that they would have time and space to enter the temple. The blighters started to rally again, the initial surprise wearing off. Vincent saw some shades in the distance moving in and knew that his attack was losing its effectiveness. Lara noticed too and lobbed a glass vial into the crowd just past Vincent. It broke and released plumes of thick black smoke. 
That's the signal, Vincent thought, and quickly retreated. As he ran, he heard the giant doors begin to open. Some of the blighters were ignoring the smoke and starting to advance. I hope this works, Vincent thought, looking back. He wouldn't have nearly as much time as he hoped for. Certain and Laura were at the door, just inside and waving him in. A monk pointed to three blighters running ahead of the pack, trying to intercept Vincent. That's not a problem. Lara snatched three metal discs off a nearby monk and let them loose. Just as Vincent reached the doors, the three blighters sank to the ground and the great doors closed once more. Another monk said, Now that you are here, you can make yourselves useful. Just let me catch my breath, <laughs> Vincent said with a laugh. We are not by any means safe, but we have earned a small breather, Certain said. Very small breather. I saw some shades advancing before I came back. These doors will not hold them. We need to ensure the temple is ready to be defended. We are already taking care of that, one of the monks said, steel and fire in his eyes. Alrian woke up. He looked around in amazement. How did I fall asleep? He reviewed what he remembered happening. He had inspected the entire vault and cast multiple spells, testing the integrity of the walls. He had even tried fire spells, too. Nothing had worked. Then I was exhausted and sat down to take a break. How long was I asleep? Arian wondered. He had no time for sleep or resting. But something was strange indeed. If he had slept, what had happened outside? Was there a chance that his friends had defeated Wraith? This just doesn't make sense. I have no idea how much time has passed. Wherever he was, he was completely sealed away from the outside world. There were no signs of passing time whatsoever. No time for solving that. I'm rested, so I must keep trying. He stood up and did a quick lap of the room. There was nothing new. He had tried his main spells, but he hadn't tried his new spells. Maybe Ashra was on to something. Maybe earth spells are effective here, Alrian said to himself. He focused his mind, trying to feel a source of water or earth nearby. But nothing resonated at all. There wasn't even any in the walls. The walls aren't made of earth. I'm confused, Aurian thought. He had tried force. He had tried inspection and care. And nothing had achieved any results. Maybe I just need to will a door. It was a bit of a crazy thought. But perhaps some out-of-the-box thinking was required to escape this vault. He approached a wall, closed his eyes, and imagined a door opening in it. The door shimmered and glowed and was big enough for him to step through. Alrian opened his eyes and observed the wall. It was unchanged. Maybe it's a trust exercise, too. He repeated his visualization technique and, instead of opening his eyes, stepped through his newly imagined door. The wall smacked him in the face and he stumbled. Not quite there, but at least he had a new avenue to try. Bang, bang, bang. The great doors of the temple were under assault by three shades. Nothing the monks could throw through the slits in the door had any effect on them. The door is lost. It's just a matter of time, Vincent said. Time is everything. If what you said is true and your son is in the vault of silence, he needs as much time as possible, said Rengen, the seeming leader of the monks' defenses. Have you undergone the trial? Certain said. I cannot say. Rengen said. I guess we keep annoying them then, Laura said, hurling more discs through the slits in the door. One of the shades bent down to peer through the slit, and Laura let loose another disc that hit it between the eyes. Oh, I think he's angry, Laura said, judging the reaction of the shade. The blows against the door stopped. Maybe you convince them to go away, Vincent said. Listen carefully, Certain said. Among the general clamor, there was a sound of heavy footsteps. Are they charging the door? Lara said. Everyone move back. Defense positions are on the entry, Rengen said. The monks all stepped back and moved their ammunition to further back in the room. With a gigantic crash, the door bent, and one of the three shades pushed through and emerged in the room. Now the real fight begins, Vincent said. Certain and Lara moved next to him, and all three readied themselves. 32. Time and time again. Alrium bashed the wall in frustration. As always, it made no sound and had no impact, ruining any possible satisfaction from the act. 
This is insane. How do I get out? I don't even care about this stupid trial. I need to help my friends, Arian thought. He had no idea what was going on outside. Everyone could be dead for all he knew. There's that one spell, the light bomb that he had been forbidden to use. There was nobody else here, and it had seemed ridiculously effective. I've nothing to lose. Let's try it. He built up his spark cautiously and remembered how he had built it. He combined the light, fire, and force into the unique combination and let it build and build. Once he had injected all of his power, he let it go. He planned for it to explode once it reached the furthest wall. As the bomb impacted, the walls began to shimmer. But instead of being destroyed, they were absorbing and repelling the force. Oh no, Alrian thought, before his world was enveloped in light. We need to keep them separated if we have any chance of doing this, Vincent said. The three shades were fighting together, and any time there seemed to be an opening, more blighters flooded into the entryway. We will try and contain the rest if you focus on that one, Renjin pointed at the shade nearest the wall. Excellent choice. We may be able to steer him into the corner. Lara grabbed a handful of the monk's metal discs and started to advance. As we discussed, Lara and Certain, you create the opportunity and I'll capitalize, Vincent said. Lara dashed forward, launching more discs at the shade. If only Aurion was here to make them more effective, she thought. She did miss him and wanted him by her side. But he was the reason they were fighting, and chances were he had made it to his trial by now. Just make it back safely, she thought, and continued her assault on the shade. The discs bounced harmlessly off, but the shade was annoyed and focused his attention on her. Certain dashed in, raining blows on the shade's stomach, then disappearing. The shade whirled quickly to counterattack, but Certain was gone. As it turned to face Lara again, it noticed too late that Vincent was there, swinging his sword. The shade moved quickly to block it with his right arm, but it made a critical mistake. The sword cut cleanly through and the severed arm dropped to the ground. The shade howled in pain, a strangely muffled and muted sound despite the high volume. Nice one, Lara said, as Certain and Vincent retreated. We weren't fast enough, so the surprise is lost. It will be more cautious now, Vincent said. True, we will need to be more cunning. Lara, is your blade made of the same material? Yes, thanks to Vincent. I see where you're going with this. It won't expect her to attack up close. Let's try that, Vincent said. This time he advanced upon the shade, whirling his sword in large arcs, capturing its attention. After having a taste of the rune steel, it was keen not to have another. With the shade occupied, Certain moved in to attack from the side. He got in several quick blows, which unsteadied the shade. It didn't move to counter, though, as it was carefully watching Vincent. The shade wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. However, it had made another mistake in not looking for Lara. While the fight was carried on, Lara had crept through the other concurrent battles and sliced the occasional blighter in her path. But now she was positioned behind the shade, and it had no idea of her location. I don't think I can kill it from behind, but I can do some major damage. When she saw the shade was completely occupied, she quickly stalked behind it, leapt and drove her dagger into the creature's neck. The shade lurched back in pain, grasping for the dagger. Lara pulled it out and rolled away. As the shade lost its balance, Vincent lunged forward with his sword and pierced the shade through the heart. The strike was precise and deep, and within a second the shade perished. It fell to the ground, lifeless. The other two shades recoiled in pain and looked over. One of them became quite enraged and grabbed a nearby monk who was momentarily distracted by the commotion. The monk cried out in pain, communicating the anguish that the shade now felt. I think somehow things just got worse, Lara said. You could be right, Certain said. Vincent removed his sword and turned his attention onto the other shade. Alrius slowly regained consciousness. His body ached and he had no strength. As his eyes opened fully, he sat up and examined his body. Everything was fine. He just felt incredible pain. Once he had done that initial check, he looked around the room. It was exactly the same as before. Nothing had happened. Nothing, except almost killing myself. He reached for his spark and found that it was not available. He had used up all his power. I keep failing. Why? 
He lay down and looked at the ceiling, hoping for a breakthrough. What he did attain, though, was sleep. Alrian awoke, not knowing how long had passed, but his back was stiff and his muscles restless. I must have been asleep for hours, but everything is still the same, and I'm still here. What does this all mean, Alrian thought, running his hands through his hair. There was only one possible explanation. Time had to act differently within the vault. It was the only way he could think of to explain how long he had been toiling with no answer. Shouldn't I be hungry? But he wasn't hungry or thirsty. He was just in this place, unable to leave. I have recovered my strength. I'm going to train while I think of another way out, Alrian decided. The decision triggered a memory of the notebook message that he had recently received. Time is always against us. Use it to your advantage. I thought the message was about being stuck in the sandstorm or my training. But maybe it's about this. Regardless, it seemed practical. He would find a way out, but while he pondered the solution, he would use the time he had available to train. If he had any additional time here, he would put it to good use. He was going to emerge more capable in many ways, not just one. Vincent and Certain stepped back, exhausted. They had managed to defeat another shade, capitalizing on its anger and finding an opening. But they were quite spent. Lara looked around at the monks. Many had fallen and many were wounded. This doesn't look too good, Lara said. No, this space is becoming too hard to defend, Vincent said. I was going to say the same thing, but I wanted to wait until you topple that second beast. It's time to pull back, Renjin said. Something else prepared, Vincent said. Of course, we're not just sitting on our hands while you take down shades. Renjin let out a piercing whistle with his hands and the monks started to retreat. Vincent and Laura followed closely and Certain was helping another monk get away. Once they all passed into the main passage, Renjin directed them around a corner. Now, he shouted. Two monks hit a wall with a coordinated strike and it started to fall over, blocking the passage. This will buy us some time. Fall back, Renjin said, directing the monks to retreat even further. This is our home, and it's a maze. We can use that to our advantage. And the Vault of Silence, Vincent said. At the heart of the temple, it's where we make our last stand. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, Certain said. You have fought with honor today, brother. I will stand for you when this is over, Renjin said. That is a great honor coming from you. I will continue to be worthy of your praise, Certain said. Take a position in one of these rooms. You can rest a little until they break through, then ambush them, Renjin said. The rooms he pointed to were all tiny, single-occupant nooks. Vincent took the first one, Laura the second, and Certain the third. The other monks distributed themselves down the passageway, similarly hidden and waiting. A giant crash and the sound of rubble echoed down the passageway. They're making progress. Get ready, Renjin shouted while he was standing in the middle of the passage, monitoring the enemy's progress. Here they come, he shouted. He ran down past the first set of rooms and waited. A stream of blighters ran down the passageway, heading straight for Renjin. As soon as the first one attacked, the defenders emerged from the nooks and cut down the blighters from the side. The whole encounter was over within seconds. The next way was not as hasty, and the third shade was standing behind them. It's probably directing them, springing the traps. They're crafty, Laura said. Yes, it's a shame they're not just dumb beasts. They're certainly strong enough to qualify. At least the narrow passageway here helps with numbers. But we won't be able to flank the shade, so we may need to retreat again, Vincent said. You're right. Rengen will call it. Just keep up the fight, Certain said. I never said I was going to stop. It's just more challenging. Vincent stretched his shoulders and prepared for the next wave of blighters. As predicted, the narrow corridor suited the defenders, and the blighters were unable to make a dent in them. Seeing this, the shade began to advance by itself. Two monks tried using the rooms to ambush the creatures, but it knew they were coming, and they didn't have enough space to maneuver. They were crushed quickly. It has the advantage here for sure, Certain said. Let's go back to Renjin, Vincent said. The three of them retreated and joined the monk leader. Unfortunately, this isn't a simple change of tactics. Much of the ground we will retreat to is the same layout. We need to balance safety and time. If we retreat too soon, we will be defeated too quickly, Renjin said. 
I saw your monks topple a wall. Isn't there a way we can make a better space? Lara said. There could be something. You come with me. Search and hold here. Retreat as you need to. Renjin dashed down the passage with Lara and showed her a few spaces further down. I think this could work, but we would need these two walls knocked down and these over there, Lara said. That can be done. I'll task some monks to assist. Hopefully we have enough time, Renjin said. Is it possible to have them one strike away from falling over? Lara said. Should be. Why? I think that could work better. Bring the monks and I'll talk you through it. Lara had a smile on her face. This might just work, she thought. The smile, her reaction to imagining the last remaining shade go down. 33. A Losing Battle Certain threw a punch at the shade, then rolled away before it could retaliate. Fall back, he shouted and led the retreat. They had held up the shade as best as they could, but it moved forward with relentless power, and they couldn't use their numbers to overwhelm it. Don't worry, Laura will have a good ambush cooked up, Vincent said. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about them having enough time to prepare it, Certain said. If that's your concern, perhaps I can help, Vincent said. As they turned the corner, he waited instead of joining the rest. As he heard the shade lumbering through, he sliced low and fast, aiming for the feet. He managed to connect, slicing off one of the shade's feet and causing it to tumble. Vincent hesitated, wondering if he could get in a fatal blow. Don't risk it! Come back! Certain shouted. His friend's advice tipped the scales in one direction, and Vincent ran off to join the rest. That will certainly help, Renjin said. Should slow it down a little. How's things back there, Vincent said. Almost ready. Don't lose too many up here. We will need them to spring the ambush. It's your command again. Just give us the orders, Vincent said. Just follow my lead. Here it comes, Renjin said. The shade walked slower, but it seemed otherwise unfazed by the loss of a foot. It walked on the stump instead, losing a little of its balance in the process. Herring strikes only. We need to annoy and slow it down, Renjin shouted. Many of the monks used arrows or discs to pester the shade, and it began to stop trying to block them. One monk got a little too greedy with the arrows, and the shade suddenly closed the gap between them and grabbed the monk with its right hand. Renjin loosed his bow immediately, putting the monk out of his misery. Retreat, Renjin shouted. He led the group back into a slightly wider room with multiple rooms off it. You need to get him into the middle of this room, Renjin said. Done. Leave it to us. Vincent stood at the entry of the room to ensure the shade saw him. Once it arrived, it charged immediately at Vincent. Good to see I have its attention, Vincent said, stepping back and parrying the shade's attack. It put Vincent off balance, and he struggled to block the next attack. Certain circled around, trying to find an opening to capitalize on the creature's compromised balance. It was wise to his tricks, whirling and stepping to keep its distance while still keeping Vincent in focus. Vincent kept retreating, leading the creature closer and closer to the middle of the room. The shade increased its onslaught. Vincent desperately parried attack after attack, losing ground faster than he had wanted. You're too close! Get away! Laura shouted. Certain retreated instantly, but Vincent could not. If he gave the shade any opening at all, it would have him. Just do it anyway, Vincent shouted. Laura did not hesitate and gave the signal. The walls to either side of Vincent shook and started to collapse inwards. Vincent dived to the ground, trying to stay clear of the rubble. The shade paused its attack and focused on batting away the debris from the collapsing wall. Two additional walls came down behind the shade, and as they fell, monks emerged from the dust and attacked the shade from behind. It quickly turned to face these foes angrier than ever. Vincent stood up and navigated the unstable ground. He was joined by three other monks, who could now attack the shade in greater numbers. As they started to land blows, it wheeled around and lunged at them. The monks darted back, only one of them receiving a glancing injury. In all this commotion, Laura dashed in and dodged the monks, the crumbled walls, and the shade's flailing attack. She maneuvered in between it all and planted her dagger squarely in the creature's heart. It shuddered and released a muted cry. Certain stepped up and slammed the dagger with his palm, forcing it the rest of the way and killing the shade. It toppled to the ground with a crash surrounded by the broken walls and stones. The victory was short-lived. As the shade fell, more waves of blighters entered the room. 
They were followed by tainted ones, clearly giving the orders. It never ends, Lara said. It will eventually, Certain said, not elaborating. But they were all thinking the same thing. There was only one way this fight could end. They needed a miracle. Reinforcements coming through. Change over, Renjin shouted as he came up to the front. The injured and tired monks fell back, and the others took their place on the front lines. The room was bigger and full of hazards, but it was still tighter than the entry hallway, so they had a chance at holding it. Laura stood back, aiming for the tainted ones. She took down two before they caught on and stood much further back, directing the blighters from afar. This might sound crazy, but if we can continue this rotation and there's no more shades, we can hold this, Vincent said. Until we have no energy left, yes, but for quite a time. Let's hope there's nothing else to throw at us, Renjin said. It was clear the leader was tiring, despite not fighting as much as some others. The strategy worked for a little while, the scores of fallen blighters helping by providing additional barriers and hazards for the enemies to traverse. But the defenders slowed, and little by little they were whittled down. Their front line retreated. Before long they were holding at the end of the room. Why don't we fall back again, use the narrow corridor? Lara said. It's hard to reinforce, and we are getting closer and closer to the vault. Any setback at all would have us practically running backwards, Renjin said. So we're going to hold here as long as possible, Lara said. Exactly. Renjin was about to shout out again, but abruptly stopped. Vincent noticed it too. The blighters were all moving to the sides of the room, filling the space but leaving a passageway through the middle. The tainted ones too. I don't like the look of this, Vincent said. It's an odd arrangement. Certain leaned against a wall to catch his breath. Stomp, stomp, stomp. A shape was slowly advancing from the distance. Each step was measured and powerful, deliberate and strong, designed to cause fear. The monks looked at each other, a mixture of curiosity and anxiety crossing their faces. Renjin was resolute, overly so. Vincent could see him put it on a brave face for the other monks. As the shape advanced, it began to take shape. No, Laura said softly. Is it him? Vincent said, peering into the distance. Definitely, Certain said, clenching his fist. The shape continued to advance. What is it? You seem to recognize it, Renjin said. You'll see soon enough. It's our enemy, Laura said, spitting onto the ground. In answer to her question, the creature arrived and stood in the middle of the room. It's a shade? Renjin said. And here we are at last. Thank you for the welcoming party, Wraith said. His voice still had the muted and shrill harshness of a shade, but it was more controlled and understandable. It speaks. What are you? Renjin said. I am Wraith. I am the epitome of the power and majesty of the Blight. I have come here to destroy your pathetic little trial and claim the wizard for myself. Wraith said. I've never seen this before, Renjin said to Certain as quietly as possible. It's a wizard turned into a shade. He's managed to overcome this form and use it to his advantage. When we encountered him, he was still wrestling with it. But he seems in control now, Certain said. Are you going to be smart and give in, or are you going to die horribly, Wraith said. You will not reach the heart of this temple, you foul thing. We have already dealt with three of your kind, Renjin said. His monks rallied behind him. Don't underestimate him. We don't know how powerful he is, Lara said. I won't. I expect I won't survive this encounter either. I will make a stand here. Certain, stand with me and learn what you can to aid the monks. Vincent and Lara, you should retreat and prepare to fight him again. I fear you will have the best chance against this monster, Renjin said. Are you sure? Certain said. Of course. The rest of you go now, Renjin said. Vincent and Lara turned and ran swiftly out of the room and into the dark corridor beyond. Leaving already? I am glad someone has the courage to stand here. What's your answer? Wraith said. You will die here. Renjin said. Before Wraith could respond, the monk charged ahead. Renjin quickly feigned an attack, then dashed behind to try an additional strike. None of the blighters or tainted ones moved to protect their master. Wraith let Renjin's attack connect. He moved slightly with the blow, but was otherwise unharmed. 
Renjin darted back to his waiting monks. Was that it? Wraith said, mockery in his voice. Just an initial attack, Renjin said. Charming. I'll allow this for now, but I can't let it drag on. I have other business to attend to, Wraith said. I need to prepare something. The rest of you attack in constant waves. Test all of his body for weak areas, but don't stand around. Dodge away after each strike. Let there be no cheap deaths. Renjin sat on the floor, legs crossed and eyes closed. The monks attacked as ordered, landing blows all over Wraith's body. Mostly he let them land, others he swatted away, but subsequent attacks to that area left no mark. A shade would have felt at least some impact. His form can't be that different. He must be using some sort of spell, Certain thought. He looked back at Renjin, intrigued by what the older monk was doing. It had to be something more than his own technique of gathering energy into a single strike. Oh, a monk said, rolling away, nursing a broken arm. He had been a little sloppy, and Wraith had punished him. I tire with these simple attacks. Show me something else, or I'm moving on, Wraith said. It is now time for you to answer for your actions, Renjin shouted. He stood, but his feet were not on the ground. He was hovering. Watch carefully, then retreat. My final act is a gift to you, a gift of time, and also a demonstration of what is possible. Farewell, Certain, and good luck. Renjin gently placed his hand on Certain's shoulder. Thank you for your generosity and leadership, Certain said. Renjin nodded and readied his stance. I call this the seven strikes of salvation, Renjin said. Wraith just laughed and waited. Renjin dashed forward at incredible speed. Certain could not follow him. It was as if Renjin appeared next to Wraith and delivered a stunning blow. The sound of the impact reverberated around the room. Wraith was knocked back slightly, but showed no other signs of damage. Before he could recover, Renjin appeared behind Wraith and circled around again at great speed, hitting the same spot a second time. This time, Wraith lunged out with his arm, but was too slow and Renjin slipped away. The super speed monk appeared above Wraith and dove down, striking this time with a foot on the same spot. The impact was so great that Wraith was forced to stumble backwards. Clearly, the attacks were beginning to have an effect. Wraith created a wall of stone around himself to prevent the next attack. But Renjin came again and passed through the stone as if it weren't there, landing another crushing blow. Wraith dropped to one knee, then quickly stood again. The older monk appeared back with the others, but before they could see anything, he was off again. Wraith held his arm out to block the strike. Renjin dodged under and with two successive palm strikes hammered the same spot again. Wraith was knocked over, skidding along the ground. He rose and dusted himself off. There was a small crack in his skin where Renjin had been attacking. That was only six. Is that all you have? Wraith said. Renjin was frozen in the pose of his last attack. He was motionless as a statue. Maybe you can't move anymore. Oh well, I'll enjoy this, Wraith said. He ran forward, leading with his right arm. As he connected with Renjin's head, something strange happened. An explosion of light appeared at the point of impact, knocking Wraith back to the end of the room. Renjin dropped to the ground. The monks rushed to his aid. Bring him with us and let's retreat, Certain said. Renjin had bought them some time and space, but it looked like at a great cost. 34. The Crossroads Arion let the spell dissipate and sank down with frustration. He had made the most of his confinement in the vault, but it was time to get out. He had tried many things, none which had worked. He knew that spells would not be the answer, so he tried many different tricks to use his will to alter the situation. Nothing had even looked like working. What am I missing? This vault doesn't seem to be a real space. Everything is wrong about it. The monks must have something to do with it. Maybe they are using their will to keep this place as is and prevent me from leaving. That must be what is happening, Aurian thought. If that was true, though, how could he counter that? He let his mind wander to imagine the construction of the vault. How would he build it if it was his own creation? He designed the entire construction in his mind down to the smallest detail. 
a model so impressive that if he could just flick a switch in his mind, it would become reality. Why can't I just do that? There was no reason why not. He took his model of the vault and implanted it on the surroundings. There seemed to be some sort of resistance, but he ignored it. His reality was fact, and it had the construction of the room in a particular way. He felt the walls vibrating and moving, as if they were alternating between different extremes. Finally they settled, and he knew that the vault was as he designed. Time for a change. He walked over to a wall and redesigned it. He added a doorway to the outside world. The wall reshaped itself to his command. He could see out into the room. There was a great battle going on. Time to make my grand entrance. It wasn't too early or too late. It was the perfect timing. There's no time, Certain said as he reached the heart of the temple. Vincent and Laura were in a defensive position in front of the four monks. Certain and the rest of the monks moved to the front of the room. They could hear Wraith stomping down the corridor towards them. The monks, bearing Renjin, placed him down carefully at the rear of the room and joined their companions. Any weaknesses you can help us with? Laura said. No, he seems almost impervious to harm. Renjin managed to create a small hole in Wraith's skin, but that was after repeated attacks of amazing power. He seems stronger than when we first encountered him. I think he's using his spells to somehow shield his body further, Certain said. Maybe Aurion will be able to counter, but there's still a good chance runesteel will work, Vincent said. I hope so. Good luck to all. Certain turned to face the sound of the Wraith entering. Here we are. Everyone together at last. We never met officially, but I assume you are Alrian's father? Wraith said, pointing at Vincent. That's correct. And you are Branthor the monster? Vincent said. Actually, we did meet a long time ago, back when you were following your father around like a puppy, Wraith said. I don't remember. I guess you weren't that memorable without your costume, Vincent said. Are you still disappointed that you couldn't cut it? Don't take that out on me. Anyway, I am more interested in your son. Where is Alrian? Wraith said. He'll be here when he's ready. I've come all this way. It would be rude not to wait. You can entertain me instead, Wraith said. He raised his arm and sent spirals of earth and fire at Vincent. Look out, Laura shouted, pushing Vincent to the side. He rolled to the ground and held up his sword, blocking the last trail of fiery death and knocking it aside. Certain would have a decent attack if we can buy him some time and opportunity, Lara said. Seeing Renjin's attack, I'm not so sure how effective it will be, but it's worth a chance, Certain said. Very well, let's see what we can do. Vincent cautiously advanced on Wraith. Lara let loose a series of discs which bounced harmlessly off Wraith's chest, but did get his attention. You can't possibly hope to hurt me. I have become something more than any other wizard, Wraith said. That may be, but there is nothing that runesteel cannot cut through, Vincent said, twirling his sword with menace. Wraith watched the blade very carefully, which confirmed Vincent's suspicions. Despite his improved power and control, the blade was still effective. Wraith raised a wall of earth right in front of Vincent, but he sliced it in half and kicked it down. A wave of force tugged at his feet, and a spear of earth flew through the air. But Vincent used the momentum of force beneath him to roll to safety. Vincent quickly rose and kept walking, closing the distance between them. Laura crept forward from another angle, waiting for an opportunity. He doesn't know that my dagger is also rune steel. He may give me an opening. As Wraith focused on Vincent, she stalked closer and closer. This is it, she thought, and stepped forward with a quick slice. Wraith noticed that the last moment had moved just enough. The slice became a light grace, but it did break the skin. Wraith looked at her in horror. Too slow, Vincent said as he swung his sword. Wraith managed to blast Vincent back with a wave of force, slowing his strike and increasing the gap between them. Out of nowhere, Certain appeared and struck with his charged palm. The blow exploded with power and knocked Wraith back. He paused to examine his body. The crack created by Renjin was larger now and appeared to be an open wound, albeit minor. In a fury, Wraith whipped through the air with his arm. It created a diagonal wave of shearing force, striking all of his three opponents. All the surfaces that were hit suffered deep cuts, and all three limped back to a defensive position. That was our best shot, and he just blew us away, Lara said. 
True. I'm not sure how much more we can do, Vincent said. What's that? Certain said. They looked over and saw a shimmering doorway appear at the rear of the room, in between the four older monks. All they could see on the other side was white. A man stepped through. It was Alrian. Sorry to keep you waiting, he said. Alrian, Vincent shouted. He staggered to his feet and ran over to his son. Easy there, you're hurt. Alrian accepted the hug, then guided his father to crouch down. Alrian gathered his spark and used his healing spell, knotting the skin back together. That's different, Alrian said, but said nothing further. I feel like I should be saving you, not the opposite, Vincent said. Sorry, this is a once-off. You can save me again later, Alrian said. Good, that's better. Did you pass the trial? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Lara and Certain, come over here, Alrian said. You look different, better and stronger. Lara gave him a hug, too. Good to see you, Certain said, slapping Alrian on the back. Let me pat you up a bit. Alrian healed their wounds in the same way. Anything I should know, Alrian said. He's terribly strong, but the rune steel seems to work a bit. Do you have any ideas, Lara said. I think we should just leave. Renjin mentioned a secret passage in this room, Certain said. Find the passage. I'll deal with the wraith. Alrian stepped forward and looked at his enemy. Alrian, finally. We've all been waiting so long. What took you, Wraith said. I was busy. I see you have been too. Do you have any humanity left, Alrian said. Wraith just laughed. Maybe you just misplaced it. Why don't you just leave, Alrian said. Clearly, I can't do the trial, not with all you here, and it relies on those pesky monks. But you are here, so I'll settle for that. I made you an offer before, and it's still available. If you're feeling a little shy, I'll just accept on your behalf. It's easier that way, Wraith said. I won't join you. There's nothing you can say to convince me. Who said you needed to be convinced, Wraith said, and launched a rolling wave of earth at Alrian. The young wizard concentrated, then stopped the earth in its tracks, letting it settle back down into the ground. Oh, learned a few new tricks. That won't be enough. Wraith let loose with a stream of fire and earth, attacking in a crisscross pattern. Alrian extinguished the fire and knocked the earth back down to the ground. My turn. Alrian sent wave after wave of force at Wraith. Nothing happened as each one hit. Alrian did the same again, but altered with fire. Again, Wraith let each attack hit, and nothing happened. You thought that would work, Wraith said. Alrian did not respond, but tried again. This time, the waves of force alternated with waves of fire and earth. Like before, Wraith let them crash against him, but something was different. The ground around Wraith's feet sucked him in like quicksand. It quickly solidified, binding him in place. As he struggled to break free, Alrian fired an intensely bright, white-hot rod of fire directly at Wraith's chest wound. He roared in pain and broke his feet free. That smarts, it really does, but it's not enough. Wraith was trying to shake off the pain, but it seemed to linger. Alrian, we found the path. Come with us, Certain said. No, I have a chance. I can beat him, Alrian said. It's too risky. Just come with us. It'll be fine. Lara said. She's right, Alrian. You've done enough. Let's regroup and move forward, Vincent said. No, I'm sorry. I can't have this thing following me around forever. I need to deal with it now so I can focus on the next trial. Just go on ahead. I'll catch up. Alrian felt his friends had not moved, so he turned to face them. Please go. I need to do this. I promise I'll come and find you, he said. Very well, let's go. Don't keep us waiting, Vincent said. Alrian watched them go, then turned back to face his enemy. I see you are now alone. Such a pity, Wraith said. You sure do talk a lot, Alrian said. A grin stole across Wraith's face, and suddenly hundreds of projectiles flew towards Alrian. They came from every direction and were incredibly fast. He dove for cover and built an earth shield around himself. As fast as he could reinforce it, dents embedded in the surface at an alarming rate. In seconds, the whole thing would collapse. Alrian threw up more walls, opened an exit, and ran. With a crash, the whole thing toppled, and Alrian was scrambling for breath. You were saying, Wraith said, that you don't talk nearly enough, Alrian said, chuckling. 
I think I should be honest with you. It's only fair. You got a good attack in. I have to admire that. It's the least I expected from you. However, you can't possibly win. Why is that? The Blight has a power all its own. I can break the rules, enhance this already strong body even further, and employ a bag of tricks so large I can't even begin to tell you all about them. No spell you throw at me will be enough. So what do we do then? You come with me and we leave, and I bring you into the fold. I have great plans for us, Wraith said. For the last time, no, Arian said. As much as Wraith was a liar, there was probably some truth in his words. Alrian drew the rune steel sword, and the diamond glowed bright blue. You're definitely a piece of work, but I can cut you down to size, Alrian said, readying himself. 35. Infected. Alrian knew he had neither the skill nor the strength to wield the sword properly, but he knew it was effective, so perhaps he could create an opening that anyone could exploit. Wraith eyed the sword carefully, which told Alrian he had made the right choice. The creature must have remembered losing its hand. Alrian had one chance to make this work, so he prepared himself. Wraith wasn't ready to wait. He sent multiple waves of fire and earth before following them in himself. This is my shot, Alrian decided. He would not dodge the attacks. He would use them as a shield. As the attacks came in, Alrian did not move. He readied his sword in a lunge position, the blade pointing out at Wraith. Alrian gathered his spark and deflected or destroyed all the attacks that would hit. When the last wave of earth came and Wraith was right behind it, Alrian pierced a small hole in the wave and thrust his sword through. He let the rest of the wave hit him, committing everything to enhancing his single strike. Wraith thought that his attack had succeeded and was committed to grabbing Alrian. He noticed too late the sword emerging from the rock straight for his heart. All he could do was twist slightly, which was just enough. The rune steel sword pierced Wraith in the chest, but missed the heart. It sunk in right up to the hilt. Wraith reached out and grabbed Alrian by the neck. So near yet so far, Wraith said. His second finger turned ash black, and he jabbed Alrian with it. Alrian recoiled in surprise and fell back. It is done. You are mine now, Wraith said with glee, removing the sword and tossing it aside. No, Alrian cried, reaching for his neck. He could feel the wound pulsing. You are infected. It's only a matter of time now, Wraith said. Alrian backed away, stumbling over the littered rocks. He made it over to his sword and picked it up, rocking with the weight. You are weak now. It is overcoming your system. I must say you seem to be handling it well. Some become unconscious immediately, Wraith said. He slowly advanced towards Aurion. This can't be happening, Aurion said, shocked. How had he let this happen? He could have left with his friends as they wanted, but he had chosen to stay, and he had failed. Try and use your spark, I dare you, Wraith said. Aurion reached for it, hoping to find something to throw at his enemy, but the fire was tainted. It wasn't the pure heat he was used to. There was already a smoky black mass over it. Alrian recoiled again. Ah, that's right. By all means, reach through the filth and use the spark. You may as well speed things up. You need to get used to it. The real magic happens when you learn to accept it, Wraith said. No, never. I'll die before that happens, Alrian said. Impossible, I'm afraid. If you die, it just completes the process. The Blight has you now. Welcome. I'll find a way. There's always a way. Oh, there's that ritual you're looking for, but good luck casting that while infected. Not going to work too well, is it? Wraith said. He was right, and Aurion was scared. But deep down he knew something else, but he couldn't put his finger on it. As Wraith came closer and closer, Alrian scrambled for that thought in his brain, the one that had hope attached to it. He put aside all the fear and emotion and worries that coursed through him and focused on that thought. He found it and spoke it out aloud. I have passed the trial of will and left the vault of silence. The power of will is exercised by persistence and getting back up. 
This is not the end. This is another step on my journey. I will not submit to you in life or in death, Alrian said. Wraith stopped, puzzled by the outburst. Before he could move further, Alrian had already decided what to do next. Magic was not available to him, and his strength was quickly fading. But he had the power of will, which was not constrained by those things. He tapped into the reality around him and remade it into his design. The ground underneath Wraith suddenly dropped hundreds of feet, and sand filled its place. It was as if it had always been so, and the change was instantaneous. Wraith was now trapped within a prison of sand. Alrin did not revel in his victory. He stumbled over to the back of the room. He found the secret passage and tumbled down the stairs. With great difficulty, he picked himself up and dragged himself forward, using the sword as a walking stick. Just have to get out, Alrian thought. He pushed on for as long as he could before collapsing on the ground. Please help me, he thought finally. 36. Recovery Vincent started to slow down, and Certain did the same. The rest of the monks continued their escape. Laura stopped suddenly, looking at the other two. What is it? she said. Something has happened. Certain paused and listened carefully. I can't explain it myself. I just feel like Alrian needed us, Vincent said. Let us just wait a bit. We are far enough for relative safety, Certain said. The three of them waited in silence, staring back at the darkness behind them. The tunnel they were in was long and straight, with no indication how far it went. As the footsteps of the monks ahead became softer and softer, they were surrounded by true silence as they waited patiently under the earth. A strange sound surrounded them. It was like an immense amount of sand just shifted incredibly quickly. That shouldn't be possible. We must head back. Certain looked at the tunnel ahead and back at where they had come from. Go to the monks. They may need your assistance. The two of us can handle this. Just keep the door open for us at the other end, Vincent said. Thank you. I will accept your offer. Hurry back. I will see you soon. Certain ran off into the distance, and Vincent and Laura ran back the way they had come. What do you think happened? Laura said. Some sort of gigantic shift happened. That's what we heard. It doesn't matter who did that. It is bad news. Certain seemed to have felt it too, and he seemed quite shaken, Vincent said. He was definitely spooked but he was equally worried about the other monks. I don't know where that shift happened. He is right to be concerned. I have a bad feeling about this. Let's keep quiet and see what we can find. Laura increased her speed and Vincent kept up. The going was tough as the only guide they had was the tunnel wall. There were no lights and they weren't going to try and create any. Laura's pulse quickened as they ran, more from worry than from exertion. Aldrin had seemed off, like it was his last chance to do something. She hoped he hadn't run into more trouble than he could handle. He managed to survive last time. Maybe he's fine, she thought. The start of the tunnel was approaching, and a thin light crept in from the room above. Is someone there? Laura said. As they continued, they could see better. It's Alrian, Vincent said. He fell to his knees and cradled his son in his arms. He's alive, but he feels cold. Help me get him up, Vincent said. Together, the two of them hauled the young wizard up onto his feet, but he couldn't stand by himself. He seems a bit out of it, and his forehead is burning up. This doesn't feel right, Laura said. Let's just get him out of here, Vincent said. Together, they moved forward at a fast walk. Alrian, can you hear me? He said. There was no response. He must have passed out. It's like he's sick. You don't think? Laura said. We don't know. Let's not jump to conclusions. Whatever has happened, he got away. Our responsibility is to ensure that he gets to safety, Vincent said. Of course. Let's see if we can pick up the pace, Laura said. Alrian felt himself be picked up, but his body was so heavy. He couldn't help whoever was helping him. He had brief flashes of awareness, but it was so dark he couldn't distinguish them from when he blacked out. There were more voices soon, some calling his name but they seemed so distant, so far away. He didn't have the energy to respond. He could sense the concern, but he couldn't address it. All he could do was what he was already doing, which was letting them take him. He could feel the light and heat building around him, but he couldn't open his eyes. It was too difficult. 
The more he tried to exert himself, the more he felt the strange thumping in his heart. Better to rest and not stir that unwelcome addition. Finally, he was laid down, and he felt like he could finally rest. He let himself sink into the depth of sleep and forgot all his worries. They were for another time when he had the strength to deal with them. For a while, he was at peace. Alrian could sense the light, and it was annoying him. He tried to open his eyes. They did as instructed, and the room slowly became visible. His surroundings were familiar. He was in Ashra's hut. He sat up too quickly and nursed his head. Alrian, you're awake? How are you? Lara said. She was sitting by his side. The concern in her eyes was obvious. I've been better. What happened? We found you at the entrance of the secret tunnel, and we brought you here as quickly as possible. You're safe now, Lara said. Vincent walked over and crouched by Alrian's other side. Welcome back to the land of the living. You did well, son. Everything's all right now. Although you probably need more rest before you get back on your feet, Vincent said. Alrian nodded. He thought back to what had happened. He remembered the infection and quickly felt around his neck. The wound has healed, but you have been tainted, Vincent said. This, this isn't right, Alrian said. The memories came flooding back. There is a cure. You're working on it right now, remember? Ashra said from the other side of the room. But I can't learn to spell like this. There's always a way. But in the meantime, you need to know a few things. The blight travels different speeds in different people. Some change overnight. For others, it's a gradual process. I have done what I could to slow it down, and I feel like time is on our side. But it cannot be stopped with the tools we have at our disposal, Ashra said. What can I do? Have you felt your spark, Ashra said. Alrian thought back and remembered the feeling when he tried to access it before. Yes, I tried immediately. Wraith was quite pleased with himself at my reaction, Alrian said. Then you know not to touch it. Not under any circumstances. Not only will it speed up the transformation, but it will also put the cure at risk. We don't know how it works, Ashra said. I understand. This is very important. It's not worth it. You must find another way of dealing with things, Ashra said. Alrian looked around the room. I have your sword, if that's what you're after, Vincent said. Now's as good a time as any. I'm not particularly skilled with it, Alrian said. We can work on that when you get your strength back. Can you tell us what happened back there? I passed the trial, and I fought Wraith. Even with my best spells and tricks, all I managed to do was injure him with the sword. But my aim was off. It wasn't a fatal strike, and he had the opportunity to infect me, Arian said. It was an achievement for you to keep up with him in battle. He had us all beaten, Vincent said. From what I have been told, he is a formidable foe, an unnatural fusion of shade and wizard. How did you get away after he infected you, Ashra said. I had only one tool left, my will. I remade the structure of the temple, trapping him in a deep pit below the ground. I doubt it will kill him, but it was enough to escape, Alrian said. Remarkable that you mastered your will so quickly, Certain said as he joined them. I can't really talk about that. It's called the Vault of Silence for a reason, Alrian said, forcing out a shaky laugh. You are talking like one of the masters already, Certain said, chuckling. Are you able to do the same here, Ashra said. Vincent shot Ashra a strange look and was about to speak up when Ashra signaled him to be quiet. Alrian focused on his will and tried to replicate what he had done in the temple. It didn't feel the same, though. He couldn't seem to tap into the fabric of reality the same way. No, it's different. Maybe I don't have the same strength, Alrian said. It's not that, although I'm sure it is a factor. I believe the temple itself is either built in a unique way or sits upon a unique location. The temple facilitates the use of will and the bending of reality. It would explain why it's in the middle of the desert. That's my theory, at least, and your experience cements that in my mind, Ashra said. So what happened to the temple, Alrian said. Scouts have suggested that all the tainted have left. 
the temple is still intact, although heavily damaged. The remaining monks will be returning and building it back up, Certain said. Would you be joining them? Aurion said. I'm sorry, but I must. With the loss of Renjin and many others, our numbers have dwindled. It is my first responsibility to help repair what was done. Sounds like they have accepted you back, though, Aurion said with a smile. Yes, the flask didn't even factor in. It turns out my behavior is not unique. In many cases, it is expected. Thank you for convincing me to return. I would like to believe that I would have returned eventually, but how many years would have passed? You are welcome. In fact, I should be thanking you. With your guidance, I made it in time and completed the trial of will. You are now my senior. I will catch up to you, and I'll find you again to help with the completion of your quest, Certain said, bowing to Alrian. I look forward to it. Please don't hang around on my account. If you are needed there, please go, Alrian said. Certain approached Alrian and kissed him on the forehead. Where I come from, that is how we say goodbye to family we will not see for a long time. Take care, young wizard. When we meet again, I will be your equal. Certain bowed again and left the hut. By certain, I'll always consider you my teacher, Alrian said quietly after the monk had left. For now, you need to rest more. You will be safe here until you are ready to leave, Ashra said. I don't even know where to go next, Alria said. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. That's not a job for today, Laura stroked his arm softly. Are you hungry? Vincent said. I think so. Let's get you some food and rest. You need to build up your strength for our journey, Vincent said. If you insist, Alrian said, and rearranged himself to be in a better seated position. He had to focus on his recovery now and worry about the next step later. And with sleep came dreams. 37. A New Dream Alrian dreamed. Again the rush of images and scenes, a massive blur. Everything settled, and he saw his grandfather once more sitting at a desk. Alrian walked over. Grandfather, I need your help, Alrian said. I cannot help you. I am merely a guide to the knowledge within you, Granthian said. I am infected with the blight. Can you show me the cure? Alrian said. I already gave you the spell. You will know it when you are ready. How can I be ready when I am tainted? Alrian said with frustration. Granthian thought carefully, then responded. How can you cure others before you can cure yourself? He said. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Alrian said. You have the knowledge and you have the will. What's missing? Well, the third component would be spark, but I already have that. No, you have only half. What do you mean, Alrian said. Granthian stood up from the desk and gestured into the distance. A shimmering doorway opened, and Alrian ran through without a moment's hesitation. He was cold, really cold. Snow was falling and covered the ground. It was so thick as he walked, he seemed to be sinking into it. Alrian instinctively went to cast a fire spell, but stopped himself. Even if this is a dream, I can't use it, he thought. He trekked forward through the snow towards what looked like a summit. As he stepped onto it, he saw a woman with black hair and purple robes standing with her back turned to him. Hello, Alrian shouted over the wind but there was no response. She raised her hands and looked to be casting some sort of spell. Her body shimmered with magic, and within her pulsed a strange glow. Alrian walked closer, fascinated. As he approached, he noticed a strange heat within himself. He looked at his own body and noticed a fierce core burning inside. If he concentrated, he could also see a black tinge on the edges. He looked again at the woman and noticed she was different. Within her was a core of pure water, still and at peace. As he stared, she suddenly turned and looked directly at Alrian. Her eyes glowed an icy blue, and she reached out for him. Alrian awoke suddenly, feeling the heat of his surroundings immediately. Part of him wished for that cool to return. Did you have another strange dream? You seemed unusually restless, Lara said. Yes, 
I think it's a clue for my next step or, or trial, Alrian said. Let me hear it, Ashra said, coming over and sitting down. Alrian looked around. Where's my father, he said. He went to visit the monks to see how they were doing. I think he was restless sitting around here doing nothing. Don't worry, he will return soon. What was in your dream? My grandfather told me that spark was only half of what I needed for the spell. He created a doorway that took me to wintry place, a snowy mountain. At its peak, I found a woman who was casting some sort of spell. Only where I had a core of fire, she had one of water. And when she turned to look at me, her eyes were glowing blue, Arian said. That's very interesting. I think you have your next goal, Ashra said. You know where this is, Lara said. There are stories, but not confirmed, of a group of women. Some call them witches, others refer to them as mystics. They can cast magic of a different sort, from a different source. I had never really taken much stock in the stories, because I had no need to. But it seems plausible, Ashra said. Do you know any more about them? Where do they live? What can they do? Alrian said. Well, you already know where they live, deep in the north amongst the mountains, although there are stories that they travel and are hidden in many places, in plain sight. In terms of what they can do, it's hard to really distinguish fairy tales from the potentially real. Give some examples, Lara said. Healing, fortune-telling, granting wishes, and mind control, for example. Fairly outlandish, don't you think? Ashra said. That's useful, even if most of it is nonsense. It will help us find women who fit that description, Alrian said. Indeed, you may even find one on your way there. I think this is the right path for you. There is enormous potential. They may be able to assist you with the Blight's taint, or even show you how to harness their power, Ashra said. I have a goal, and I have a direction. How long will it take, Alrian said. You need more time to heal, because the journey is harsh. After you cross the desert, you need to travel quite a distance north. You should have horses for that. Then the trek into the mountains is not for the faint of heart. Have you been there? No, I haven't. Perhaps if I had, I could offer you more guidance. But you will have able companions, so you will be fine. The only other issue is the blight, Ashra said, pointing at Alrian's chest. What do I do about it? Alrian said. Don't use your spark for starters. Just use your will and whatever skill you can muster up with a sword. I also recommend meditating every day. The body resists the blight by itself. Any effort to assist it will buy you some more time. Thanks for everything. Are you sure you won't come with us? You can see the women of the north for yourself, these mystics, Alrian said. No, as before, my place is here and your quest is your own. Come visit me again, and I will hear your tales of them, Ashra said. As you wish, but if you change your mind, Arian said, I will not, but thank you for the offer. If you apply yourself, you can leave in a week, Ashra said. A week? Not sooner? That's up to you, but I won't let you leave here until it is safe. I have my ways, Ashra said with a grin on his face. Yes, I've noticed, Alrian said, remembering the last time he had tried to leave without Ashra's blessing. The idea of meeting the women magic users and the possibility for a new type of magic filled him with hope. But there was a nagging doubt below it all. He pushed it away, but knew it would return. For now, he just had to keep his focus on recovering his strength and beginning his journey. Epilogue Ashra waved goodbye to Alrian, Lara, and Vincent and wished them well. Alrian had recovered incredibly well over the last week, although Ashra could see that the blight was having an effect on the young wizard. He had taken Vincent aside and mentioned it specifically. Vincent would monitor the situation and keep Alrian's spirits up. I hope he makes it, but it's such a tall order. How can he reach them in time, Ashra thought. He had seen many suffer the blight's taint, and even the ones that resisted the most had turned in time. Alrian had a long journey ahead of him, one that would be a race against the infection. Better he keeps his hope up. Any dark thoughts will work against him, Ashra said to himself. It was his justification for hiding from Alrian the true timeline he was fighting against. 
In some cases, ignorance was definitely the better option. The desert wizard had a restless afternoon and evening. He tried to get into his normal routines and carry on as normal, but he couldn't settle down. The events that had just occurred were momentous. A young wizard accessing the pool of knowledge, conquering the vault of silence, and surviving against a shade born from a wizard it's unheard of. It excited him in a way that he had not been for some time. He felt a little disappointed that he hadn't taken Alrian up on his offer, although he absolutely could not tag along. Some journeys could not accept extra passengers. As he pondered the entire situation, he noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. Simple tricks won't get past me, Ashra said, calling out to the intruder. I didn't expect so, but you can forgive my caution in coming here, a voice said from the shadows. A man emerged wearing a dark hooded robe covering his face. So you are the mysterious wizard following young Alrian around, Ashra said. Yes, the very same. I take it you don't need an update from me then, Ashra said. No, I do not. So why have you come, Ashra said, about to say the man's name. Call me Aiden, the man said. Aiden? What's that mean? It's in the ancient language, isn't it? Yes, it means the lost one, Aiden said. Very well, Aiden, I will keep your secret. What brings you to my humble home? First, I wanted to thank you for assisting Arian. Of course, but no need to thank me. I may be an outcast, but I can see what's in front of me. An outcast only by your own making. That was my second reason for seeing you. Yes? You have my attention, Ashra said. I want you to return to the academy. They need a new leader. You did wonders with Alrian. Think of what you can contribute to the rest, Aiden said. I don't think you have the authority to make that request. All the same, what do you think? Can you really stay here in the desert, knowing events are happening out in the world, Aiden said. Ashra didn't have a response ready. Maybe not, he said finally. Then consider it a possibility. I will indeed. What about you? That's not my place. I gave that up. Alrian is my responsibility, Aiden said. I thought as much, but thought it worth asking anyway. Thanks for coming to see me. I appreciate it, Ashra said. I know that I can trust you, and I think you are wasted here. You're not as much of a loner as you think. Why have you saved all those lost idiots over the years? Aiden said. Before Ashra could respond, Aiden turned to leave and blended into shadows. Such theatrics. Farewell, Ashra said, staring into the darkness. Alred walked carefully, not trusting his body. His recovery had been frustrating and slow, and he could feel the blight within him. Ashra and Surgeon had provided useful advice for trying to stop its spread, but he could sense the darkness within marching on regardless. He stopped suddenly, a curious thought entering his mind. He unstrapped his sword and looked at it carefully. The diamond embedded in the hilt let off a faint but noticeable glow. Don't worry, there's still time, Vincent said. Alrian nodded and put the sword away. At least he had a way of judging how far he had gone. He knew how bright the diamond had been when encountering Braith. That detestable monster. How do I defeat him now when I have no access to my power? Alrian thought. His recent mastery of will didn't seem like it would be enough by itself. The monks had not fared particularly well. He could almost hear Wraith laughing in that strange and strange shade voice. It's not your imagination. We are linked now, Wraith said in Alrian's mind. The hideous laughter returned much louder now. This has been Vault of Silence, book two of The Hidden Wizard, written by Vaughn W. Smith, narrated by Ulf Bjorklund. Copyright 2017 by Vaughn W. Smith. Production copyright 2019 by Vaughn W. Smith.